Test, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I can ask you to make your way in, 
we're running a few minutes late, and obviously we have a very busy schedule, so we'd like to get going. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to the ART Fertility Clinic's sixth annual scientific congress. My name is Katie Overy, and I'm aware how perfect that surname is for today. I don't need reminding, it's absolutely fine. So today, we're going to talk about this year's conference. So the key theme for this year's conference is reproduction is an individualized medicine era. In, sorry, not is. Now, today's conference will bring forth the latest clinical advancements and the research in the field of assisted reproductive technologies, as well as showcase the unique approaches and treatments in reproductive medicine. The conference features participation from top international IVF specialists, health organizations, and related experts who have pioneered reproductive medicine techniques in their respective fields. We shall attempt to identify and address region-specific challenges in fertility treatments, as well as highlight personalized treatments and present successful case studies for new learnings. Last but not least, the Congress gives us an opportunity to network with the most renowned clinicians and in the field of reproductive medicine. We hope that this Congress provides all the delegates and participants here today a stimulating environment and, of course, enjoyable interaction. And we are so happy that you are all with us here today. To start us off with a little welcome note, please welcome our group medical director, Professor Humain Fatemi. Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Ms. Overy, the perfect name for that meeting that we have today. Um, I would like to thank you all taking off on uh, Saturday, our staff, the participants, of course, our international speakers are making all the effort to come to a rainy Dubai, which doesn't happen a lot. I'm going to keep it very short, but I think it's important that we put a question mark behind everything we do. I remember when I was in Brussels, my mentor, uh, Professor Paul de Fruy, he taught me that you have to put a question mark behind everything you do. And that's exactly what we try to do in art fertility clinics. So we try to put a question mark behind everything we do. We do not accept dogmas. And I think that's the biggest mistake that one could do, especially in a field of human reproduction. It's a field which is only 40, 42, three years old. It means our knowledge is extremely limited. Hence, that's exactly why we have to put a question and be self-critical in what we do. And this is leading, obviously, to trials, randomized controlled trials, publications, and hopefully we can give you a latest update of ART in the individualized medicine era. It's really my great pleasure to introduce to you our first two chairpersons. Basically, none of them needs an introduction. First is Professor Luca Gianaroli, the past president of ESHRE, and Professor Dr. Juan Espinos, the president of Spanish Fertility Society. So I'm really honored to have these two great personalities in our field to chair the first session. Please.
Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. My name, as Professor Fatemi says, is Juan Jospinos. I come from Barcelona, Spain, and I will co-chair this session with Professor Luca Gianoli, that came from Italy. Um, I want to thank to the organizing committee the possibility to stay here and to, to share with you this nice session. I am excited to be here. This is the, the first time for me in, in Dubai. And uh, to, at the beginning, we have four different topics. Uh, um, um, very, very important speakers. Two of them are focused on clinics, and the other ones are focused on, on, on lab. And also, as I said before, we have four excellent speakers. I am going to introduce the first one. The first speaker will be Human Fatemi. There is not needed any any introduction. I have I, I don't know how many how many works in order to to speak about about him. I can only say that uh, she was from Brussels. And some years ago, he decided to come here, and nowadays is the medical director of all the group of ART clinics. Um, Professor Fatemi, uh, we will speak um, about, and that is very important nowadays, that is, what is the best uh, way in order to prepare the endometrium in order to transfer the, the frozen embryos. As you know, every time um, is usual in, in our cycles, in, in our lab, that the most part of the embryos has been uh, frozen, and we have to replace these embryos in an asynchronous cycle. And nowadays, there are different groups, some that uh, try to replace these embryos with a hormonal replacement treatment, and other ones are uh, in favor of to, to making a natural cycle. Please, human, Zuan. Thank you very much. Could you please activate the microphone? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. This topic that I'm going to speak about, as Dr. Spinoz correctly mentioned, it's a very important topic because more and more we are doing frozen cycles. The question is, what mistakes did we do in the past and how can we improve these frozen cycles? Now, as you can see, the prevalence of frozen cycles is increasing significantly. Basically, three, four years ago in the US, almost 80% of the cycles were frozen cycles. I can tell you in our clinics, we are close to 100% frozen cycles. And you might ask the question, why? Why would you expose all the risks of freezing an embryo and not putting that embryo in a fresh cycle? And this could be, of course, debated. Before I start with my presentation, I'm going to ask you a question. Imagine you are a pilot or a passenger, and you are going to land in an airport. This is one runway, and this is the other runway. And here you have a cliff going down 200 meters. Where would you like to land? I think the answer is clear. You would like to land here, right? A huge runway, you have a lot of space to land, and it's safer than if you would land here. Now you might ask, why is this guy talking about runways and planes on a Saturday morning what is the link with the frozen and or fresh embryo transfer cycles? Now, this paper was published a few weeks ago. It's a very recent paper, and I think it's an interesting paper. 
I don't like huge databases, but if you take a look, this is almost half a million cycles, and they looked fresh cycles, the green line, frozen cycles with PGTA, obviously we can exclude them because it's PGTA, but if you take a look at frozen, no PGTA, at any given point, this is doing better than this. So at any given point, a frozen cycle is doing better than a fresh cycle. But the question is why? Why do we have better outcome in one as compared to the other? Now, obviously, the embryo has a shape, and I think this picture comes from a presentation of Dr. Mina Popovic. There are more and more children being born, and there are countries where the number of children being born is almost 6 to 7% of the whole population. And basically, this number and cry preservation is increasing significantly. But if you speak about frozen embryo cycles, the first question you need to address, how do you prepare the endometrium for the transfer? That's the most important question. How do you prepare the endometrium for transfer? Because now, after 30, 40 years of ovarian stimulation, we understood when we stimulate, we have to make sure progesterone is not elevated. That is what we have learned after 40 years of ovarian stimulation. But what is the best way to prepare the endometrium for a cryocycle? It's a valid question. And if you start asking around the world, you see 70% seem to do HRT, and around maybe 20, 25% are doing a natural cycle or a managed natural cycle. Good. But what's the best way to go forward? Furthermore, how should this HRT be done? How should the natural cycle be done? How should the managed natural cycle be done? I think these are clinically valid questions. Now, recently there was a publication, for example, to say, if you freeze embryos and the time frame between freezing and transfer is too long, it seems already to reduce the chance of pregnancy. So the longer you preserve these embryos, the lower seems to be the chance of implantation. But one thing we need to understand is that the endometrium of a woman is not a very friendly place for an embryo to be in. Very important. The endometrium of a woman is not a very friendly place for an embryo to be in. You might say, but the endometrium is there for a pregnancy. The answer is yes. However, in a cycle of 28 days, it's only receptive for two to three days, maximum. You might have the best embryo. If you put that embryo outside the so-called window of implantation, the chance of conception reduces significantly. And this window of implantation is prepared based on the hours, important, on the hours of progesterone exposure. And if you take a look at the endometrium, obviously every day in the luteal phase, the endometrial histology is changing, every day. And if you do not respect the basics of physiology, of course, the frozen cycle will be a failure. So it's important that we have a basic understanding of the luteal phase. Basic understanding.
one and a half approximately that we have a drop of pregnancy. That's nothing novel. So when progesterone goes up 1.5, the pregnancy rates drop. That we know since 15, 20 years now. Why? Because the gene expression of the endometrium changes. This is a paper we have published with one of my ex-PhD students, Inge van Farenberg, where we looked at the gene expression and we have seen that if progesterone goes above 1.5, actually it starts already between 1 and 1.5, but up from 1.5 onwards, it's a disaster. So you have a significant change of genes responsible for the implantation of an embryo. So that's what's happening in the endometrium. So it's not good to have high progesterone during the follicular phase. Good. The problem is, and this is a beautiful paper which was published by Dr. Carroll recently, you know, we are worried about the progesterone values on the day of trigger. We are worried. You just have seen 1, 1.5, People are debating on major congresses. No, it should be 1.3 based on the essay. Maybe it should be 1.6 or 1.4. This is what we are debating on major congresses. But what if I would have told you, let's say your progesterone is 0.7 at 4 p.m. today. You're going to trigger the patient at 7 p.m. today. So 4 p.m., 0.7, 0.8, everyone is happy. But at 8 p.m., you trigger that patient. What will be your progesterone, you think, after two hours? Double. Double. It means the moment you administer your final oocyte maturation, the progesterone shoots up immediately, within one to two hours. And that is exactly why the endometrium of all women, without exception, who are being stimulated, is advanced because you have an immediate production of progesterone after the ACG or agonist administration for the final oocyte maturation. But look what's happening in nature. Does the progesterone go up like this? No. In nature, ovulation takes up to two to three days. It means the moment your LH goes up, the day after you have a drop of estradiol, but progesterone is still low. It's the third day of ovulation that your progesterone starts to go up. That is exactly why the endometrium of all patients being stimulated is advanced. We initially thought it's because of high estradiol, but estradiol doesn't create secretary transformation. Progesterone does. So if you have an exposure to progesterone, your endometrium is advanced. Why is it advanced? Because of a trigger shot and, of course, multifollicular recruitment. Now, there have been various ways to look how to transfer an embryo in a natural cycle, for example. We published, I think, the first paper in Fertility Sterility, it's now 13 years ago, looking to the natural cycle, how to do a natural cycle. Should it be a managed natural cycle or just a natural cycle uh, on LH? And we found out that a pure natural cycle without any interference seems to be the best way to go forward. And Marie Montagu, when she was working in Brussels, also published a similar paper years after we published that one, confirming the same findings, that a pure natural cycle seems to be better than a managed natural cycle. But not in everyone's hand. Because if you're not doing the natural cycle correctly, of course the results will not be good. And there are other publications stating the opposite. No managed natural cycle is as good as a natural cycle. Why? because the natural cycle was not done correctly. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that. So if you take a look, should we have a luteal phase support in a natural cycle? There's a paper published in Human Update, and actually we commented on that paper with Dr. Barbara Lawrence. If you really have to support the luteal phase for all natural cycles, all of us should not have been here. The 8 billion people on Earth should not have been there because we, our mothers didn't take luteal phase support 40, 50, 60 years ago. So we need to have a better understanding of the natural cycle. And this is the commentary that we wrote in Human Production Update uh, about a year ago. Now, people start measuring in the frozen cycles the endocrine profile of progesterone in a HRT cycle, IM, vaginal, and also natural cycle. What we need to realize, the progesterone that you measure 
in a natural cycle, you take the blood from here. Do you think the values that you measure here are the same values that if you would have measured in the arteria ovarica, for example, which is very close to the uterus? No. The values of progesterone here will be much higher than you measure here. And that has also been published on many occasions. So, as I have mentioned, in a fresh cycle, the moment you trigger a patient, you expose the uterus to progesterone. It means if you put back a day five embryo, that embryo comes into a uterine cavity, which is exposed 150 hours to progesterone. But in nature, it would be around 120 hours. So you already have a gap of 30 hours, approximately. And this is extremely important to realize. So we know that all patients who are being stimulated, this is beautiful work published by Claire Bourguin from Belgium, that all the patients being stimulated have endometrial advancement. Now you know why. Because progesterone shoots up the moment you trigger. And this visualizes beautifully the difference between a fresh and frozen cycle. What happens in a fresh cycle, in a, in a natural cycle? Follicular phase, LH rise, it takes two to three days before you have your progesterone rise. The moment you have your progesterone rise, ovulation, it takes approximately 120 hours until your window of implantation opens. This is the runway. So you have a, the embryo has a very long runway, so it can implant at any given time in this area. But if you go to a fresh cycle without progesterone rise, fresh cycle without progesterone rise, what will happen? You have your stimulation, trigger shot. Immediately after the trigger shot, you have a progesterone rise. Logic. It means your endometrium is exposed to progesterone. At the egg retrieval, at the pickup 36 hours later, the endometrium is already exposed to 34 hours of progesterone. That's why the endometrium is advanced. Then you have your embryo. The embryo is around 120 hours, let's say. But the endometrium is already exposed to 150 hours of progesterone. So what means that your window of implantation gets narrow? So once you have a long window of implantation in a stimulated cycle without a progesterone rise, you have a more narrow window of implantation. Can an embryo implant? Yes, of course it can implant. This is why we also have pregnancies in fresh cycles. But can every embryo implant there? No. And you will see why. You see, this implantation is based on the embryo division pattern. So your endometrium is advanced. The embryo so fast-developing embryo, advanced endometrium, they will be synchronized. This small window of implantation is big enough for a pregnancy. But imagine you have a slow-developing embryo. This is day five blastulation, low level of progesterone in a fresh cycle, big diameter of a blastocyst, a beautiful embryo. That embryo in a fresh or frozen cycle, they have the same results. But go to the worst case, slow developing embryo, very advanced endometrium because progesterone is already high in a stimulated cycle. Small blastocyst, slow developing embryo. That small runway is not enough. It's not enough. So that embryo has a very little chance of implanting in a fresh cycle. But in a frozen cycle, the results are as good as here. So this is why, if you compare fresh versus frozen, we need to understand and respect the basic physiology. And that is what, what is very often not understood and respected. With uh, our colleagues, Ashna, we published this paper, I think it's now one, one and a half years ago, where we compared natural cycle with HRT cycle. And we saw in the HRT cycle ongoing pregnancy rate of 65, and in a natural cycle, we saw an ongoing pregnancy rate of 74%, natural cycle. So we always see again and again, natural cycle is doing better than HRT cycles. 
But if you go to big data, to Cochrane meta-analysis, you look on other publications, is HRT better or natural cycle? The first question you need to ask yourself, how were these HRT or natural cycles done? Were they done correctly? But many people don't ask these questions. They just do a study and publish. Now here, for many years, I was looking to Cochrane databases, and I wanted to know what is the update on HRT versus natural cycle. And I was astonished. So the Cochrane meta-analysis published, included one paper, one paper, comparing HRT with natural cycle, one paper. And the conclusion was, it's the same. But the joke is, this one paper was never published. It was never published, and it's included in a Cochrane meta-analysis. It was just a small abstract at a meeting presented at some point in 1994. So this is where we are with evidence-based medicine, comparing, for example, HRT versus natural. I'm going to give you another joke. I'm sorry, I have to call it a joke. This was published in human production one year ago. This is a beautiful study, beautiful study by our colleagues from the Netherlands. In our field, the colleagues from the Netherlands have a spe special name. So clinicians, they have very little affinity with colleagues from the Netherlands because this is what's happening when they publish papers. Why? So the, the design is beautiful, and that's what many journals look at, the design. They say randomized controlled trial, fresh versus frozen. Beautiful design. Young women, one group receives embryo frozen, the other group fresh. What's the outcome? Straightforward, simple, one question. The answer is fresh is significantly better than frozen. But that's exactly the opposite of what I'm telling you. How is it possible? Very simple. Because they don't know how to freeze. Why? In a young population, in a young population, what would you expect to have as a pregnancy rate in a frozen cycle, in a young population? Let's say 40%, maybe 50%. In a very bad clinic, I would say 30, 35%. 8%. 8%. So they have 8% pregnancy in the frozen group and let's say 25% in the fresh group. What would be your conclusion? Your conclusion would be they don't know how to freeze. Very simple. But they publish that. And that paper is going to be included in a subsequent meta-analysis. And people will say, you see, fresh is not good. Yes. But if you crash the car, is it the driver or the car? And this is the question. You need always to ask yourself. So when this paper came out, of course, we could not keep silent. We commented with Dr. Barbara, but also other people, uh, also Fil Filippo Ubaldi from Italy, they commented on this paper. They said, how can you publish this? This is a joke. But it's published. And it will be included in subsequent meta-analysis by same people who do meta-analysis. Now, there was another publication and I just took a couple of recent publications to show you the lack of knowledge we have in our field on cryocycles. Just the lack of knowledge that we have. So if you see here, this paper came in July 22. In July 22. It states, if you freeze an embryo, the placenta is damaged. Very straightforward title. Vitrification of an embryo has an impact on placenta. And if you read the paper, it says vitrification is damaging the placenta. Very simple. But when you freeze an embryo and put it back in a cycle, how many variables do you have? One variable is the freezing. The other variable is how do you put it back? In a natural cycle or HRT cycle? Now we know if you put it back in an HRT cycle, you have no corpus luteum. If you have no corpus luteum, you will have a lack of relaxin and vascular drug growth factor. This is why women with HRT have hypertension and preeclampsia and so on, because they have no corpus luteum. 
So the fact that they see changes in placenta is not because of vitrification. It's because they don't have a corpus luteum. None of the reviewers realized that. The editor, associate editor, they did not realize that. How is it possible? And people say vitrification is damaging the embryo. Nonsense. It's a lack of corpus luteum which changes the placenta. But unfortunately, these papers, and these are recent papers that I'm showing you, top journals. I don't know if you still can call human production a top journal with all these publications, but this is what we have, unfortunately. So we have also to be critical when we read these papers. So this is what we also published, that we have to be cautious when we read these papers. We have to respect the basic physiology. Basic physiology says you need to respect the hours of progesterone exposure. You need to synchronize the embryo with the endometrium. So for example, if you have a day five embryo, it's basically five plus one days of progesterone exposure that you need to have. Now, to challenge you more, on a publication in New England Journal of Medicine. This is the Bible of medicine, New England. I mean, it cannot be better than that. And if you look at that, also they didn't find very big differences in fresh versus frozen. Why? Because they did not respect the basic physiology. They transferred day two or three embryos in day two or three endometrium. One day is missing. Endometrium and embryos were not synchronized. Of course, the results will not be perfect because it was not done conducted correctly. And these are the shortcomings we have in our field. Now, more and more people are measuring the systemic progesterone levels. And Elena Labarta from Spain stated it should be somewhere around, I don't know, 8.9 or 9.1, that you need to have a minimum level of progesterone. And also from Dexeus in, in, in Spain, this paper came out one and a half, two years ago, saying, look, in a natural cycle, you need to have 10 nanogram of progesterone. So look, in a natural cycle, if your progesterone on the day before transfer is less than 10 nanogram per ml, the pregnancy rates are horrible. Again, human production paper. But a major mistake happened with that paper too. Major mistake, ridiculous mistake. You know, when you detect ovulation, you need to understand when the LH goes up and when progesterone is going up. The moment progesterone goes up, from that point, you need to calculate the days for embryo, and embryo transfer. Here, they didn't do that. They just put a stick in the urine. They said, maybe LH is going up, so measure after five days. But that's not the way it's working. Because if you ovulate these LH kits, they have 30% wrong results. They have 30% wrong results. And there are different ways of detecting ovulation in the urine. This needs to be done in the systemic circulation. And very interesting, the progesterone rise happens after the LH surge between 22 to 56 hours. And this is a paper Dr. Carroll just submitted. If you have an LH rise, the progesterone rise can occur after 20 minutes or up to 60, uh, 20 hours, up to 60 hours. So just detecting the LH rise is not sufficient. You need to understand time zero and then measure it and define your value. But unfortunately, also that has not been done. So if you look at some studies comparing HRT natural cycle, natural cycle seems always to do better and better because we start learning the natural cycle better. Just another study to show you the mistakes we do, fertility, sterility, comparing, for example, in a frozen cycle, HRT, intramuscular progesterone, vaginal progesterone. So what they say, intramuscular progesterone is better, total nonsense. Why? Because the vaginal progesterone receives four days of progesterone, the intramuscular progesterone receives five days of progesterone. So here you have two variables. One variable is vaginal versus intramuscular. The second variable is the time of progesterone exposure. So we know that also fresh cycles increase the risk of ectopic pregnancies. But people have stated that frozen cycles increase the risk of preeclampsia, increase the risk of large for gestational ages, and increase the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. But then we need to ask, is it in HRT cycles or natural cycles? And more and more data are pointing towards the point that it has nothing to do with the freezing. It is the lack of presence of a corpus luteum. Why? Because corpus luteum is producing some factors which are important for the vascularization um, of the endometrium. And if you look at the recent data, 
it's clearly demonstrating if you put back an embryo in a natural cycle, you don't have all these issues with preeclampsia, hemorrhage, and postpartum bleeding. And all that has been put also in recent meta-analysis, confirming the data again and again. So I think if you have a choice to put back the embryo in a fresh or in a frozen cycle, I think the choice is taken easily to put back the embryo in its natural environment. So the conclusion, we need to respect the basic physiology if you are comparing fresh versus frozen. If you look at frozen, we need to synchronize better the endometrium with the embryo. And also, one size fits all in the era of personalized medicine does not fit to what we do. We need future studies to synchronize the hours of embryo development with the hours of progesterone exposure in order to synchronize the embryo and the endometrium better together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Human. Um, as the topics are so different, we, we thought to, to make the questions after every, every talk. If you want to make any question to Human Fatemi, the, the, just the, it's open for discussion. Please, any people? I think there is a question on, on the left side. Can we yeah. have the microphone, please? Just a, li a little question, uh, waiting for the micro. Um, when you perform the, the natural cycle, uh, you measure progesterone levels just the, the same day or the day before of the, of the transfer of embryos, and um, you make any cutoff in the progesterone levels? Um, what do you make the, if the cutoff is lower than that's a very important question. Thank you for that. So you see, if you go according to published data, is the paper from Dexeus, they say 10 nanogram. But I think it was not done correctly because they did not detect the ovulation correctly. So now we are running a study where we are measuring the progesterone levels the day before, but after diagnosing correctly the progesterone rise. And currently, um, Dr. Barbara is submitting, I think, an abstract, if I'm correct, to Eshre about that. We are looking to different values, and there seems not to be really a cutoff level if you respect the hours of progesterone exposure. So I think our knowledge there is still very limited. We need first to capture the moment of progesterone exposure to know when to measure, because it matters do you measure here, here, or here. This paper from Dexeus, they just measured randomly, and they said this is the value, but they did not respect the hours of progesterone exposure. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Fatimi, for this lecture. But I uh, want to know the, the concept of natural cycle. If this woman, you, and you, most of them, they don't have natural cycle, and they are, not, uh, they are, they are either polycystic, anovulatory, or low ovary reserve. So what do you do to make them having natural cycle and then embryo transfer? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the natural cycle obviously cannot be done with everyone because if it's a PCO patient, obviously you could do induction of ovulation with low dose, for example, gonotropins. The problem is you might have multifollicular recruitment and you will hyperstimulate them. And poor responders, they have a defective follicular phase. They will also will have a defective luteal phase. So these patients currently, we are doing HRT. Is this the best way to go forward? No. But currently, we don't have any other options. So for PCO patients and extreme poor responders, we still go with HRT. But for patients who are ovulating, we try to go with a natural cycle. But full natural cycle. You see, less is more. And that's the key message. The other question. The, you talked earlier about the progesterone level to, for the, uh, and for, to decide um, for the embryo transfer. What about the looking of the endometrium and the thickness of endometrium? If this also goes together, or sometimes do you, do you feel there is a difference the progesterone is high, the endometrium is thin? Yeah, you know, yesterday Professor Baris submitted a paper, so maybe I'm going to ask him to answer this question. Professor Baris? About uh, the thickness uh, of endometrium. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, the, the original paper which suggested it could be effective is exactly 33 years old. 
And it had a small sample size. It was retrospective, not a hypothesis-driven study. And then somehow they reported, you know, nobody got pregnant if endometrium was six millimeters or less. Then there several papers showed you can get pregnant with five and six. So none of the prospective studies suggested really a, either a linear relationship or a particular threshold. So we recently analyzed the data that inc includes 959 single euploid embryo transfers. Again, no linear relationship, no singular cutoff that precludes pregnancy, and pregnancy rates seem to be the you know, same as with five, six, seven, eight, nine. So as long as the texture appears correct, as long as the hormonal profile is correct, um, we don't think you know, thickness matters. That's a very important paper because, you see, the thickness of endometrium, as long as the uterine shape is okay and you have a genetically normal embryo, the thickness seems not to matter. And that's exactly what this paper says. And the revision was submitted, I think, yesterday or two days ago, and it's a big sample size. I hope that answers your question. Please. Thank you, Yuman, for the nice and sharp, as usual, presentation. Yeah, I am a physiologist. I fully agree with you. With your conclusion sounds very logical to me. But what is really worthy to me as a vet, uh, your frozen embryo seems to be ever like, you know, a normal one, like a fresh one. So that means that you are, we are very advanced in the freezing rather than the situation is completely different in our condition. I think the, the technicalities for freezing human embryos are far much more advanced than any other species on the world. Yeah. Uh, maybe, Dr. Ibrahim, can you comment on freezing of embryos and how far we are and where we started and where we are going from slow freezing to vitrification and where we are today? Yes, so um, thank you, first, for the presentation and the question. Um, of course, we all agree that um, all what we try to do is to mimic nature, and obviously cryopreservation or freezing is not there in nature. However, um, if we consider where we are today compared to 10 years or 15 years ago, there is significant improvement in the methodology we're using, and it's more and more becoming not a mean to an end, but it's more um, understanding the physiology of the oocyte. So freezing now is, um, I mean, the survival rate is more than 96 or 97 percent. In addition to that, there were several um, studies look, looking even into the epigenetic changes of oocytes or embryos that are frozen. One of the papers was with our previous colleague, Nelke, showing that there is not clear um, effect of cryopreservation on that. So the question is, shall we, I mean, choose to transfer in an advanced endometrium or take the risk and do something to correct for this slowness, let's say, in the development of the embryo, I would go with the freezing. Okay, we don't have so time in order to share. Um, maybe if you have more questions, just in the coffee break, you can perform these questions. Please, you can. Thank you. Well, now we are moving uh, uh, forward or back. It depends how we want to look at. Uh, looking at the basic science that uh, is in reproductive medicine. Uh, for the benefit of time, I would not uh, go through the CV of Professor Loy. I just want to say that uh, for all of us that are involved in the clinical work, this is a great opportunity to understand as uh, a man, a group, can really uh, squeeze all the scientific basic information working on a few cells and working uh, via very sophisticated technologies of micro manipulation. Pasqualino, the podium is yours. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Yuman, for the kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to speak in such a you know, uh, wonderful audience. Um, uh, I think this, my talk is going to, to drift significantly for what we've seen already. And the title is a bit bizarre. 
Because this talk is a kind of evolution of a talk I given in Bologna last November, and uh, where I was actually invited to talk to tell something about how to assess oocyte on embryo quality. So I've wrapped together what I've done. Um, what I will do in the next 25 minutes, I'll take you back 30 years ago, and I'm going to show what, how I'll be giving hard time to the oocyte in the embryo. The title is a bit bizarre, you might think, but I just will tell you uh, what can be done with the embryos and what I've done actually personally on the embryos. How to go out? Yep. Okay. I, I'm a vet with a, a PhD or reproductive biology. These are my passions. I'm, I'm a specialist or uh, small ruminants uh, reproduction, and I've been doing this work now 35 years. So I've been doing a lot of things in all sides and embryos. I've been working on the kind of manipulation, which I'm going to briefly summarize in my talk in the last three years. These are sheep um, all sides, ovulated sheep all sides, and uh, sheep blastocysts. You might find some difference actually Animal embryos are very different from human ones, from the human ones. So it's not very a linear talk, what I'm going to give you, because you know I have to adjust uh, my talk to Lucas' uh, topics last November. So I decided to, to talk to you what I've done, what can be done on embryos. And I'm going to actually leave to my, my career the transition from working on in vivo sites to in vitro produced ones. You might be, uh, as you are aware, veterinarians, vet, animal biologists actually gave a strong contribution to development of uh, in vitro uh, culture systems. And then we can also do a lot of manipulation of our sites. And the last point, actually, are what we do to select, because you, know, you ask very challenging tasks to the all sites. How do we select? the best odd size to work with, okay? I've started my career as a vet when, let's say, early 80s, we are demanded from the farmers how to improve, how to increase the reproductive potential of cows or of sheep. So we are doing routinely as a service for the farmers, the superovulation and embryo transfer. That's what you can see here is a surgical recovery of uh, sheep blastocyst after a cycle of superovulation. Many things were established in that, in that time. And then once I've seen the first embryos, it was like, a, you know, love at first sight because, you know, by the time it, this guy, which is called Steve Willans, and he's another vet from Denmark, still alive, is a genius and a kind of, you know, uh, excellent uh, embryologist. So we started to multiply, you know, the demand from the, from, the, from the farming world. Could you give us the maximum number of offspring for a certain cow with a super performing cow in terms of milk production? So the easier things to do was just, you know, to split the embryos into parts. So that was developed by Steve Williamson, just to make twins, okay? And so I did. My lecture, these are very old slides, as you can see. So we started to split the embryos. Embryos were sold by the time from one side to another, for the UK to, to New Zealand, for instance. And you know, it was very convenient to get twice as much as many as the embryos just by splitting. So I've done this. I started to give our time to the embryos, just chopping them into parts and see what happened. So many are. And then, you know, two are not enough. So we started to do even more. And then you know that at the very early stage, before of the activation of the zygotic genome, the blastomers are totally potent. They can create a normal animal, okay? So by disassembly these early embryos, you take a blastomer into a previously emptied zona pellucida, and then you can get, you know, more than two. And these are actually, uh, of course, uh, just a little bit step back. By the time, I'm talking about the late 80s, early 90s, there were no in vitro culture system available. So we did this kind of very special in vivo culture. After you cut the zone, you need to embed the, the embryos in this agar. 
again was invented by Steve Wellens, and, and the culture was done, was carried on in a ligated uh, ship over that, okay? After seven days, you flush them back, and we did the transfer. These, is, these are actually, uh, how to go back, I don't know. Uh, okay, this is a, f okay, thank you. This is the agar. The agar chipping was, you know, very important. All the white see these little guys in here, these are macrophages. When you cut the zonopelucida, you transfer into the ovidat. There is an attack of the macrophages. They will kill your embryos. The agar actually mechanically prevents it. This is my first, one of my first blastocysts. And this is my first set of twins, twin actually, triplets, by blastoma separation. My seems in, insignificant for you, but by the time, really, these are very, very high genetic value uh, animals, very, very expensive, and this work has been repeated also in, uh, in bovine. Sheep has been always been used as a kind of trial, experimental model, okay, for the cow. And then, you know, two were not enough, four, okay, not so fully satisfied. By the time, you know, again, Steve Willans published in Nature in 1986, the multiplication of embryos by nuclear transfer using embryonic cells. So, so what we did, we just, you know, removed the zona pellucida, and then you put the embryos in, in uh, calcium-free, PBS solution very easily, and you can get, you know, separation of the blastomer. On the other side, you get the ova. All these are all taken from ovulated sheep. You localize the chromosomes, you get them out by manipulation, and you reconstruct the embryos. And the fro 16 cell embryos, you can get 60 potential zygotes, and then again, you make, you know, you multiply the embryos, okay? In vivo culture, as I told you, was the issue, so no other system but, you know, culturing them within uh, agar chips into the ship of that, and the, the nuclear transfer procedure was very, very effective with something like 85% of blastocyst development, okay? So we could multiply embryos easily. That's the first kit of Crohn's, but we did many more of that, and it is normal to get 10, 12 uh, offspring in cows and, and, and sheep from nuclear transfer of embryonic stem cell. And then for that this transition, I'll just briefly mention to you, so we started to work, this guy is Cesare Galli, you might not know he's a vet, but he's a, real, he's a leader in, in, in vitro in reproduction in, uh, in, in farm animals, Giovanni, his wife, they started to develop a very efficient system to, to make, you know, in vitro embryo production in cattle. Now they run a big company, which is called Avantea, and they make, uh, let's say, test tubes, horses, and, and, and for all over the world, actually. So, and then, okay, we do the transition was applied also in, in, in the ship. So this work is done by my previous wife, a Polish embryologist. And then very, very quickly, so we can make countless number of embryos. It is very easy. It is a very robust system. It used to be, no longer, I may say. So all this were made very, also is collected for high value genetic ship. And we put on the ground a couple of hundred lambs, you know, working in a research institute back in Sardinia. Okay, just a few examples, just to very quickly show you. And then, you know, another uh, point, these are, prepuberal uh, uterus with the ovaries in here. Well, I'm a physiologist. You might know that you have a kind of follicular growth before and after birth, simply dedicated to the um, atresia of follicles. But if you, if you get the oocytes from three, these are five-week ovary, of course, prepuberal. You can get many of them, and this is a very important picture because, you know, these, they have a development of potential. This lump, this one, She's now, she used to be 10 months, not tuberal yet. She wouldn't be able to conceive a, 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 a lamp. We took the oocytes when she was five weeks old, and then you make the embryos. She delivered the, the lamp she, when she's not even tuberal. That was done because, you know, in farm animals, animal breeding is important to reduce the generational interval. It has been the first proof that, you know, prepuberal oocytes have developmental potential, a concept applied, extended to the uh, cattle farming too. We did a lot of work also on for multiplication of wild animals. Wild animals are kind of extracurricular work that I've done during my PhD. 
of course, we published a lot of work on this. And once we got a very beautiful in vitro maturation system and culture, I started to do all the things, you know, because, you know, in vitro sites are very easy to get. We go to the abattoirs, and then we get over is from the slaughter ship. So we have three times per week, countless number of authors to play with, okay? And then by the time, you know, I've been working with these guys, this kid Camber, for when Dolly was born, and then again, we rise, rise the stake to do some nuclear trans with somatic cells. That's this very, very simple, okay? You just remove the, the chromosomes, and you inject the nucleus. A, a very good embryologist can make up 100 of clones per hour. I've done a lot of clones. So I put on the ground 12 clones. I stopped to do embryo transfer now because, as you know, these clones are not really completely normal. Quite a high proportion of them dies, you know, for problems related to the, uh, how can I say, limited nuclear programming under the current condition. Rising the stake, I was able to take, to kill the cells, okay, deliberately, because I want to make them um, to be more efficiently um, reprogrammed, and even dead cells can make into lamps. That was very, very, very exciting for me. And again, these cells were freeze-dried in Israel and sent by an ordinary mail to my laboratory, and they are able, after eight years of storage, dry a room temperature to make blastocyst after nuclear transfer. That's another exciting line of research that I still carry on. And then we did everything, you know, we, done all the genome. we do this model for epigenetic research. So I've done, you have done, you know, you have done androgenetic reproduction by pre-nuclear transfer, even by injection of the two spermatozoa into the nucleated oocytes. And then, you know, rising the stake again, precision chimeras, this is a kind of research uh, we are currently doing at the moment. So we are trying to combine uh, embryos from a ship and the wild animals. Well, you might ask you why. What is the reason why Lino Lois carry on this kind of strange? So the problem is I've been working on uh, biodiversity preservation too as a vet. That's a, a problem which completely <laughs> unrelated to your field, but just you know, to, to, to give you some update on the, on the situation. As you know, the biodiversity is collapsing over the planet. Um, this is the most endangered uh, species. These are North rhino, white North rhino, northern white rhino. Only two females are kept in Olpeyeta Conservation Center in Kenya. This is the highly, the most endangered mammal on the planet, okay? So we gather together all the guys working on, on animals. So that's me, that's Cesar Galli from Avantea. This is Thomas Hildebrandt, a leading scientist working on reproduction in wild animals. And we decided to see whether we can apply some of the reproductive technology to, you know, okay, to push further the boundary of uh, extinction for these species. And so we decided to, to draft a um, kind of, you know, what to do, at least, to see whether we can save the, this animal. Of course, you know, uh, I've ICSI developing in artificial gametes, and we actually started to do that. We do open rhinos, this is Thomas Hildebrandt, you know, these animals put in anesthesia, under anesthesia, so we got the oocytes. So by, by luck, by chance, these oocytes, they do, they make wonderful blastocysts, you know, upon XC, and we have embryonic stem cells, they made isolated from Giovanna Lazzari and Cesare Avantea, Italy. And now we want to, we get, we publish it, you know, a couple of years ago, that was a major achievement. Making embryonic stem cells is very, very complicated in farm animals. So what? Now this is Katsuhiko Ayashi. He's part of the biorescue team. He's the guy making artificial sperm, artificial oocytes from embryonic stem cells and even from inducible pluripotent cells. He's trying to make gametes from the cells, but it will be a revolution. But even if you have, you know, hundreds of rhino embryos. Where do you want to transfer them? We need foster mothers. And my job in this biorescue is to see whether we can combine rhino embryos by chopping off you know, the inner mass, getting a troploblastic vesicle, means that you cut off the inner mass, and then we have a troploblastic vesicle from the horse, which is genetically closer to the rhino, 
and then you inject the NSMS into this trophoblastic vesicle, and the, the horse will act as a foster mother for the rhino embryo. So, so we started to do so. These are wonderful uh, in vivo, again, embryos. I should have a museum, so that's, we did, of course, preliminary trials, ship into ship. These are very, how can I say, extensive manipulation, very, very, you know, invasive. And we wanted to be sure that, you know, these manipulated embryos can, can have a chance to develop into offspring, and we did so with Thomas and Hildebrand and Cesare, we have kind of 45% development to term of these, uh, you know, manipulated embryos. So we started to, to move on using an easy available model. Road deers are everywhere in Europe. Sheep are everywhere, even more than road deers. So we chop them out. These are beautiful road deer embryos. You know, they had to enter diapause, another fascinating issue we are also interested in. And I should have a movie at this point. Maybe the gentleman over there is going to provide because it doesn't run. Okay. This is a very, very easy technique to, to chop out, to, to cut the innocent mass from a sheep. Blastocyst, just these are day seven sheep blastocyst to make trophoblastic vesicle, okay? Very, very easy. We make hundreds of them now even for other purposes. That's it. You need to ask the embryo to cooperate because they are, so this is the NSMS, very, very clean, you know, selected. After 24 hours, the trophoblastic vesicle re-expand nicely, ready to, to get. Can I have the other one, please? right straight ready for the for the movie okay and then you know the, the toughest part of the story just is to inject the NSMS with a very large bore pipette that's you know now we cut with the laser in this part the pipette is holding already sorry our laser doesn't have enough smaller objectives more magnification object you get only a partial view so you, you start cutting from inside to outside and the guy the pipette is ready to enter the blastocyst and to release the NSMS. So you can see now very, very shortly. Okay, ready to go. And as the NSMS leaving the pipette, entering the new recipient trophoblast, we did the embryo transfer, we got pregnancies. We are still waiting to see what actually is going to be delivered. Our target is to deliver a perfectly uh, genetically pure road deer from uh, NSMS into the blastocyst reorganizes itself, is very, very resilient, very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the next ones. <laughs> thank you. And then, you know, that's again, you know, from the talk I given to, to Professor Luca Generoli. We don't do any of these. I'm not an expert of foresight, but I, I'm 35 manipulating. You know, when you're a skill in you can recognize the oocytes we can rely upon, we can trust from the other ones, okay? Just we do some morphology markers, but that's for experimental purposes. And morphology is, you know, is not an issue. So that's, we did another kind of biological assessment of cell quality. Do you remember I just mentioned to you the fact that we, we, we did a lot of work on prepubertal oocytes taken from very young donors. And then we, we wanted to check because, you know, they make blastocysts, but a very low rate compared to normal ones. We wanted to check whether it was the cytoplasmatic environment or was the nuclear, which was, you know, failing somehow. And we swap nuclei, metaphase plate, from one oocyte, sheep one to lamb, and vice versa, AVDDXC, and we got blastocyst. The conclusion is that it's the nucleus, the defective compartment between, in, in prepubertal oocytes, okay? It's just very, because, you know, we are not very confident with the mammalian oocytes. I've been working with uh, mouse oocytes, rabbit oocytes, cat oocytes, dog oocytes, cattle, horse, any of them, even including human. Human oocytes is the most beautiful, just like the moon. And the toughest, I have to say, the other oocytes from the farm animal species, they are much more, how can I say, fragile. That's incredible. Mr. Oocytes is asking, you can dare with it. So 
so fascinating. Just in order to show you, that's for Luca's presentation. That's what we do. You have hundreds of them, you just select, you know, polar body, you can actually see. You can see, it's not very clearly visible, you know. We have a lot of lipid granules in a sheep of, or cow, even worse in pigs. You cannot check. We are very lucky. You can see pronuclei. Forget about all of the stuff, this stuff in farm animals. We need to have a special, how can I say, biological finger are you called, to, to, to judge which one is the best, okay? Because, you know, so this is just to say, these are top scoring sheep all sites, mature in vitro. These are the one I would select to do nuclear transfer, for instance, okay? These are what you get, you know, poor quality blastocyst. As you can see, they are much more, you know, ugly <laughs> than human one. This both quick can be, okay, can be. Let, we can do this transfer. I'm not going to show you because you are the champion of time lapse. <laughs> so what we do is just, you know, counting cells, but of course these are for experimental purposes, in the SMA cells. We can do differential staining. I want to do that very shortly. These are all sites injected with my messenger RNA for tubulin, uh, for histone H2, and then in time lapse, I'm not sure we can, gentlemen can run the movie for a while. Should be a movie in here. I really would love to have this in my lab. I'm working on it because you can see real time, all the nuclear and cytoskeleton dynamics. That's really important for us. Okay, so the problem is, you know, the current situation in farm animal is that IVF, IVM, IVF, IV, in vitro culture, they are not really uh, longer, how can I say, adequate. They are not uh, suitable, okay? I think it is, of course, we, we, we judge our own size only at the end when it's able to make a, a, a lamb or, or, or whatever, a calf or a rhino after all this story, okay? Back to the future, yes. Now to do all these chimeras and all this manipulation, I resort again to ovulated oocytes and to superovulated embryos because, you know, their quality is just much higher. You know, you can see, you can see very clearly if you compare an oocytes taken from a ship and in vitro mature oocytes, it's just like, you know, day and night. You can see what is the margin for improvement we have and that's what we should do is my conclusion. So I think we are still using the, the condition established 25 years ago. My former wife actually has been one of the first to do that, but it's outdated. They are not really longer, how can I say, suitable. They have a very low developmental potential. They are, we are not as good as you in this, I, think, I may say. So it is actually very important to develop new uh, protocols. I'm back from, from Peru, Lima, last week, where there is a lady, um, Pecora, I forgot, Marcella, which is actually doing the right thing. He started to study deeply the host's metabolism and is changing completely, okay, the culture systems. So we need to do that. So far, waiting until uh, Marcella does a good job, I'm getting back Back to the future, as 35 years ago, I'm getting my oocytes and my embryos from ovulated animals, if I really want, because I'm very daring. I'm asking very, very special things to the oocytes. I need top quality oocytes. I need top quality embryos. At least in, in farm animals, the in vitro situation still need to be completely rewritten and new conditions need to be established. I think I finished. I hope you enjoy this colorful, and very unusual toy for you. Thank you again very much for giving me the chance to speak to you. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, there is a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you can use my microphone if you like. Cousin Nuri from Vienna, thank you for your 
very, very interesting talk. I enjoyed it. I think the question I have is the question that every one of us who's doing IRT in human has. And how much of what you're doing with animals is possible with human embryos? Thank you. I think these things, they should be related to, to <laughs> restricted to animals, yes. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know how much can be. Actually, we are learning from you. So when, every time I went to, the, to your meetings, I noticed, you know, you are excellent in, in all the protocol for in vitro maturation. You are superlative in freezing. You are really years back. You are much better than us. Many things have been developed in animals. But research in our field is no longer supported. Nobody cares about reproduction in farm animals anymore. So the situation has changed completely. So we are, it is our time to, to lag behind, because every time I come to your meetings, I learn a lot, I have to say. So you are good in manipulation, but you know, I don't know how much can, can be taken from, from human. I don't think so. Doctor, can I comment on this question? Yes. Yes. So, um, I believe because we've done, we've used mouse embryos, for example, for a training for human blastocyst, and you can see that there is difference. Technically, there is difference. But what inspires us, uh, the one working in the human field, is the amount of basic biology that we learn out of this. You know how daring it is, yeah. and um, I mean, of course, it's easier to take a decision to try these things with animals than with the human uh, yeah. oocytes. But it's really inspiring, and I think this is pushes all of us to question a lot of things. And as my mentor taught me, whose mentor taught him, that we need to put a question mark after everything. Can, can, can I have a question to the audience? Well, okay. I, as any of you compared a blastocyst, day seven, from taken from the uterus, I compare that blastocyst to a blastocyst that you made in your lab. Because I can do it very quickly in the ship. I've done many times. So are there any different? Because that's my standard. The blastocyst I get from a day seven uterus in a ship. And then I compare it with that, uh, the one that I make in, Ivory, in, in, in the laboratory. There is a huge difference. I'm wondering, is there any one of you that have compared a blastocyst from naturally conceived, let's say, with a blastocyst made in laboratory? Um, doctor, we, um, we, I personally know we didn't, but there was um, a group of, um, in, in Brazil who did this, right, for donors. So they stimulated donors and then they did the insemination and then they, I, they aspirated the embryos. And as far as the data, what we saw, they've never said or found any distinctive difference between um, one's cultured in vitro or in vivo. Okay, thank you very much. It was a flashing of uh, the embryos, but, that, yeah, but that's the limit of uh, human reproduction. Again, then it clash with some uh, legal and ethical issues. So if there are no other questions, I just want to make a short comment saying that uh, if all of us remember, 40 years ago when IVF started, actually everything was copied from that field because uh, we were not able to do induction of ovulation, so the first paper in science uh, was astonishing because Bob Edwards didn't believe that uh, IVF could be generated uh, by natural ovulation, freezing, oocyte donation, and all the rest. Now the things have been slightly reversed, but I believe that it's crucial to keep the contact with uh, basic research because that's the way for us as uh, clinical workers to improve uh, for the benefit of our patients. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Loy. Well, we are going on. The next speaker will be Carol Coughlin. Carol Coughlin came from Ireland. She has been studying in, and working in Dublin I think in fertility preservation, was more or less. And some years ago, she decided to, to change the, the run, the cold weather, and the lamps to go to the 
mm, sunny days of Dubai. And nowadays, uh, Carol is the medical director of ART clinics here in Dubai. Please, Carol. Carol will speak about uh, how we can interpret the, the hormones in a, in a natural cycle. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I have been tasked today with the assignment to discuss the correct interpretation of hormones in a natural cycle. I know only too well that each and every one of you are familiar with the hormonal fluctuations of a natural cycle, and so too its graphical representation that's so well documented in our textbooks um, and which has been taught in our biology classes for so many years. So, it will surprise you then when I tell you that there is no standardized definition today for ovulation. Can you believe that? The most basic aspect of reproductive medicine. There is no standardized definition for the onset of the LH surge. The surrogate marker for which we base the decision of the timing for our frozen embryo transfers in natural cycles. So when we look here at the endometrial preparation for frozen embryo transfer, I just want to come back a little bit to what Professor Vatimi was talking about. There has been an increasing trend towards frozen embryo transfers. It's now comprising the vast majority of embryo transfers in the vast majority of countries worldwide, being driven by the advent of vitrification, excellent cryo-survival warming rates, the drive towards single embryo transfers, and also now the introduction of pre-implantation genetic testing. And the, the um, decision of the method really with, with which we should use to prepare the endometrium is a topic of controversy. But to go back to basics, what do we need for a successful outcome? We need two things. We need a good quality euploid blastocyst, and we need a receptive endometrium. And we need these two factors to synchronize. That's the basics. And the possible approach is we can transfer the embryo in a natural cycle, a modified natural cycle, a stimulated cycle, or also an artificial HR cycle. And which approach to choose? And as I was saying, it is a topic of controversy. But certainly, there is a drive now towards the natural cycle. It's gaining momentum, driven by studies that are suggesting that the natural cycle has higher live birth rates as opposed to the artificial, and also has certain maternal, obstetric, and improved perinatal outcomes. Um, so are we now moving back towards nature? And if we are, then the natural cycle is becoming more important, and the, the factors that we are using to determine the timing of the transfer of the embryo in the natural cycle is extremely important because it will actually be the deciding factor in terms of the success rates. So we know the artificial cycle, some of the studies here are saying that the live birth rates can be lower and also that the pregnancies can be complicated by hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So that preg pregnancy is now achieved in a frozen embryo transfer cycle without an existing corpus luteum can be at risk of hypertensive disorders. So this now must make us ask the question, it's no longer which option is going to give us the best success rate. We now have an added new dimension and a new importance to the question. So now we have to ask which approach is going to give us the best success rate, but it's also going to give us the safest outcome for the mother and for the baby. So, and now we go back to basics, the graph that we all know. And I just want to go through this just to take you through and to uh, kind of, I suppose, the basics of it that then we can work from. So, we all know at the time of menses, the estrogen level is low, the endometrium is thin, and we're at our baseline level of hormones. As the dominant follicle grows, the E2 level rises, the endometrium is thickening in preparation for pregnancy, referred to as the proliferative phase. 
As far back as 1986, Young actually described the estrogen level that may be necessary to trigger the LH surge. We all know that FSH is exquisitely sensitive to, F to estrogen levels. Even at very low estrogen levels, the FSH level will be suppressed. But certainly as the estrogen level rises and, grows and increases to a certain threshold, you see a sustained and very, um, very low level of FSH. So the estrogen level rises, and what Young was suggesting that you should see a threshold of 200 to 300 picograms per milliliter sustained for approximately 50 hours that would then cause the um, LH surge. And with the LH surge, we then see ovulation, the release of the egg, and the decrease in progesterone. Now, we also see, in addition to the LH rise mid-cycle, we can also see an FSH rise here. Um, and that's very important to note. It does have some physiological benefits. So that FSH rise will increase or promote nuclear maturation, cumulus cell expansion, and very importantly, it will promote LH receptor production on the granulosa cells. And this will secure the function of the corpus luteum into the luteal phase. LH surge, we know, is indispensable for ovulation. It promotes the resumption of the meiotic division. It promotes the production of prostaglandins to aid the follicular wall uh, rupture. Um, so, and these are all very important uh, functions. So, as I was saying, the E2 synthesis from the dominant follicle leads to the LH surge. And here we can see the LH rise, and here we can see the strone rise just beforehand. Now, this was described as far back as 1982 by Spiroff and 1983 by Hoff. In, according to Spiroff, this, uh, this PA, P4 rise occurred approximately 12 to 24 hours prior to ovulation. But according to Hoff, it occurred approximately 12 hours prior to the um, onset of the LH surge. It's a small but significant rise, but Spiroff felt it was of immense um, physiological importance, attributing it to potentiating the estrogen positive feedback on LH leading to the LH surge and also contributing to that mid-cycle FSH rise that we see. So the role of progesterone. Well, once ovulation occurs, the corpus luteum, this is the primary source of progesterone in the luteal phase. And the progesterone sharply rises, reaches a peak at about eight days after LH surge. And progesterone induces the secretory transformation of the endometrium. So that's really important. It induces the secretory transformation of the endometrium, not LH. Spiroff, he suggested that the onset of the LH surge was the best um, predictor of the pending ovulation. Certainly not the LH peak, because studies had shown that it can even be seen after ovulation in 25% of women. So Spiroff suggested we should take the onset of the LH um, surge as the best indirect marker of ovulation. So we took this on board and we have run with it for the past three to four decades. And all our studies of the natural cycle are based on the onset of the LH surge. So, just to take you back here to Filicori's paper in 1986, and he looked at the pulsatile secretion of gonadotropins in the early, mid, and late follicular and luteal phases, taking blood samples, I think, approximately every 10 minutes for about 20 to 24 hours. And you can see here the different patterns of LH in the luteal phase not exactly representing the graphical representations that we're used to seeing. And now in 2022, Erden published a really interesting systematic review of the LH surge and ovulation. And I think it really highlights the lack of consensus um, in reproductive medicine for the most basic aspects of the natural cycle. 
And Allianz had produced a paper in 2013 which clearly showed that the hormonal curves of young fertile women can differ significantly from the mean hormonal curves that we have been using. So the first question that Erdogan looked at was, what is the definition of the LH surge? And there were 10 papers included in this. Five of these were published about approximately four to five decades ago. Five used serum LH monitoring in their studies, and the remaining five used urine testing. And there was three definitions that kind of came through here um, for the onset of the LH surge. So the first was the varying fold above the baseline LH, and that fold increase could be anything from 1.8 to 6. The second definition was to see an increase in standard deviation, two to three standard deviations above the um, preceding values. And the third definition was used by Dorito 2013. It was a urine-based um, study, and he suggested that we would take the 30% of the amplitude of the LH rise. So you can see that the definition is, was by no means standardized, and yet this is the most important factor that we are taking into consideration when timing the transfer of our embryos in natural cycles. The next question he looked at was the time between the onset of the LH surge and ovulation. And again, this is one of the most important factors when we take into account the timing of our embryos in natural cycles. And again, those eight studies, but only six of these were actually included in the meta-analysis. Um, seven used serum for LH monitoring, and the remainder, remaining three were urine-based. And you can see the, the time differences, 28 to 44 hours, 24 to 56, 28 to 35, and so it goes on. And when they did the meta-analysis, they found that the mean duration from the onset of the LH surge to ovulation was 33.91 hours. Now here, I just want to bring you to this slide here to look at the configuration of the LH surge. So we were all led to believe that there was a one type of LH surge and one, one size fits all, but that's so not true. When you look at these three studies here, now these were all urine-based in terms of monitoring for LH, but there was three very specific LH surge patterns noted. Um, the first of these was termed the spike, the second biphasic, and the third the plateau. But if we have a surge that exhibits different peaks of LH, and we take the first peak as being indicative of the ovulation, then it's very obvious that the timing for the transfer of our embryo will be incorrect. So, how do we now monitor LH when we're trying to determine the accurate time for transfer? So, we either use urine testing, which is the most common method that we're currently using, or we use serum. From a practical standpoint, the urine test is patient-friendly, and convenient. However, there are a number of significant disadvantages to it. So testing LH in urine is very much dependent on the assay that we are using. So there are different assays which measure different molecules. If we're using an assay that will measure intact LH only, it is, it is the one that will give us physiologically more relevant information. And we have to take into account inter-individual inter metabolism also of LH and its metabolites. Also, assays with detection limits of less than 40 can produce false negative results in patients who will, ver who will have low peak LH levels. And this can occur in actually up to 35% of ovulatory cycles. Also, there's a prolonged clearance of LH, a time delay, so the urinary LH follow the serum LH peaks. They don't occur at the same time. And this delay can be anything from 24 to 48 hours. 
And very importantly, urinary LH kits may also demonstrate LH surges, but in the absence of ovulation. So there we go. We're now monitoring using urine, which isn't very accurate, um, on LH levels on, uh, based on a surge, which isn't really timing our ovulation accurately. So the pitfalls of the pure natural cycle using serum LH, repeated blood samples are necessary. It is inconvenient. It is more time consuming um, for the clinics, for the patients. And we should, but we should really make the effort to ensure that we're using the most accurate methods. And we should in also combine the serum LH with P4 measurement to confirm ovulation. As I had said before, it's the P4 that will induce the secretory transformation of the endometrium, not LH. So, now, ultrasound, it's direct. We can see it. It's one of the best ways um, to actually look at ovulation. Right? Wrong. And this is for a number of reasons. So the incidence of luteinized unruptured follicle in fertile women can occur in a range of anything from 9 to 46 percent, and this has been shown in published papers. The incidence of a luteinized unruptured follicle in unselected and fertile women has shown to be about approximately 10 percent. Follicle rupture is only achieved at very high LH levels, so three physiological events occur after the LH surge. First is the, you know, the resumption of the meiotic division, and this will occur at fairly low levels of LH. Then the luteinization of the granulosa cells, a much higher level of LH is required. And then thirdly, the follicle wall rupture, and very high levels are required for this. It's interesting to note that, an unlute, that a luteinized unruptured follicle uh, can be associated with decreased mid-luteal serum P4 levels. So if you take a P4 level on the day prior to the transfer or on the day of the transfer, you may find that the P4 levels are low. And this might give you an indication that maybe this was a luteinized unruptured follicle. And you have two choices, either cancel or, or institute a rescue protocol by adding in progesterone. But we really haven't had enough of good randomized control trials really to show the success with this. And the very last point is that we can have different patterns of follicular fluid evacu evacuation. It has been shown that the fluid can remain in the follicle for, for many days into the luteal phase. So this is just giving you an overall uh, review of the timing of embryo transfers in the fresh um, cycle at the very top there. You can see the ovarian stimulation. HCG was administered for trigger. And then approximately um, 36 hours later was the oocyte retrieval. And this was considered to be the first day of progesterone was initiated. And then the transfer was on the sixth full day of progesterone. With HRT, we're mimicking the natural cycle with estrogen administration. Then we're um, introducing the progesterone on day one and transferring the blastocyst on the sixth full day of progesterone. The true natural cycle, you can see here that it's the LH surge that has been taken into account. Look at the progesterone rise is what we should be looking at. And then the transfer, then on the sixth day um, of progesterone, the blastocyst is transferred. And then with the modified natural cycle where HCG is being administered, ovulation is considered to occur approximately 40 hours later. And then here again, we can see the transfer of the embryo. So this is how we would manage our natural cycles in our, in our clinic. So we use a combination of ultrasound with serial hormonal monitoring of the patient, including estrogen, progesterone, and LH. So when we see a dominant follicle of 14 millimeters, we then begin the blood testing. And on occasion, when it comes very near to ovulation, the patient may need to attend for maybe two successive days. So it can be inconvenient, but it does lead to really high pregnancy rates. 
And this was a paper that we did in our own unit. It's been submitted now very recently. It's undergoing peer review. And it was to look at the time frame between the onset of the LH surge and uh, between the LH rise and the progesterone rise. Because when we are basing the timing on the onset of the LH surge, we are assuming that the time between the onset of the LH rise and the P4 rise is acceptably constant. And this study looked at 102 women who underwent serial monitoring for three successive days, up to and including the day of ovulation. And it was very interesting. Three patterns were, were noted very clearly. So 20% of the women exhibited their LH rise two days prior to ovulation. 70% exhibited their LH rise the day immediately prior to ovulation. And the final 10% exhibited their rise on the day of ovulation. So if we look at this in terms of timing in embryo transfer, 30% of women would have had more than a 24-hour difference for embryo transfer time if we based it on the progesterone rise and not on the LH rise. We then did a sub-analysis of this particular group, and it was interesting. We found that of those who exhibited their um, LH rise on day minus two, we, there was a significant difference in terms of AMH between that group and the group who exhibited their rise on the day of um, P4 rise, day of ovulation they were found to have a significantly um, lower AMH and also a significantly higher BMI. And maybe this is a factor that we take into consideration going forward, that maybe these women would benefit from having serial progesterone um, measurements. So I'm going to finish just with this study. And this was a study that looked at embryo transfers um, in women in natural cycles and modified natural cycles. And they looked at the timing of the transfer in terms of the blastocyst stage. So essentially at a blastocyst stage where the embryo might be biopsied for um, PGTA and then frozen, it would be approximately 116 to 124 hours. And then with the timing for the progesterone following ovulation, um, it would be approximately 120 hours. Now, when they took into account the onset of the LH surge, they added the 40 hours, so that brought it to 160 hours, plus or minus four. And with the trigger, for the modified natural cycle, they took into account that 40 hours to allow for ovulation. So again, it brought it to 160 hours, plus or minus four. So what they found across the two groups was that the live birth rates were significantly increased if the duration of progesterone was within the 160 hours plus four or plus six. They had also included um, transfers that were non-optimally timed. So they really only included this as being optimally timed. So you can see here when, it, when the transfers were timed to 160 plus four plus six, the live birth rates were significantly, significantly increased in both the modified natural and the natural. Now, this is the interesting part. When they looked at the modified natural cycle, again, across the board for 160 hours, plus four, plus six, plus eight, plus 12, the live birth rates were higher. And they were higher than the live birth rates in the pure natural cycles. Here, we don't see the significantly increased live birth rate in terms of the 160 hours plus four. And what they concluded here was that the current study suggests that the single frozen thawed euploid blastocyst transfers conducted at 160 hours plus four post-trigger in modified natural cycles are associated with higher live birth rates, independent of embryo quality, etc. And what's really interesting is here, in terms of the natural cycles, it demonstrates comparable live birth rates across a wider window. However, lower live birth rates overall, 
which suggests that there is potential room for further optimization by refining the interpretation of hormonal dynamics to improve embryo endometrial synchronicity. So there we go. And what I would like to say about this study is that there was an, an issue in terms of, I suppose, the methodology. When we look at modified natural cy cycles, we're using HCG to trigger. And I would have some issues with this. Firstly, we're introducing HCG much earlier in the cycle than would normally happen naturally. And this will have an effect on the endometrium. Secondly, HCG and LH will act through the same receptor. And there are studies that show that when they are present together, it may have an, actually have an adverse effect on the pregnancy rates. So to conclude, the majority of the data suggests that precise timing around 120 hours of progesterone exposure provides the highest live birth rates. I think we're all in agreement with that. One day can make a big difference. LH is a surrogate of progesterone in the context of natural frozen embryo transfer cycles and has been for many years, and maybe it's time to reconsider that. The period between the LH rise, peak, and progesterone rise can vary widely. We can't assume that this is an acceptably constant uh, time difference. Scheduling the natural cycle frozen embryo transfer based on progesterone rise may be better, I would say is better. The RCT needed to compare really the LH-based versus progesterone-based scheduling. We do need a good RCT. And the day of blastulation needs to be also considered. Thank you so much for your attention. Much for this nice conference, Carol. Um, we have five minutes in order to make questions. Please, any question? Um, there are no questions. Oh yes. Thank you, Carol, for a wonderful talk. Really enjoyed that. I'm Ying Chong from uh, UK. Um, Thank you. Um, I, I think the paper that you uh, mentioned, uh, Philip Corey's paper on the LH um, uh, variability, pulsatility, um, I think he also showed that progesterone does that too. So, so I'm just wondering if we are measuring progesterone how do we get around this uh, in a natural cycle? How do we get around these um, uh, sort of minute-to-minute um, -minute, uh, variability? Um, I mean, how many consecutive uh, blood Day. tests can you, can you um, take from a patient? Do you see what I mean? Yes. Well, we don't start taking blood tests until we see the dominant follicle at 14 millimeters. And we, what we have to do is look at the blood tests, the three blood test results together. So we're looking essentially at the estrogen, the progesterone, and the LH. So we, we, and then also in conjunction with the ultrasound monitoring. So if we have a follicle that we say 14 millimeters, the estrogen is rising, we can see that, the LH is low, and we haven't seen that small but significant early P4 rise, then she may be brought back in two days again for another scan, and so it will continue until we we'll see. What we will note is that the LH will go up, the estrogen will go down, and when ovulation occurs, the P4 will go up. And it's only really when you see the LH going up and the estrogen going down that she may need that um, further assessment the very next day. And, but actually, when, when you start going um, into the routine of it, and you get used to it, that very frequent monitoring actually isn't as necessary. Thank you, Kara. Okay, please.
excellent talk, like always. Thank oh, you. Thank you. I am really very interested to know about the concentration of progesterone on the very last day. So how much was that? On the day that we would confirm it yeah. as ovulatory. Yeah. Well, we would take the level of one nanograms per milliliter. Yeah. But again, I have to say it's conjunction with the, in conjunction with yeah. the whole picture. Yeah. But um, generally above one would be considered ovulatory because there's been studies that show that the secretory transformation of the endometrium will occur with levels of 0 0.9. I think Professor Patimi would, yeah, would agree. And in this population on day five that you would transfer mm. the embryo, how much was the uh, concentration of progesterone? Do you know that? So um, it's only very recently, actually, that we've introduced the policy of checking the progesterone levels um, on the day prior, actually, to the embryo okay. transfer. And we'd like to see levels of about 10 and, okay. 10 and above. Thank you, Carol. Uh, excellent talk. If you have a blastocyst reaching day five, a blastocyst stage, or you have a blastocyst reaching day six, a blastocyst stage, mm. because not every blastocyst is developing on the same pattern. Mm. Would you transfer different dynamics of embryos on the same day of endometrium? That's a very good question, and it's becoming a very interesting, it's becoming quite a controversial topic, and there's been a few papers now that have looked at this, uh, Caroline Rowlands, I think, most recently. Um, I think at the moment, um, I would still very much follow the protocol um, for these embryos, both day five and day six, I wouldn't fear from what we're doing, but I think it's certainly an area that merits further re more study because there could be other factors aside from progesterone that may um, influence the pregnancy rates because it's not just progesterone. There's a whole area of um, uh, immunity and everything within the uterine environment and uh, the receptivity is not purely based on progesterone. So I think going forward that we do need a good RCT on that. Thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, theoretically, uh, I love your idea. But nowadays, do you think with our pregnancy rates that we have, we could find these differences in pregnancy chances uh, between mm. natural, pure, pure natural cycle uh, uh, in front of uh, modified natural cycle? Mm. Mm, do you think we could find these differences? With our... Sorry, I didn't quite get the question. <clears throat> nowadays, with our pregnancy rates, mm. uh, if we compare a, a natural cycle, pure natural cycle, against a natural modified cycle uh, with our pregnancy rates nowadays, yeah. do you think we could find these differences in, in, in the pregnancies? Which, or theoretically, I, I, I bought your idea, but I don't think so that we could find these differences between chances of pregnancy between but, natural and modified and natural. And modified natural, okay. Well, I suppose, firstly, I wouldn't advocate the modified natural, and that's based on the um, administration of the HCG. Uh, because I was just saying um, there earlier that the HCG, you're introducing it earlier than what would happen naturally, and that can affect the endometrium. And then LH and HCG both act through the same receptor in the endometrium, and studies have shown that if they're both present simultaneously, it can have an adverse effect on the pregnancy rates. So I know that there may be some situations where people would use modified natural and people do get pregnant with it, but in general, it wouldn't be my first port, port of call. So I would be a real advocator of the natural cycle. To me, the studies that we've been basing the natural cycle on have had method, method, very serious methodology issues, really. We're not basing the, um, the timing on the accurate uh, timing of ovulation the time when we see the secretory transformation of the endometrium, we're basing it on a rise in the LH surge, which um, to me is not accurately predicting the ovulatory time. So I think there's more research has to be done and to do it kind of, I suppose, more, more accurately. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you very much. So let's 
move to the next topic, please, Luca. Thank you. Thank you. The last uh, presentation of this session is again goes back to embryology and genetics. So again, you have the CV of uh, um, of Mina, and I, I think that since we are a little bit in late, I ask Mina to come to the podium. I think it's interesting to remember to all of us that uh, 30 years ago, um, genetics was really very far from reproductive medicine. And now the two branches of science are really integrating more and more. So, Mina, welcome and thanks. Thank you. So thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And I would sincerely like to thank the organizers for this invitation. It is truly a pleasure to be here, especially because I get to talk about PGTA and mosaicism in the spirit of putting a question mark behind everything we do. And I often refer to chromosomal mosaicism as the ultimate diagnostic dilemma. And this is because there is still no clinical consensus on how we should diagnose mosaicism, whether we should diagnose it, and what we should do with mosaic embryos. So as you probably know, chromosomal abnormalities are highly prevalent in human embryos, and they actually affect cellular homeostasis. They lead to problems with cellular proliferation, and they impair embryo development. And for this reason, embryo aneuploidy is a major factor influencing human reproductive success. So we know that the frequency of aneuploid embryos increases with advancing maternal age, and this is mirrored by a decrease in fertility. And for this reason as well, the chances of success uh, steadily drop uh, with advancing maternal age. But it has been suggested that ongoing pregnancy rates remain stable across all maternal age groups if a euploid embryo is transferred. So the selection of embryos free from abnormalities should improve clinical outcomes. And this is really the premise for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies. So how do we do PGTA? Well, uh, we take a trophectoderm biopsy from uh, the embryo at the blastocyst stage. We take about five to 10 cells. We extract DNA from these cells, and then we perform next generation sequencing, which is the latest technology being used for PGTA. And the use of PGTA is really increasing. These are some uh, results or statistics from the United States. And we can see that in 2018 already, up to 40% of all cycles included PGTA. And this number is surely uh, higher now, with some clinics even performing 100% PGTA for all their cycles. However, what complicates PGTA is that the origin of chromosomal abnormalities in human embryos is varied. They can originate during meiosis, so uh, during the formation largely of oocytes, but also of sperm. And because these abnormalities are present from the very beginning, so they affect the zygote, all of the cells within the embryo will actually carry the abnormality. And this is what we refer to as uniformly abnormal. Here we have some profiles following next generation sequencing. At the bottom, you can see the cross number. Um, and what we want to see or what we look for is deviations from this baseline. So the baseline will indicate that there is no abnormality present, so euploidy. But if we have a deviation, for instance, here that is above uh, the baseline, and here it is reaching the threshold of what we would consider a uniform abnormality, we can diagnose this embryo with, for in this case, a trisomy 16. Here we see a similar situation where we have a deviation from the baseline. Here we have a loss, so a loss of a chromosome, uh, also chromosome 16, and is reaching the threshold of what we would consider a uniform abnormality. And in this case, the situation is clear. We would not select these embryos for transfer. However, chromosomal abnormalities can also originate uh, during the mitotic divisions that underlie embryogenesis. And here only some cells will be affected. So as an embryo will be a mix of normal and abnormal cells. It can also be a mix of various abnormal cells. 
but the ones that are mixed with normal and abnormal are uh, clinically the most challenging, of course. And these are the kinds of profiles we are faced with. So in this case, we again see an indication of an abnormality, uh, but it is not quite reaching the threshold for us to classify it a uniform aberration. And these kinds of profiles have presented a lot, a lot of challenges. But what we should keep in mind is that mosaicism is actually less pervasive as development progresses. So it is present during the pre-implantation stages, but we see it uh, much less rarely uh, in later development. So only uh, less than 2% of prenatal samples actually show chromosomal mosaicism with true fetal mosaicism only identified in about 0.4% of cases and 0.2% of live births. So then why all this controversy surrounding mosaicism? Well, in the past, using uh, previous technologies for PGTA, we actually didn't detect much mosaicism during the blastocyst stage of development. And with the implementation of next generation sequencing, we have really seen an increase in reports of mosaicism. And as I mentioned earlier, it has really become a diagnostic dilemma, especially since it has been shown that these embryos that are classified as mosaic can actually lead to live births. And what, has actually, what we are seeing is that these mosaic diagnoses are actually becoming a separate category of classifications following PGTA. But what we have to keep in mind is that diagnosing mosaicism is actually hindered by several biological, but also technical challenges. And there are still a lot of reservations regarding the clinical value of diagnosing mosaicism. And this is complicating a lot of embryo transfer policies. But also there are still a lot of uh, concerns regarding the risks of transferring uh, mosaic embryos. But as I mentioned, one thing we have to be very aware of is that PGTA, the technology behind PGTA, is actually not perfect. We are starting from very little amounts of DNA. And in fact, because of this, we, the DNA has to undergo this step of whole genome amplification to generate millions of copies of the original DNA that we had from the cells. What we hope for, of course, is an even amplification. But what can happen is that certain parts of the genome actually get over or underrepresented, and this leads to a biased amplification. And with this, we can sometimes see deviations from the baseline in profiles as technical noise, um, and these artifacts of amplification or sequencing may actually be indistinguishable from mosaic results, which makes these diagnoses even more challenging. So all of these differences in diagnosing mosaicism and different strategies that have been applied for transferring mosaic embryos may actually impact the number of euploid embryos that become available for transfer. As I mentioned, mosaic diagnoses have emerged as a third category of possible ploidy outcomes, but some clinics are still choosing to transfer mosaic, or choosing to transfer mosaic embryos, some not to transfer them, and some are transferring certain types of mosaic embryos. So during our research, uh, we have applied two different approaches to look at the impact of diagnosing mosaicism on PGTA. So the first approach has been a more fundamental one where we are actually trying to evaluate the accuracy of diagnosing mosaicism using an, uh, using an extended embryo in vitro culture model. And then we also wanted to look at disparities in diagnosing and reporting mosaicism across different PGTA providers and clinics. Given all the issues that I mentioned regarding technical artifacts and so on, we, we assume that there are a lot of disparities. And we wanted to look at how these may actually affect PGTA results, especially the number of embryos that are available for transfer. So for the per first part, as I mentioned, we, we apply a more fundamental approach where we actually use this extended in vitro culture system. And this system allowed us to culture embryos beyond the implantation stages up to day 12 in vitro. And in this system, we actually plate embryos on day six of development. They attach to the dish, forming this outgrowth, and this outgrowth can expand up to day 12. And when we stain these embryos, we can see that they actually contain structures that are associated with post-implantation development, such as the epiblast in green, the hypoblast, and also we see the trophoblast cells. 
So we use this system to culture PGTA embryos, uh, different types of diagnosis, so a number of uniformly aneuploid embryos, also mosaic embryos. Here we have two categories, so embryos that were diagnosed with a uniform aneuploidy and a mosaic abnormality, and those just diagnosed with a mosaic abnormality, and then also some euploid uh, embryos as controls. So the first thing we uh, look for our developmental outcomes. So around 50% of the embryos actually remained attached throughout this extended culture, whereas the other 50% detached and we can see uh, clear signs of degeneration. We then further, uh, we then collected the attached embryos uh, at day 12. Um, and we actually sequenced them as well. So we could compare the PGTA diagnosis from the blastocyst biopsy to the chromosomal profiles on day 12. And the first thing we looked at is we compared actually the developmental outcomes to uh, the trifectoderm biopsy results. And we observed that the euploid embryos and those with trisomies and duplication, so chromosomal gains, were significantly more likely to remain attached whereas uh, embryos with monosomies or multiple maladies were significantly more likely to detach. And what we further observed when comparing uh, the results of the blastocyst biopsy to those on day 12 is that these whole chromosome abnormalities actually persisted throughout development. So if we have a uniform abnormality, we can see it really remaining in the embryo, which indicates, of course, that these abnormalities are of meiotic origin. And we can see that these abnormalities do actually affect embryo development. So here we have a euploid embryo, and we can see all the uh, structures that are associated with post-implantation development. But if we look at some uh, embryos with abnormalities like monosomies or trisomy, we can see a different uh, phenotype. Here we also have, um, we also measured uh, the surface area of the embryos that uh, had trisomies and we can see that they are also affecting uh, development. It's quite interesting that euploid embryos, when we compared them to viable trisomies, so 13, 18 and 21, uh, we don't see much difference in surface area, but when we look at the more uh, rare autosomal trisomies, we can see much smaller outgrowth. So they are uh, obviously affecting development. So what about the mosaic embryos? Well, in fact, uh, mosaic, uh, those embryos that were diagnosed with mosaicism were predominantly remaining attached throughout this culture. And we can see that the mosaic embryos had very similar phenotypes to euploid embryos as well. And when we look at the results, when we compare those results on day 12 to the results at the blastocyst stage for the mosaic embryos, we actually could not confirm the original mosaicism in any of the day 12 results. So here um, we have um, several embryos that were diagnosed with single mosaic abnormalities, and as you can see, all the results were euploid. Um, and here uh, we have uh, some embryos that were diagnosed with both uh, an aneuploidy and uh, mosaicism. In this case, in fact, we have an embryo with three mosaic abnormalities. We can always confirm the uniform abnormality. However, we did not uh, confirm the mosaic diagnosis. And here are just some uh, examples to further convince you, showing uh, embryos that were diagnosed with both low and high-grade mosaicism, and all of these actually generated euploid outgrowth. So here we have an embryo with a mosaic monosomy 9, mosaic monosomy 8, and as you can see, there is no evidence of these abnormalities at day 12. Um, and here we have uh, two other examples, so mosaic monosomy 18 and a deletion on chromosome 20. They were both originally diagnosed as high level and we did not confirm them at day 12. And finally, these are embryos that had both a uniform abnormality and mosaic aberration. So as I mentioned, in these cases, we can always detect the uniform abnormality. So in this case, the trisomy 8 that was originally diagnosed. But this embryo was also diagnosed with a mosaic monosomy 3. And as you can see, we see no evidence of that abnormality. And also uh, another example here with a monosomy 16. And this embryo was originally diagnosed with a mosaic trisomy 
trisomy 9, uh, and we cannot confirm it at day 12. So what we observed from these extended in vitro culture studies is that, in fact, 100% um, we, we detected 100% concordance for whole chromosome uniform aneuploidies. And this is, in fact, reassuring for PGTA. PGTA is quite accurate in diagnosing uh, abnormalities of meiotic origin and those that are, so those that are present uh, in the entire embryo. But positive predictive value is considerably reduced when diagnosing mosaicism. And false positives were largely attributed to diagnosis of mosaicism. And of course, this raises significant challenges regarding the accuracy, but also the relevance of these mosaic predictions. Why are we making these diagnoses? So as our second question, uh, we wanted to look at how uh, these uh, challenges in accuracy uh, varied amongst different PTTA providers and clinics. And as I mentioned, we really wanted to focus on the availability of embryos for transfer. So to do so, we reviewed um, 36,395 consecutive PGTA results in a retrospective international multicenter study. The results were obtained from around 10,000 patients across 11,000 cycles. And these cycles were performed between October 2015 and 2021. And a total of 17 IVF centers participated in the study across eight different PGTA providers and five countries. So as I mentioned, we included eight different PGTA providers. And as you can see, some of them served only one clinic, but there were certain providers uh, that served several clinics. So for instance, provider C, two clinics. We have provider uh, F, uh, with uh, four clinics and also provider H with several clinics. And we also used provider H as the reference for our statistical analysis uh, as it had uh, the largest number of uh, PGTA results. So to do our um, analysis, we performed a multi-level mixed linear regression and we compared associations between the PGTA provider and the outcomes. Uh, we adjusted for several confounders, and in this analysis, we included both autologous and oocyte donation, next-generation sequencing-based PGTA cycles. We also then evaluated uh, results of mosaic embryo transfers across 15 of the clinics, and this included outcomes following the transfer of 245 mosaic blastocysts. So as I mentioned, uh, we had around 10,000 patients included, um, and here we have some of the characteristics. So the mean maternal age was 36.2 years, uh, mean paternal age 40 years, and um, our cohort included around 10% uh, oocyte donation cycles, but as you can see, this uh, varied amongst different providers, ranging from zero uh, to about 30%. And when we look at uh, the different uh, results of the ploidy, so the, uh, what we first observed is when we look at the different providers here, is that providers B to H actually diagnosed mosaic embryos as a third category of possible outcomes, whereas provider A did not report mosaicism. So they only diagnosed embryos as either euploid or aneuploid. And overall, we can see that around 45% of embryos were diagnosed as euploid, 49.4% as aneuploid, and 5.7% as mosaic. We then further, uh, with our um, multi-level uh, regression analysis, we looked at different predictors of euploidy and mosaicism. And we observed uh, or confirmed uh, that uh, euploidy rates were significantly reduced with advancing maternal age. And also that embryos on day six and seven were significantly less likely um, to be euploid compared to day five embryos. And we confirmed that paternal age and the number of embryos biopsied actually had no effect on diagnosis of euploidy or diagnosis of mosaicism. And I should mention that um, the previous parameters didn't have an effect on mosaicism, so maternal age nor the day of biopsy. We then also looked at uh, the different effects of the clinic. 
So as I mentioned, we had some providers that, had, that were serving several clinics. So for instance, provider F, we compared uh, the effects of the clinic on these outcomes, and we can see that in this case, uh, there was no effect or difference in euploidy or mosaicism rates. However, for, for provider H, we can see that the odds of diagnosing euploidy were higher for clinic uh, A1, which could indicate that there are some factors uh, that we cannot account for uh, that may be influencing euploidy, but we did not see this effect on mosaicism. So at least in our study, we don't believe that there are technical uh, effects of the lab that are um, influencing this diagnosis. So following our adjusted analysis, the provider was the strongest predictor of PGTA results. And in fact, we saw significant differences in the rates of mosaicism amongst the different providers, ranging from 3 to 25%. And five of the providers had significantly higher odds of diagnosing euploidy whereas the odds of diagnosing mosaicism was significantly lower for provider B and provider C, while they were significantly higher for provider E. We then also looked at the chance of having at least one euploid embryo available for transfer. And here what we observed is that the odds were highest for those providers with the lowest uh, rates of mosaicism and also for the provider that did not report mosaicism. And also overall, the chance of having at least one euploid blastocyst available for transfer increased significantly when mosaicism was not reported. So when we compared provider A versus all the other providers that reported mosaicism. We then also looked at rates of single uniform aneuploidies and single mosaic aberrations. And if you look at the rates of single uniform aneuploidies, we actually see very consistent results amongst all uh, the providers. But if we look at the single mosaic aberrations, we can see a lot of variability. So this really leads us to believe that some of these diagnoses of mosaicism are mostly technical of origin rather than actually reflecting true biology. We also looked at diagnoses per chromosome. Um, so our, for the single uniform aneuploidies, we confirmed what was previously known, that abnormalities on chromosomes 15, 16, 21, and 22 were the most prevalent. And these results were consistent across all the providers. However, when we look at single mosaic aberrations, uh, the frequency was quite uh, similar across all the chromosomes, apart from diagnosis of Tri mosaic trisomies on chromosome 19. And this is a very interesting result because in fact chromosome 19 is very difficult to sequence. So this could again suggest that some of these diagnoses are in fact just technical artifacts. We finally looked at the clinical outcomes following the transfer of mosaic embryos. So as I mentioned, these were outcomes of the transfer of 245 uh, mosaic uh, blastocysts. Hello? Okay. Um, and uh, as you can see, what was quite striking to us is that in fact, the rate of blastocysts, mosaic blastocysts transferred was only uh, around 13%. So, and this rate actually varied quite, um, varied, uh, quite significantly amongst the providers, ranging from providers transferring 0% mosaic blastocysts to those transferring around 36.5%. But overall, not many embryos that are diagnosed as mosaic actually get transferred. And we, when we look at clinical pregnancy rates, the results were uh, 40% uh, and live birth rate of 35.2%. And if we compare these results to the results of the transfer of euploid embryos, we see a very similar picture. So clinical pregnancy of around 42% and live birth rate of 35%. So overall, we reveal a strong association between the genetic testing provider and PGTA results. And we show that classifying embryos as mosaic may actually come at the expense of euploid diagnosis. Despite their normal developmental potential, close to 90% of mosaic blastocysts actually do not get used. 
And differences in mosaic diagnosis across different PGTA providers actually point to technical bias as opposed to true biological variability. So we have to be very careful. And our findings highlight the strong need for standardization and quality assurance in the industry. False positive diagnosis may actually play a role in the failure to demonstrate improved outcomes with PGTA. Current practices limit the clinical utility of PGTA per cycle because we are excluding potentially viable embryos. So until we can really be sure that the diagnosis of mosaicism accurately reflects biological variability, reporting mosaicism really remains difficult to justify as it seems that it may really determine the chance of between or the difference between success and failure for some patients. So thank you very much for your attention. I would also like to thank all our collaborators on these projects. I'm happy to answer any questions. Much, Mina. Do we have a question? Um, Why we are thinking about some question? I, I would like to just, uh, uh, well, to have your opinion on the fact that, uh, in fact, if we look at uh, um, the previous technologies that we were using, that was a race CGH, where mosaics were not detected, and you compare the clinical results between NGS. And, uh, um, and the race age, in fact, from the clinical point of view, there was no increase in using NGS in terms of clinical pregnancies. So most probably, as you have shown, <clears throat> having an impact of less than 2% of the babies born on mosaicism, most probably we should refocus the concept of uh, uh, mosaics. It looks like we, uh, how could I say, shoot on our foot Yes. Only thanks to technology. Yes, it's true. Well, we've implemented the technology, of course, mostly for commercial reasons. Next generation sequencing is a lot actually cheaper to perform compared to RACGH. So I think we have rushed into the implementation of this, but in some ways, and assume that it is more sensitive. But we still haven't uh, uncovered all the technical challenges of actually using next generation sequencing. And I think we have to improve this technology. But we have to realize that we are starting from a very low amount of DNA, and that's inevitably going to affect the results, especially with next generation sequencing. Yeah. Mm. Yes, human. Thank you, Mina. As usual, excellent talk. Um, while I was a few months ago in Italy at uh, Luca's meeting in Bologna, he presented very beautiful data because sometimes you have a um, good quality embryo, you do a trophoctodon biopsy, and you have no pregnancy. Even though you respect nature, you go with a receptive endometrium, you do everything, and still there is no implantation. Um, Luca did some work on, and maybe you can elaborate more on that, on blastocell fluid and whether there is well or no DNA amplification from a blastocell fluid. Could you explain us why you think that some of the embryos fail to implant even though they have a normal trophocodon biopsy? They, so they had amplification, they failed to implant, but they had amplification or they didn't have amplification. Sorry, I didn't. Luca, can you explain it, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, very briefly. Um, what we have done uh, is uh, to analyze um, the quality of the amplification. Okay. So what we found is that when there is very low DNA, so such a low amount of DNA in the blastocytic fluid that you cannot detect with, of course, a standardized amplification, the embryo, the blastocyst is more prone to implant, assuming the concept that the quiet embryo mm -hmm. does not really need uh, to discharge inside the blastocytic fluid DNA or apoptotic DNA uh, uh, you can rank your embryos according to this. Yes. And, and I think that the question of uh, human is uh, if uh, uh, this could also play a role or could you in some way put also the mosaics 
problem inside the council. Yeah, budget. I think. Well, yeah, it it goes it goes along that hypothesis that if you're having an embryo that's abnormal, or maybe uh, depending on the level of abnormal cells within the embryo, that it would be potentially excluding these cells or that a lot of apoptosis is going on. And in that case, you can have a lot of fragmented DNA within the blastocele fluid or maybe even the media. So that is probably why you see uh, in these cases uh, a failure of amplification. It is a lot more difficult to, to amplify. So it's something to consider and also especially something to consider, I think, with non-invasive approaches that are being uh, implemented now. Any question for the audience? Yes, there is one question there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I have two questions, actually. Um, the first one, you know, if you take a sheep embryo or a cow embryos and you do the same analysis, 40% of them are mosaic. So they have inside some, you know, aneuploid cells. But fertility is not an issue in, in sheep and in cow. So somebody says that maybe that be a physiological trait and these aneuploid cells will go into the trophectoderm, which fits. You know, placenta cells, they are aneuploid, they are multinucleated, they are endoduplicated, which fits to the placental function. They confer proliferative advantage. Mm -hmm. So could you speculate on that? That's the first question. And, uh, yeah, so it has been suggested, this, this uh, hypothesis has also been suggested in human, but that would then go against testing trophectoderm biopsy, because if, we are, if the cells are getting uh, pushed towards the trophectoderm, um, it, it doesn't really then support PGTA, right? So uh, there have been some studies that are actually looking at single cell sequencing results from blastocysts, and they don't actually see a difference between the number of abnormal cells in the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. So the hypothesis may be that the placental mosaicism that we see is actually um, originates at a later stage, so when these cells are proliferating a lot more. But of course, it could be that there are some cells within the trophectoderm that are abnormal, but it doesn't seem to really affect uh, implantation, at least in, in human and from our results. And it probably depends on the percentage of the abnormal cells, of course, that are present. Thank you. The second question, if I can ask you. Sure. So you show that some um, blastocysts, for um, aneuploid blastocysts, you let them outgrow in vitro, and then at a certain point, they've been cured for the aneuploid. How could you explain that? So they cure themselves in vitro? Yeah, so I think that there are different uh, mechanisms and what is, being, uh, what is one hypothesis is that in fact we know that uh, aneuploid cells uh, divide slower. So what it can be uh, happening is that with these outgrowths, the euploid cells are actually taking over and the uh, aneuploid cells slowly get lost throughout the culture. We normally see this uh, only in embryos that were diagnosed with mosaicism. So with the, in 100% of cases with embryos that are diagnosed with a uniform aneuploidy, so those that we assume are present throughout the embryo, we haven't seen this uh, correction mechanism. But of course, in the, in the mosaic embryos, we do see it. And as I mentioned, in some cases, this could be because the original diagnosis of mosaicism was just a false positive. So it could be that it's a technical artifact, or as you uh, mentioned, that these cells are, or uh, with this hypothesis, that these cells are somehow being either eliminated from the embryo or that the euploid cells are taking over. Okay, thank you. We, we, we have only one uh, last question, I think, there. Yes, if we can have uh, a nice question and a short answer. So we, uh, we yes, yeah. thank you for this uh, very beautiful lecture. But from clinical point of the view, are we encouraged after your result to transfer a mosaic, mosaicism embryo? And if this is if this was the only hope for this patient, if this is the only embryo the patient is having, and it will affect the consent. Shall we mention different consent? Um, we sit with the patient and talk. We are transferring mosaic in patient, uh, embryo. And uh, the result and the outcome depend on what we will get. Yeah, so I hope that uh, from my talk, the main message is to, to for, uh, call for standardization of techniques. I think that uh, what we are seeing uh, from literature is that we have very different uh, diagnosis of mosaicism and very different technical challenges. 
So for some laboratories, uh, I would recommend, yes, that we should transfer all mosaic embryos. But I think the take-home message is to really check the laboratory that is doing uh, your analysis. Um, if, the, if, the only, uh, if you diagnose mosaicism, then of course this complicates embryo transfer policies because yes, the patients have to have counseling, they have to have a consent for transferring this type of embryo because we are still unaware of the risks of transferring embryos that are potentially diagnosed as mosaic. So I think it has to, I, my point of view would be to encourage the transfer of mosaic embryos and in fact not to report it at all from the genetic providers. Because once we report it, it is very difficult uh, to, the, the counseling becomes more difficult. Um, but uh, again, the main point is really to go back to the genetic laboratory and check the number of false positives that are actually being diagnosed. Okay, on behalf of my co-chairman, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers and uh, all of you for the first session of this uh, meeting, and we will reconvene in time after the coffee break. Thank you very much again. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for doing my job. That was wonderful. So we'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. So we want to try and get ahead of schedule. So we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. We're now going to move on to our second session of the day. So same principle, we'll have our two chairpersons and then we'll have each individual talk. So first of all, um, let me introduce Dr. Miguel Checa. He's a specialist in obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive medicine, head of human reproduction section at the Hospital Del Mar, and director of the International Master's Degree in Reproductive Medicine. Dr. Checa is also an associate professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and coordinator of the International Master's Degree in Reproductive Medicine. Please welcome him to the stage. You have to be a little bit more excited than that. You've had a coffee. There we are. That's better. <laughs> and also we have Dr. Francisco Reith, specialist reproductive medicine and infertility at ART Fertility Clinics Abu Dhabi. Let me tell you a little bit about him whilst I practice my high school Spanish. Dr. Francisco attained his master's degree in human reproduction from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos and the Instituto Valenciano de Infertilidad. Is that right? In 2010 in Madrid, Spain. He's a renowned specialist in reproductive endocrinology, infertility, and has worked as a human reproduction specialist at both IVI Mexico and IVI Madrid. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him. First of all, I want to thank the scientific committee to invite us to this meeting. And we're going to introduce the first speaker. First speaker is Laura Melado. She's the medical director of ART Clinic here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, she has completed the bachelor degree in medicine surgery in Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, in 2002, in, in 2002, and he uh, is PhD uh, for the same university in uh, 2015 with the cum laude. He has more than 25 international peer-review papers published. Hello. Um... Thank you all of you to be here today on Saturday. Uh, my presentation today is about poor ovarian reserve patients and how we can deal with them. What are new techniques, new aspects, new treatments? What can we do for them now in 2023? And this is a recurrent topic that we go on and on. It seems that we are waiting to have new medications or new add-ons to give to the patients, but actually we see very small changes in the, um, in, uh, during the last few years in how we treat the patients. And I, want, I bring here this presentation. This is a commencement speech, and Admiral William McRaffel uh, did in Texas, and he explained to the young men and women that were about to finish the university that Make your bed every morning because this small task will encourage you to complete another task and another task and another task. And by the end of the day, you will have complete several tasks. And making your bed every morning will give you the idea that small things in life matter. And if by any chance you have a miserable day, you will come back home to your bed that is made, that you made. And that will encourage you to think that tomorrow will be a better day. So small things in life, small things in medicine matters. We need a huge change for our patients with poor response. We need to focus on the small things that we can do for them every day in our life that we have in our hands. And this is what I'm going to focus today in my presentation. The small things that really matter, small things that we can do on a daily basis for them. Because we know that age is one of the, the most important factors that we cannot deal with. We cannot change the age of our patients. And now everybody is aware of this. It's 
all the news, all around, all the public famous ladies are talking about their issues with reproductive uh, problems and age. We cannot change that. And age and ovarian reserve is the most important predictive factors to have a baby. Actually, Dr. Antonio Lamarca presented in ESRE this last um, um, session in Milan in the summer, this beautiful publication that includes what are the factors that will give you the chance to have one euploid embryo. And we know that is age. Age is very important, but it's the second one. The first one is AMH, which is a representation of the ovarian reserve. And that means that if I don't have ovarian reserve, if I don't have one egg, I don't have an embryo. I don't have an euploid embryo. I don't have anything else. So we need to have eggs. We need to have a good age to find an euploid embryo. And another factors that matter much less, but for sure, when we deal with a patient that is very poor ovarian reserve, if we don't get that egg, for sure there's nothing else that we can do. So we need to focus on how can I do my best to get this egg for the patient. And it's very important to predict it accurately because each egg matters. The more the eggs I get at any given age, the more the eggs I can obtain from the patient, the best chances she will have to have a live birth. Any given age, a group of young patients below 29, 30 to 34, 35 to 39, and above 40. Every egg that I get, the better the chances. So it's not that with three eggs, four eggs, one egg more matters. Any egg extra gives me better chances. And it's because the more the eggs, the more the euploid embryos. And at any given age, I will have better chances to have embryos for an euploid embryo transfer. And of course, later on, to put it back, as Dr. Fatemi presented today, in the best endometrium. Actually, one of the most important things that is for the ovarian reserve is to focus on these different populations that we have to deal with. I come from you, and we have a completely different population. And here, we had to learn how to focus on the issues that matters here in the Middle East, in the UAE, because the uh, patients that we deal with here are different. And what we saw is this fact. When I came here seven years ago, everybody was telling me that this population have high rates of polycystic ovary, very high rates. You have never seen that difficult polycystic ovaries in your life. And actually, when the patients come to our office, and they present something like this, this sign talk. My periods are irregular, doctor. Sometimes every 24 days, sometimes every three months, for the last couple of years. What is the first thing that we consider? A polycystic ovary that doesn't ovulate or that the patient is poor responder, is a premature ovarian insufficiency? What do you think when you see your patients? I'm not ovulating because my periods are delayed and sometimes I get it in a short period. Couple of months, last, uh, last year I didn't have my period. What's going on with me? My first impression is, is a polycystic ovary. It's an, ov an, ovula an ovulation with a polycystic ovary. But it's true. These are the chances. Actually, we did an analysis of more than 2,500 patients that come to our clinic and we saw that 40 percent of them any age 40 percent of the patients that comes for a new consultation are poor ovarian reserve with an amh below 1.1 and less than 10 percent are polycystic ovaries so i have four times more chance to have a patient with 
premature ovarian insufficiency that is telling me I don't get my periods every month for the last two years that a patient with polycystic ovary. So we need to be sharp. We need to understand that this patient cannot go home and most probably that will get better very soon. We need to do a scan. We need to diagnose if she is a poor ovarian reserve. And mainly for patients in this population that are between 36 and 40, because we evaluate when this ovarian reserve, when the parameters, the markers of ovarian reserve, AMH and antral follicle count, when do they drop faster for these patients? And it's true that it continually goes down through life of the patient, but at 36 and 40, the drop is huge, is a big jump and decreases very, very fast. So we have to be aware that most probably when we have a patient above 35, this uh, missing period is not an anovulation. It's an anovulation not because of a PCOS, it's because of a poor response. And we saw as well that if the patient is young and she has some other risk factors, here in the Middle East, as well they can have higher rates of poor response. And these patients are the patients that the parents are coming from the same family. If the parents of the women are related, a young patient might have also poor ovarian reserve. So we have to study, we have to ask the patients, we have to do a proper amnesis to identify the risk factors proper for this population. Okay, so we have discussed with our patient, look, you have a poor ovarian reserve, I did the diagnosis, the patient goes home and says, now what? Because the most important for the patient is actually not the diagnosis. The diagnosis is to put it in Google. She wants to know what is my prognosis? What is going to happen to me now? What can I do? And I went home here in UAE and I Googled what should I do if I have low ovarian reserve. And that was the first answer. Here, we cannot do egg donation. We cannot do donors. And this is the first answer. How my patient is going to react? She is going to say that there's nothing else for me. I cannot do anything else. I will never do an egg donation, and then what's next? So this is what we're going to talk about. First of all, we need to be very accurate in how we diagnose a poor ovarian reserve, not only to identify patients, also to know which patient inside that group of poor ovarian reserve is having the worst case scenario. That means less than three eggs. We are evaluating in our center which assays can give me a better predictive value for extremely worse response. And this is the molecule of AMH. So when the granulosa cells produce AMH, they produce it in a kind of pre-hormone with a very long chain of amino acids. And it goes to the stream. It get, when it goes to the stream, it gets... Uh, broken at the end by proteases, and in the stream we have this pro-AMH molecule. This pro-AMH molecule is processed by another proteases, and proteolysis is happening here, and then we have an active uh, molecule of AMH that binds the receptors. So in our serum samples, we have two different molecules of AMH. One is this pro-AMH, which is non-active, and we have an active form of AMH that is the one that will bind the receptors. What happens that the normal assays that we use on a daily basis for evaluating AMH have different antibodies that bind the molecule in different positions. But they don't bind the molecule in other areas, and sometimes they miss part of the AMH that is in the bloodstream. So 
we are investigating new assays, including different uh, antibodies that can bind the molecule in different positions. So to get more accurate evaluation of AMH in poor responders. And we have created different models to analyze which patients can have a response of less than 3x, 3 or less than 3. And there are some assays, actually is this one, is an assay that is designed to uh, evaluate uh, AMH in high responders in polycystic ovarian patients that are the one that now is newly applicable to poor responders that will give us a very, very accurate result for extremely poor responders. So in the next few years, few months, we will see that more accurate assays will give us better predictive values. But nowadays in our clinic, on a daily basis, we have antral follicle count. We do the scan and we check the patient and we see that Okay, she has a low number of eggs. This is terrible. I only can see one. And what we can do is, of course, this patient with poor response, she wants to go ahead with the treatment as soon as possible. They understand that the time is limited for them. But is this month or next month? When should I start? Should I wait? If I see this, will I have any benefit to wait for another month? We have seen that, yes, sometimes the patients have different antral follicle count the next month, and that will be translated to the number of eggs that we can recruit. For a patient that has one antral follicle and we get one egg, if next month she has three antral follicles and I can get three eggs, it's a huge difference. Because as we saw at the beginning, each egg matters. So, we publish that from the moment that one patient has a period to the moment that the patient has the next period, AMH can have almost 30% of intercycle variation. And that also has been published by other authors using antral follicle count. And what happened that this is translated, as I mentioned, to the number of eggs I can get. This is a study published in Fertility and Sterility that they give to donors exactly the same donor, exactly the same stimulation during three months in a row. And they found that only, and I say only because I'm surprised that to the same patient, only 75% of the patient had consistent result the next cycle. 12% change to low responder, 12% change to higher responder. So only 70% of the patients, if I do myself a cycle with the same medication, exactly the same, the next month, only 75% will be the same. So maybe I have a better result the next month. And that means that I should not lose hope maybe tomorrow might be better. So this is an option that we have for our patients to evaluate which is the best cycle. It's not easy and by the moment it's very difficult to evaluate which factors can predict which is the best month, but we can have small variations and that's very important. Let's move on to the uh, add-ons. That is more or less what all of us we keep on reading what can I give to the patient extra before going for the stimulation. These are the ESRE guidelines, the most important recommendations that we have. This is a publication in 2020, and any add-on medication gives an improvement. The use of any add-on before or during ovarian stimulation is not recommended. Metformin, growth hormone, any other androgens, aspirin, indomethacin, and sildenafil. So that means that there's no strong scientific evidence that I can improve the results of my poor responder giving to them three months of medication before 
or adding to the stimulation any of these things. But you know, there's always new publications, new research, new things, and testosterone and DHEA is a medication that is being investigated in several publications. And in January 2023, this month, it has been published a meta-analysis including different publications, eight randomized controlled trials, so top quality evidence, performed very recently, including almost 800 women with testosterone gel using different models of testosterone, transdermal, in gel, and seems that actually we get more eggs, less days of stimulation, less doses of gonadotropins, that we can have an improvement on the results. So basically, if I get more eggs, I will get better chances. So every day we have to keep on reading because new things can give better evidence. And what about PRP? PRP is platelet-rich plasma that uh, we inject in the ovaries looking for more eggs to be recruited. Actually, the idea of um, increasing the vascularization, improving the uh, activation of the dormant oocytes is a technique that is investigated with different, different um, uh, preparations, PRP or other preparations. But actually, PRP has not demonstrated that really can improve, and we need more research protocols. From 2020, what's new now? October 2022, a, prep, a publication from the group of uh, Norbert Glacier, which published that in 20 patients, not with premature ovarian insufficiency, let's be clear, is not a patient that has premature ovarian insufficiency, it's a poor responder that has AMH below 1.1, FSH above 12, and that I collected less than 3x the previous cycle, they didn't find any evidence that PRP will improve the results with the next cycle. So we have to be really very cautious of what we do with patients because there are things that still have not demonstrated that they can do it better. What we can do for the patients is, as far as I can, if I get more eggs, I will have better results. Let's get more eggs in a shorter period of time. Also, these patients are lacking time, so they need to go ahead with more stimulation. So we can do a stimulation immediately after the egg collection. This is the idea of the duo steam. I start with a period, I give a course of gonadotropins, I plan for an egg collection, and immediately after the egg collection, I stimulate the patient again, and I do two pickups the same month. So shorter time more eggs, and this seems that has not only better number of eggs, of course I do two stimulations, the eggs have good quality in the second stimulation, the number of euploid embryos is similar, and it's a good idea to go ahead. Actually, one of the main things that have been discussed with the uh, stimulations during the luteal phase is that for these patients I need to do a longer stimulation. I have to give them more gonadotropins and the patients it takes long time to see a response. So this is a very new publication from November 2022 that they compare actually if I start the luteal phase stimulation very early, very early, day zero or day one, in a early mid luteal phase or in a mid late luteal phase so the more i wait the more days i need for the stimulation and the more doses per day i need to i have significant differences and that means that yes it has been published that there are longer stimulations during the luteal phase but if i pay attention and i start very early during the luteal phase i can avoid these problems. So another small thing I can do 
to benefit the patients if I go for a dual steam or for a luteal phase stimulation. And sometimes we have patients that they are extremely poor responders. They come with a period, FSH is very high. We give gonadotropines for three, four, five, six days. The follicles are not growing. The follicles or the follicle is not growing. Zero. We do the first scan, no response, linear endometrium, stradiol is very low, and we don't know what to do. We continue with the gonadotropines four, five, six days more. They are not responding. What do we do? So, Dr. Glacier pre uh, presented this uh, publication that if after four, five, six days of gonadotropines in these extremely poor responders, you decide to stop the gonadotropines, don't cancel. Wait for three, four, five days more and repeat the scan because they can have a rebound of the follicle growth. It will be maybe one follicle, maybe it will be two, but we have seen that in our patients. We do that for our patients when they don't respond to the medication after a course of days, we continue with the follicular tract without any medication. We stop everything and we continue. After four or five days, we repeat the scan. We have nothing to lose. The patient has no medication, they have nothing to lose. But if we get one follicle and one egg, that will not be a missing cycle. Okay, now we have the egg, we, we have the follicle, and we want to trigger. So what's the trigger? What can I give her for trigger? So actually, we have different triggers, different protocols to trigger for final maturation. But agonist trigger only for these patients most probably has not a good benefit. I will not get the as many eggs or as many mature eggs as I can get. And we are not talking about a cohort of 20 eggs. We are talking about a cohort of maybe one or two eggs. So we need to do my best. And only agonist trigger is not a good option. Combining both agonist and ACG, or even only ACG, will be the best option. So these patients, they don't have any risk of a hyperstimulation. They will benefit to combine ACG and agonist. Next, when I trigger the patient, she has extremely poor response. Maybe one egg, maybe one follicle that after this rebound we see, what do I do? Do I trigger her with 19, 20, 22 millimeters? That's not a good option because another thing that we really know is that these patients have this. The follicle and the oocyte have a speed up maturation, and they have, when we go for the pickup, they have a premature rupture. We don't have the follicle. We trigger, and then 34, 36 hours later, we don't have the follicle. We have nothing to puncture. We need to do an early trigger. We need a highly individualized egg retrieval. This group presented this publication in the book that Dr. Barbara Lawrence and Dr. Fatemi edited a couple of years ago. And the more the patient um, has lower ovarian reserve, the earlier I should trigger. And if the age is going up, still very small sizes. It's difficult to believe. Difficult to believe because I have one patient, 44 years old, only one follicle has grown. I have to trigger her. And I'm telling you that we have to trigger with 30 millimeters. It's something that usually we never do, but it works. I bring a couple of examples, but we have plenty. It's something that we are, um, data that we are um, uh, preparing for, uh, for a publication. And we give high doses, we have few eggs, very few eggs, patient 42 years old, AMH 0.2, BMI almost 28, which is the average of the BMI of the population here, these follicles, and we did dual trigger, and we got three eggs, three mature eggs. 
13, 12, 9 millimeters, the bigger size. Next patient, 41 years old, 0 0.5, BMI 21, and we trigger with 14, 12, 12, 9 millimeters, 4 eggs, 4 mature. Early trigger, individualize the, time, the size of the follicle when I want to trigger these extremely poor responders, mainly if they have advanced age, is very important. The eggs are mature because they have, they have a rapid maturation of the follicle and the egg. I will reduce the chances of having a premature ovulation and the egg has high chances to be mature. Okay, now we are in the theater. We are going to do the egg collection. She has one or two follicles and we cannot miss this egg. We have to do our best for the egg collection. Should I flush? There is a little bit of controversy in the literature, but this paper from the group of Von Wolf, uh, it's very difficult to pronounce for me, sorry, Von Wolf, they publish a very nice study of patients that they have only one follicle. So monofollicular growth, they go for the egg collection. With the aspiration, they get the egg in 21% of the cases. But if they flush one time, 23% extra of recovery. One egg, only one follicle. Second flush, another 9% of the patients that I didn't get the egg. Third flush, another 10%, and so on. So I have only one follicle. There's no chance that I can miss that egg. I have to do my best. And that is another thing very important is the way that I aspirate this fluid. We have automated pumps for aspiration. Sometimes as physicians, I don't pay attention to what is the technicalities of the pump, what is the pressure in milligrams mg that I'm using. But the pressure of the pump is very important because this is speed up booster pumps the way that they aspirate generate a very, very strong pressure. And we can have these issues on the eggs. We can have breaks that the cytoplasm is leaking and very regular shapes of the eggs. Another egg here that is leaking. And this is very important. Now we got the egg. We, we broke it. And as doctor uh, previously mentioned, it's very important to have a good quality egg. Okay, now we have the egg, we fertilize, we have the embryo, but the embryo goes very slowly, very slowly, extremely slowly, and I don't have a blastocyst on day six. Should we cancel or we wait for day seven? The thing is that better late than never. We have to inform our patients. Here, local patients, they have a very important um, information. Uh, they are very lucky that the treatments are covered, but when they have to pay for a treatment, when they have to pay for the genetic analysis, it's difficult, and we have to counsel them very well. If we have a blastocyst on day seven, the chances to be euploid is less. The quality, the possibilities for implantation is less. And in our group, the possibilities to have a live birth is significantly reduced than when we transfer a day five or a day six euploid embryo, single embryo transfer. But it's worth it. Because these patients, they don't have any other chance. And at least we give them some chances. In these booklets that you have with, at the end with some patients that are giving uh, their opinion uh, from our center after a treatment, one of those babies is a day seven embryo, euploid embryo that we transfer and is there in the pictures. So what else can we do for the eggs? Sometimes we collect the egg and it's not mature. We have done the, we have treated the patient, we have done double trigger, we collect the egg, but it's not mature. It's a GB or M1. We can do the ICSI the next day. We keep the egg in culture and we can do the ICSI the next day. This day next ICSI is going to be published by um, Dr. Ibrahim El-Khatib and 
is our results. It's true that they fertilize not that well, that they go to blastocyst not as well as the mature eggs, but if I get a blastocyst and I do the biopsy, there's no significant difference on the euploid rate. So I have nothing to lose. I can try because if I get a blastocyst, the patient will have the chances to have an euploid embryo. And when we stimulate the patients, we do, do a stimulation or we accumulate, we want to accumulate eggs or embryos, we need to be careful because if the AMH, if the ovarian reserve is very low, sometimes the egg freezing is not the, good, the best option. We have seen that the chances to have worse um, survival for those eggs, for patients that have poor response, is lower than expected. This is our ROC curve that shows that the chances that I have, less than 70% of survival is higher for patients with AMH below 1.1. And 70% is a lot. If I freeze three eggs and two of them only survive, we have a very worse scenario. The last thing I'm going to talk about, what will be the future, what we can do for these patients in the future. All these small things that we are trying to do for them is now, we can do it now, but in the future, most probably, there are new techniques that we can improve trying to increase the recruitment of these dormant follicles. We don't need to inject or we don't need to do anything in the ovary that can increase the risk, the surgical risk or the risk of infection. We can give some medication that we have available, which is LH or AMH, synthetic AMH that we can use to create an environment in the ovary like a pseudo-like condition. So that synchronizes the eggs and that makes that the chances that I have a higher antral follicle count for the month that I can, I, I'm going to stimulate is higher. We have seen there is a, the AMH has receptors in the uh, neuros, neurons of the hypothalamus and that increases the duration of the LH. Of course, we can give LH as well. Antonio Lamarca has presented a publication of patients that he has given a long course of LH injections and he has increased the chances of having more functional antral follicles to recruit with the stimulation. So that will be maybe an option that we can use in a short period of time. Analog of anti mullerian hormone, that can be another option in a short, uh, in a short term. So as conclusion, there is plenty of things that nowadays we can do for our patients. We don't need to try to get medication from far away or new things. We have to put them on stimulation and do our best to collect the eggs that they have because each egg matters. Small things in life matter. And this is an example. If I do the same during every day of the year, I get the same. Doing nothing at all. But if I do a small, very small effort every day consistently, can you guess what is this number? It's a huge difference. So small things in life matter. Consistent changes every day in our uh, daily clinical practice can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laura Melado, for a wonderful presentation. I think it was a very detailed uh, way to, to show all the update on the strategies that we have in poor responders. And for the sake of time, we're going to leave all the questions at the end of the session after all the presenters. So for now, it is my great pleasure to present Dr. Barbara Lawrence, our esteemed colleague. She's the scientific director of ART Fertility Clinics Group and she obtained her medical and OBGYN degrees in Germany, also her training in reproductive medicine occurred in Germany. She is an expert in fertility preservation in oncologic patients, and actually her PhD thesis focused on this topic. She has published more than 80 articles in, in international and peer-reviewed journals. She's very active scientifically. 
She was also the head of the IVF department at Women's University Hospital in Hübingen, Germany. She's an esteemed member of the Ezra Society, the European Society of Human Reproduction. And she recently graduated as well from the GCSRT program 2021 from Harvard Medical School in Boston, USA. So please welcome Dr. Barbara Lawrence. Dear Frank, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And maybe before I start with my topic, I, as in the position of a scientific director of this wonderful clinic, I want to give a big thank you and a big compliment to the whole team. Because honestly, I mean, no one can do research by themselves. We are very active. We spend a lot of our time looking into those things. And I think it's something what triggers us and what really, I mean, brighten up our days. Because it's like Dr. Fatimi mentioned in the morning, put a question mark behind everything. And this is for me, it's like the salt in the soup because it makes things a lot more interesting. Okay. So I want to pick up at the place where Dr. Laura left a bit. So every oocyte matters. So I do not have anything to disclose. And I want to talk to you about the ovarian stimulation and the role of FSH in ovarian stimulation. So what do we want? We want to have a multifolicular growth because we want to have as many oocytes as possible. Because we are all aware that numbers matters. Now as an IVF specialist, we are using FSH like our daily teeth brush, our daily shower. Often we use it and we do not think about it anymore. And that's why also I think it's very important to go back to the basics, to revisit, to re-evaluate what we are doing. So what is the ideal scenario? The ideal scenario would be, of course, the so-called very nicely expressed, the one-and-done approach. What does it mean? I mean, in the end, it would mean we have a couple who cannot conceive spontaneously. They have like a dream of having two kids. And they do one treatment, and with the freezing of embryos, in the end, they will achieve two live births. However, this, of course, depends on a lot of factors. I mean, in Europe, in Western countries, usually the admired or the, 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 the family size is like two kids, approximately. That's a completely different story when we are looking into the area where we are, we are working now. I mean, we see many, many couples, they have already three kids, they have maybe four kids, and they still want to more, because here the family size is desired to be big, to have many families, to have many kids, to have a big family. So, but even when we are looking into this more Western approach, and those are data from the IVF Boston Group, so they defined patients who had more than 15 oocytes, which for us, as Dr. Laura mentioned already, because 40% of our patients are like low responders, often is not achievable at all. But even in this scenario, only 20% of the couples really had been able to fulfill the dream of their family of having at least two kids. And as mentioned, of course, it depends a lot what is the cultural background, how many kids does a family want. So, now going back a little bit again into basics, we had this already in the morning, what happens in a natural cycle and what needs to be done for multifollicular growth. And here we see it nicely, just the difference when we are looking into the ultrasound, we have the monofollicular development and the multifollicular, what we want to achieve. As mentioned, I'm going back a little bit to the textbooks. So what happens with the follicle development? We know when a baby girl is born, she brings all her oocytes with her, and the follicle recruitment, the follicle growth, starts and is ongoing during fetal life, during infancy and childhood, but the follicles do not grow a lot. Usually they uh, just go up to two millimeters and then they regress. Only during the process of puberty, when there is a maturation of the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis, only then follicle starts to become bigger in size. They start on ovulation starts coming along with the menstrual cyclicity. Looking into the different stages, so we know we have very small follicles which are not, uh, which are growing gonadotropin independent. We have the sizes when they start to respond to gonadotropins, and only the last stages are then really in the end 
depending on gonadotropins. Looking at the timeline, we are usually just seeing the tip of the iceberg the last like two weeks when we can see a follicle growing with our ultrasound. There are different theories regarding antral follicle recruitment, and I don't think one of it is really proven, but the, basically we have three theories, so that there might be a continuous follicle recruitment, but others are formulating it's coming in cycles, maybe just only a single recruitment episode, or even in waves. It's not completely clarified, however, what we are knowing out of our experience in fertility preservation, so we know that meanwhile we can start stimulation at any time of the cycle. It's called like a random start of stimulation. We know that often in these cases we might need a little bit longer, we might need some more gonadotropins, but in the end we can start whenever we see a patient, which is a kind of a relief, especially when we are under a certain time pressure to start ovarian stimulation because the patient has to undergo uh, chemo, um, cytotoxic treatment. So when we are looking now what is going on in a natural cycle, we know that the rise of the FSH is in the last part of the preceding cycle. So this is the time when FSH is going up, when it's recruiting the uh, follicles, and then slowly over the follicular phase, we have a slow but steady decline of FSH, and then it rises again to support together with LH the ovulation. Looking at the follicle se selection, so we have in the first part, we have a common growth of a cohort of, of follicles, but then usually starting from a size of 10 millimeters of the dominant follicle, this growth will diverge. So only the dominant follicle will continue to grow. The smaller one in a natural cycle will undergo atresia. Why is this the case? What happens? We are all aware that when FSH is high and the follicle grows, it's producing more and more estrogens. Because of the negative feedback, the FSH will decline. This is one thing. Then on the other hand, of course, what we are knowing and seeing, the dominant follicle has an increased sensitivity towards FSH. And we see a shift in the follicle from small follicles where we have mainly FSH receptors to LH receptors. I will show you in a minute like a very nice uh, graphical depiction of this. But in the end, what does it mean? The dominant follicle does not need that much FSH anymore for further growth, and it is much more responsive to LH. So this is the graph that I was talking here nicely depicted. We have the small follicles with mainly with a, a prevalence of FSH receptors shifting to a prevalence of LH receptors at bigger sizes. So, how is the follicle section, uh, selection in nature and what we, can we learn for our stimulation? As mentioned, the recruitment of the initial cohort happens through the increase of the FSH levels. However, what is critical not to have only a single one, but to have a multifollicular growth, is that we are keeping the FSH level above a certain threshold for a longer time. And this was formulated by Fauser and colleagues in 1997 as a so-called FSH threshold, window, or gate concept, however you want to call it. So when we have a short time that the FSH is above the critical threshold, this will result in a single dominant follicle. Do we have it a longer time? This will result in multifollicular growth. Also, what we should consider is that we are having different types of FSH. So this is just a short overview over the types of gonadotropins at all, FSH, LH, and also ACG. They are glycoproteins. They are composed of two different subunits, and the alpha subunit is the same for all of it. The beta subunit is different, and this is the one which is important for the specific biological activity. Looking into FSH isoforms, they are produced by nature, also with a common amino acid structure. However, they have a different electric charging. So this difference results finally in a different half-life time, shorter or longer, it results in a different receptor affinity and then translates into different biological activity. 
more acidic forms have a longer half-life time, and more basic isoforms, they have a shorter half-life time. However, they have greater biological activity. And what is really interesting and important is that this changes throughout the menstrual cycle. But not only throughout the menstrual cycle, but also when we look over the lifetime of a woman. So it's different from puberty and postmenopause. But how do they change over the cycle? And for this, I would like to refer to this extremely nice graph from a publication from 2015 from the Brussels Group. And let's start at the right side of this graph. So this is the late luteal phase, and this is the time when the follicles are recruited for the next months. As you can see here, here we have like more acidic forms prevalent. This is the acidic forms are having the longer half-life time. So this is a time and area when the follicles are recruited. Now coming towards ovulation, and remember the graph that I've shown you previously. So we have an FSH rise to support LH, but here we are having the more basic isoforms, which have a shorter half-life time, but have a higher biological activity. But also what we have to keep in mind, the medications that we are using have also different isoforms. So recombinant FSH forms have relatively basic isoforms. And then we are having this long-acting recombinant FSH, which has the highest acidity among all those available FSH products. Of course, this is a medication what we give one time at the beginning of the cycle, and we expect it to be there and effective for seven to eight days. Then, of course, we need something which has a longer half-life time. Looking at urinary products, so they are more acidic compared to the recombinant ones. Just a short summary, what are our aims when we do ovarian stimulation? Of course, we want to have as many eggs as possible, which means we need to keep the FSH level above the required threshold. But we are also having some challenges. So as Dr. Laura was mentioning previously, I mean, we need to choose the right stimulation dosage according to the ovarian reserve parameters. We have seen the low responders, but also we are having the group of high responders, which are maybe more dangerous when we stimulate them and we, when we drive them into an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Then also we want to avoid progesterone elevation, because especially in the case when we want to do a fresh embryo transfer, but also some data are pointing to the fact that maybe elevated progesterone will have an impact on the embryo quality. Also, in this sense, we would try to keep the progesterone low. And if a patient has to pay for the treatment by himself, herself, themselves, of course it's nice when it's not that expensive, and we know that the medication is quite expensive. So now, just how are things going when we stimulate? So this is the trajectory of FSH when we give daily injections. So we need a few days, two, three days, to keep the FSH level above the critical threshold. When we give the long-acting form, so if we start with the depot, and then it's slowly, slowly declining. So now when we compare this to the natural cycle, of course this trajectory looks more natural compared to the other one. So let's think about it. How much FSH do we need towards the end of the ovarian stimulation? Also remembering or recalling this picture for you, in the beginning we need a lot of FSH, but then later on we have this shift, we have a lower number of FSH receptors, we have a higher number of LH receptors, so really do we need as much FSH what we are giving? So this is something which I think is important to think about it. So I wanted to summarize it, so I just put as a hypothesis Maybe a lower amount of FSH is just needed during the end of the ovarian stimulation. On the other hand, we are having questions to this. So how is it when we have patients, I mean, might this differ from patient to patient because we know that not all our patients are the same. Of course, the question is how much FSH do we need towards the end of the ovarian stimulation? Because we are afraid that maybe at one point the follicles will undergo regression, they stop growing. 
and then all of us are very disappointed that we will not be able to retrieve oocytes. Also, does it have any impact when we give too much FSH besides the costs? And how can we individualize treatment in this sense? To answer this question, I would like to point to two publications coming out of our group. So this was a study which was done intended to reduce the incidence of progesterone elevation towards the end of the stimulation. So we had a control group. The control group were the patients who continued the same stimulation doses throughout the whole treatment, which is a kind of a commonly used approach. And we had a study group. The study group started to reduce the FSH dosage from a follicle size of 14 millimeters onwards in small steps. I want to point to, when you are looking at the FSH levels on the trigger day, you see in both groups, we have a wide range of FSH levels, reaching from seven to 27. This is a huge difference, 20 units different. I mean, here it's a little bit smaller because this group slowly started to reduce the gonadotropin dosage, but still we have a difference of approximately 16 units, which is a lot, I think you agree. So, we took it a step further, so what we did, we took the group, we split this group according to the median of the FSH level, we used the median to reach same size groups, and when you are looking into the uh, characteristics, patients' characteristics, they were comparable. The only difference what we have seen is in the BMI, but when you look at the sheer numbers, it's not that much. Looking at the outcome, and in the end, this is what we are interested in, because we want to make sure that going down with the dosage, we are not uh, doing any detrimental effects to our the treatment at all. Looking at the outcome, of course, when we are stratifying and comparing FSH level on the day of trigger, we see a significant difference. But this was, of course, how we split the patients. So forget about this one. But what is important for us is the number of retrieved oocytes. And here we can see that there's no significant difference between the group. I mean, I don't want to say they get even more having a lower FSH level on the day of trigger. However, I think what we can take out as a message of this is that when we slightly reduce, we will not have a negative impact on our outcome in the sense of that we are having a lower number of oocytes. Another publication, it's a bit ago, but this was looking into the incidence of progesterone elevation, and we compared a relatively short um, time of stimulation. So this was a daily FSH for eight days until trigger compared to the long-acting um, FSH stimulation, where we are seeing that the FSH levels are going down. And we have seen here a lower incidence of progesterone elevation in the group who had a lower number or a lower amount of gonadotropins towards the end of ovarian stimulation. So, putting this into a kind of practical context, how are we individualizing our treatment for our patients in our clinic? Of course, we choose the stimulation starting dosage according to the ovarian reserve parameters, AMH and AFC. We are monitoring our patients not only by ultrasound, counting the follicles, measuring the follicles, but also we monitor FSH, estradiol, and progesterone. And when we see that the patient responds nicely, follicles are growing nicely, and that the, we have good estradiol levels, but we see that the progesterone levels are going up, that we have high FSH levels, then we are starting to reduce our daily gonadotropin dosage. The aim is to keep the full FSH levels around a range of 20 units. Until now, we cannot really give you a scientific evidence for this number. I think we have to work on this. We will find a work to, uh, to, to prove this, but this is our experience, which translates nicely into a good outcome. So what are my take-home messages for you? I think it's very important to individualize treatment because one size fits all does not exist in IVF. So we'll have to individualize according to patient's characteristics. We'll have to individualize according to the response during treatment. And we can look easily into it when we are taking care of the hormonal parameters. And you'll just have to get used to it. It's a kind of a learning process, 
but it's also nice because you will learn a lot of physiology. And I want to summarize it as a sentence, less might be more, so which means we can consider to reduce gonadotropins towards the end of the ovarian stimulation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Barbara, for your interesting and nice presentation. Uh, now I want to introduce uh, Professor Luca, Luca Giarnoli. Everybody, I think, knows Luca from many, many years, published many papers in assisted reproduction. Uh, nowadays, uh, Professor Luca Giarnoli is the scientific director of Italian Society of Study of Reproductive Medicine. He's also an honorary professor of School of Biosciences of the University of Kent. And he was ser served as a chairman in Italian Society of Assisted Reproduction and in the European Society of, of Human Reproduction and Embryology. Good morning. So the title of, of the presentation is uh, Personalizing of Treatments. Well, I'm trying to personalize the system here. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the most difficult thing here is uh, to decide together um, why personalization is important. I'd just like to draw your attention to this uh, very simple set of data. They are completely different authors, and as you can see, the data are from 10 years. And if we expose the patients to six cycles, 80% of them deliver. So the major problem for which today we should uh, share some ideas is how to reduce the dropout of the patients. Because if the patient disappear after one or two treatments, their chance to have a baby is very limited. It doesn't matter if your group is very good, if you have 40, 50, 30% of pregnancy after any embryo transfer, the problem is here. We need to keep the patients in the system. Well, which are the causes of the dropout? There are financial reasons, mainly for those patients that have uh, to uh, approach private clinics. There are psychological factors, uh, and I think that all of us know the couple of the stress, the depression, the anxiety, and the loss of trust in what we are doing. But then we have also unrealistic expectations, and I will go back to this later on, and then RIF, so the repeated IVF failure. So forget for one moment financial reasons and psychological factors, and just concentrate on uh, unrealistic expectations. The unrealistic expectation is go back to the fact that we are always talking to our patients, producing a chance of pregnancy per transfer, per chance. And this is completely wrong. Because if you take example from oncologists, where they build up their life tables and they say, well, you need six months of chemotherapy, none of these patients with some oncological problem drop down after one or two cycles because they have side effects, they are vomiting or they are losing their hair. They keep going for six months. So the problem is that we should, in one way or another, engage our patients in having not one cycle after another, but to have a sort of agreement on having a certain number of cycles, and a certain number of cycles means a certain number of embryo transfer, because that's the only way in which a patient is exposed to a potential pregnancy. Cycles means chance every time to have an embryo, a blastocyst, whatever you want to, to have inside the, the uterus. When we talk about the repeated IVF failures, and there will be a lecture later on, so I'm not going to spend time on uh, repeated IVF failure. I only want to say that this is due to the fact that most of the time we haven't done a, an accurate diagnosis on patients, but also on our gametes and on our embryos. So that's the point for which we should go back to the concept of, to personalize medicine or precision medicine. There is a difference between these two, and I, I, I would like to share the things. Here you see a monk transfer with 10 microliters of methylene blue, uh, easy transfer, and then immediately after you do hysteroscopy. No methylene blue inside the cavity, despite the transfer was done very nicely. 
Then you go back with your hysteroscope, and what you see is a two millimeter polyps in which you have discharged your potential embryo. What does it mean? It means, of course, that none of us would do an hysteroscopy if a fertile patient has two millimeter polyps. But don't forget that in a virtual cavity, these two millimeter polyps means to obstruct completely the internal uterine host. That means that the embryo is discharged in a mucosa that is not really the endometrium that uh, um, human and other are looking for. So when I mean personalized medicine, I also mean be careful to the concept of the personalized medicine. It is a sort of tailoring investigation and therapies for each patient, and it should be based on evidence, consideration of circumstances, and clinical skills. Precision medicine is something slightly different, so you tailor the diagnostic of therapy to individual patient, based it on unique genetics and physiological characteristics. And of course, at the moment, we put a lot of emphasis on genomics, proteomics, and that's the biological omics. So if you look at the current evidence-based medicine, even the most efficient therapies, and reproductive medicine, ART, is an example, actually benefit only a minority of our patients. So for this reason, even, even if we have advanced a lot, because every time that we go to a meeting, to a congress, we always heard about novelties, about new chance to improve pregnancy rate, despite of this, it's crucial to have for each group of patients personalized approach and possibly a precision medicine. So let's talk for a few minutes about personalized medicine and precision medicine, taking into consideration that we also have to deal a lot with biological and embryological activities. So term precision medicine or individualized medicine it also means to choose, as we have been told, the correct protocol. That doesn't mean the most complex. For instance, if you have a protocol like this with a maximum of three embryo transfer, it doesn't matter if they are fresh or frozen, and you do a very simple protocol, some clomiphene citrate for five days, and only 450, maximum 600 units of uh, international of AFSH. Only one monitoring, so nothing tailored, but what you tailor actually is the group of patients to which you are proposing this stuff, and uh, you involve them in having three embryo transfer as a maximum. Doesn't matter if fresh or frozen, and uh, they close the agreement if there is a pregnancy to term or if the three embryo transfer have been done, whatever it comes first. Of course, you have to select these patients. So they are selected according to, uh, for instance, in this case, the aged female partner, no previous IVF ICSIS or naive patients, no severe malfactor, no endometriosis, no malvarian response. So you are selecting the best patient with the highest chance of getting pregnancy. You think that they all belong to the same group. But when you look at the data, among these 511 patients that have been considered eligible for this program, you see that there is uh, a certain number, 21%, that were excluded because they had an inadequate response to chrome fancy trade. What does it mean? That apparently they look all the same, but in fact they are different. So these patients, again, you think that you are personalizing a protocol based on your clinical experience, based on your clinical requirement, but in fact, inside that protocol, you are recruiting patients that are not eligible for this treatment. Once that uh, you can do the treatment because you have discharged those patients that are not the right one for the protocol, and you look, of course, young age, but it doesn't work, this one, uh, anyway, uh, young age, and you look at the cumulative live birth rate, you see that uh, almost three quarters of them deliver after in a simple protocol inside three embryo transfer. But what is more interesting is that if you look, these are the patients that uh, delivered only after one transfer, the pink one, and after two transfers, the blue one, and uh, they needed three transfer, and not all of them, of course, become pregnant. And you look at the data, you see that if you look at the heartbeat for embryo implanted, and you go from the first embryo transfer to the second to the third embryo transfer, what you have all in all 
is that the implantation rate decreased dramatically. Not only the implantation rate, but also the miscarriage rate increased on the other hand. So again, this group of patients behave differently in, despite the fact that they look uh, to be the same. And when you look at the results in terms of clinical pregnancy rate, again, those that delivered after the first embryo transfer, you see they perform completely different from those that delivered after the third embryo transfer, both in terms not only of live birth rate, but also of clinical pregnancy. But if you engage the patients in a protocol for which they have to do three embryo transfer, what is interesting is that if you look at the cumulative live birth rate divided by age, in fact, there is no difference. Of course, the older patients that will require more times to have two or three embryo transfer. But if you are able to make the agreement at the beginning of the, of the program with this patient, and you, in one way or another, um, allow them to have three embryo transfer, as you can see, the cumulative live birth rate, it doesn't really change. Again, they need more embryo transfer, of course, but at the end of the day, they get what they want, exactly like the young patients. So, this is just an example to say that once that you decide to have a personalized approach, it also means to choose any sort of protocol, even the simplest one, as far as you choose the right group of patients to allow them to do. Those that don't get pregnant, and if you look at them in terms of uh, spare embryos that have been left after they come out from, from, from the program, you see uh, this 92 blastocyst, the majority of them had abnormal chromosome complement. Not only abnormal chromosome complement, but if you look at them as these abnormalities, a huge percentage of them, 55% of them, actually they have multiple aneuploidies, so complex aneuploidies, showing that in fact those patients are not simple patients, are not the easy patients that you are thinking about. And of course, if you remove these aneuploid embryos and you transfer the remaining embryos, you still get pregnancies. So, personalized medicine has really to do also with precision, but we have to take into consideration that personalized medicine is probably the most appropriate term. Why for precision in reproductive medicine we should include embryology and biology? I'm saying this because, again, when we want to involve patients and avoiding them to drop out from our program, we should be clear with them and show to them, each laboratory has its own data, of course, that, for instance, if you have, it's possible to have another things. Anyway, if you divide by, pay, by age of the patients and you look at the number of oversights uh, that you need for a euploid embryo, you see that when you go over 40, thank you, over 40, 41, the number of uh, uh, oversight that you need is extremely high. So how many patients at this age are able to give to us this number of eggs? And when you look at the number of oversights for baby born, this is what actually you should have. And again, each lab has its own data. So the point is, these things should be set in advance to the patient before you make the agreement for, for, for the treatment. And when you look at the number of two pronuclei that are needed to have a baby born, again, you look at the data compared to the age. And in doing so, according to the stimulation protocol, according to MH, according to what we have heard be, be, before, you can say, uh, Madam, if you, have, uh, one, if you give to us one to five 2PN, your chance to have euploid blastocyst at this age is this one. If you give us six to 10 is this one, and so on. And you construct your own table. What does this mean? This means that in doing so, you can already program with the patient how many oversight recovery she needs to have a chance to have a certain number of euploid blastocysts and then to have a, a chance to deliver a baby. I'd like to draw your attention on the fact that when you have young patients, in fact, the chance to have euploid blastocysts, it does increase so much with the number of 2PN, I'm talking about eggs, I'm talking 2PN, for a very simple reason, because here you have many times 
polycystic ovarian mm, syndrome patients, so they produce more eggs with lower quality. And this probably is quite relevant also in countries like this one. On the other hand, this is the reality here. You see that with the increased number of uh, 2PN, of course, you increase the chance to have euploid blastocyst when the patient is, over, uh, is between 38 and over 41, as you can see for here. Okay, having said that, um, tailoring um, uh, the treatment is also include to change uh, completely the view uh, that you have in the lab. For instance, not all the embryos require the same environment. Uh, there will be in the future here, most probably, a huge change in our laboratories. It will be much more um, sophisticated system. It will be almost all the procedures will be uh, robotized before uh, the end of these decades. You see uh, just a uh, an example, a naive example, this is a, an incubator that is called Altel because it's never opened the door. The dishes are via a robotic arm are um, allocated to what we call a room and uh, each room has a patient. Each room can be booked for three days, five days or whatever. And furthermore, um, these rooms can also move so they can tilt according to the need that each, uh, uh, each uh, um, patient would need. Tilt means changing the culture system automatically or moving the embryo from one part of the drop to another. Of course, um, yeah, you see here an example. So this is just a very naive concept of what we are going to see in the next few years. So if you look at the personalization treatment, first of all, diagnosis. Let's just give you an example. For instance, do we include in the diagnosis a simple, very simple genetic test like karyotype? I'd like to remind you that 2-3% of our patients, uh, of our couples, and 4-5% of uh, severe male factors they have abnormal karyotype, for which our treatment is almost useless. Once that we have these categories of patients, including what we call new generation patients, so the young patients that have very little time to spend and not a large amount of money to be treated, and they want easy treatment. So then we need to create different programs and different number of treatments. Some of these categories probably need only few embryo transfer to reach 70, 80, 90% of delivery. Some others need many more uh, transfer to be done. A program would be effective if the delivery rate is over 60%. And otherwise, the remaining less than 40% of patients who failed after the first set of program, we need to go further and again personalize the, the treatment in a different way. So we need to look at the gametes, at the embryos, and we need to look at the uterus. One of the two, or both of them, are generating the failure. What does it mean to look at the gamut and the, and the embryos? It means, of course, some tricks that we already know, culture to blastocyst, PGTA, or if it's possible, according to the local law, gamut donation. Is this a problem in uterus? Again, freeze all as a possibility, or endometrial receptivity if we want to check about the uterine viability. So, then we should have, again, from the, this second set, a delivery rate that should be over 60% with a very limited amount of failures in terms of number of patients. So if we start with 100 patients, 40 don't get pregnant after the first agreement with the patient of the first program, then the 40 non-pregnant enter in this, this second personalized approach, and we should end up only with 14 patients that didn't get pregnant. So what you do next for this uh, is extremely difficult to say. I just want to show you uh, one of the usual mistakes that can be done. This has been done in our clinic. 37-year-old patient, normal zoospermia, normal hysteroscopy, never had a positive beta ACG. Um, the diagnosis of infertility was tuber factor. So what you could say, easy patients, okay? So these are the number, uh, it's quite an old case because it lasted almost 10 years. So you see, starting here, 
number of retrieved oocytes, so not very high number of oocytes. At that time, biochemical, negative, ectopic with subinjectomy, negative, negative, negative. At that time, we started to grow embryos to blastocyst. At that time, we also looked at uh, PGD. We wanted to check if the oocytes, not the blastocyst, had chromosomal abnormalities. And she was apparently in the average, so four out of seven were euploid, uh, polar body one and two. So the patient had, after all this attempt, a nervous breakdown, and she needed psychological support. Then we look at, the, just in case, the sperm had some chromosomal abnormalities the, despite of normal parameters, but it was normal. So the patient went back again as a treatment of an oversight re-retrieved re with blastocysts, with uh, analysis in terms of aneuploidy, both of polar bodies and day three. And then transferring blastocyst, blastocyst, negative, negative, negative. So the patient decided to take a break for a while. And then a uh, few months uh, later, she came back and asked for oversight donation. Uh, we suggested to go to Crete because she had some relatives there, so in Greece. And here is, in Greece, they were doing at that time, a few years ago, transfer of two blastocysts. Negative, negative, negative. Again, another nervous breakdown and psychological support. And then the patient recovered. Uh, we did also test for endometrial receptivity at that time. And she went out for other cycles. Two blastocysts negative, two blastocysts negative, two blastocysts negative. So the patient um, wrote to us, say that uh, she was going for a program that, was, that is not legal in our country. So we, she was remaining in Greece, and she had one shot, and uh, both uh, babies bore twins normal. So this is one of the mistakes that uh, I hope uh, we don't do very frequently. But if you analyze that data, you clearly understand that something went wrong in the system. So diagnosis, to conclude. For instance, tubal factor, multifollicular ovarian pattern, PCO, non-malignant ovarian diagnosis, and endometriosis. We have some instruments. It depends, of course, on the local law. Conventional IVF, IVF light, freeze all, PGTA, and as I was mentioning, in, uh, in some countries, oversight donation. How do you use these tools for this separate uh, set of patients? Well, first of all, for instance, for tubal factor, for either salpings, think if removal or not the tube, literature is telling us a few things. When you have ages below 37, they can go to the so-called IVF light program, as I mentioned to you before. Otherwise, they go for conventional. After three cycles, either we had the pregnancy or delivery, either we had miscarriage. In this case, we should go. We should suggest PGTA. If pregnancy does not occur, again, probably a test for an should, uh, should be done. If you have this set of patients, most probably the freeze all is the safest thing and also the most productive as far as we go to the culture to blastocyst. And again, here, we could have pregnancy and delivery, and if this does not occur but only a miscarriage happens or no pregnancy, then we should think about, again, the PGTA program. If no pregnancy has occurred but embryo transfer is done, of course, if you have still frozen blastocysts, uh, we should go for that. But then you all the way take the risk that if no embryo transfer is done, so blastocysts do not survive, then a problem on the oversight should be considered, and then you should maybe use, if it's possible, the program of donation. PGTA pregnancy, delivery, fine, miscarriage. Well, if you miscarry after the analysis is properly done, again, there is something that we are missing with the euploid test, so we should consider other program. If no pregnancy occur but temporary transfer is done, it can be do another attempt of PGTA. We will see the results later on, I think, by Baris. If no transfer is done, again, PGTA could be once again recommended. Um, when we look <clears throat> at this special program, 
again, is not easy, despite uh, especially our American colleagues claim that the results are extremely high, is not always the, the true. If delivery does not occur, you can also have miscarriage. And in this case, again, we have to check on the gametes, toral gametes, but also the male gametes via fish test. If we look at, at cases as this happened in which it doesn't work, so there is no pregnancy, embryo transfer is done, you can repeat the treatment, but most of the time, if no embryo transfer is done, again, you should consider that there is a male gamete problem. When you have uh, non-malignant uh, ovarian disease, again, we should think about surgery before, so take this into consideration, considering the ovarian reserve. And that is the same story when we are talking about endometriosis. We should split our patients according to their ovarian reserve in terms of uh, normal ORT or reduced ORT. So, in conclusion, what I want to say is that uh, it's time after 40 years of IVF and related techniques to monitor and to allocate our patients to different uh, um, programs, not only protocol, I'm talking about programs, uh, allowing them to avoid them to drop out. Because the dropout is, after 40 years of IVF, the only real enemy that we have in our clinics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gianaroli, for the very informative and nice lecture. And we will proceed now uh, with uh, the last uh, lecture from this session. And it is also my great pleasure to introduce you to Ibrahim El Hatib, our esteemed colleague. He is the IVF lab director of ART Fertility Clinics Group. He's a senior embryologist with more than 10 years experience in the field of embryology and infertility. He obtained his bachelor's of science in genetic engineering and biotechnology in 2008 in Jordan. He obtained a degree in uh, as a Master of Science in Healthcare Management in Switzerland in 2016, a Master of Science in Biotechnologies and Bioengineering in IVF and Human-Based Research in 2019 in Italy. And his thesis is based on time-lapse monitoring system and pre-implantation embryo development kinetics. And also he obtained an MBA in Data Science and AI at Ascensia Business School in 2019. And he has also contributed to several scientific publications in reproductive medicine related to time-lapse monitoring, mosaicism, and embryo morphokinetics. So without further ado, please welcome Ibrahim El Hatib. Can you hear me? So my topic is about the physiology of oogenesis. And honestly, yesterday I was telling my colleague Ashna that we have a conference of 15 presentations, and my topic is the only boring topic. It's a very dry topic. I mean, we want innovation, we want new ideas, and I'm talking about oogenesis. But also honestly, after the presentation of Professor Loy today, I realized that all what we need is, a, is to go back to basics. Going back to basics, asking the same questions, trying to find different answers is the way we innovate. So the slides didn't change, but a little, at least I'm a little bit more excited starting this presentation. So let's just start with what presents our ultimate goal, a successful implantation. So we transfer an embryo, we have a successful implantation that hopefully will result in a healthy life birth. Now, in order to do that, we need to have, uh, I mean, a synchrony between physicians and embryologists in all aspects of the cycle. This includes the ovarian stimulation, the embryo culture, selection for a transfer, endometrial preparation, and implantation. Now, we know all of that, and probably we assume that in the quest of achieving this goal, this is how we look like. And of course, the physicians are in front, embryologists are at the back. But, this is how we should look like. A 1,050 horsepower Formula One engine, made of hundreds of components, 
that they need to, to work in harmony in order to get the best achievement. If you have as, as a small as a loose screw, you lose the performance. And this is exactly what is an IVF cycle. So many variables, so many, and we are, we're all dependent on each other. So probably the best way to synchronize our effort is to um, understand as embryologists what the physician do, and hopefully physicians will understand the basic of what we do. And you know, I mean, we've seen also with all the innovations with Dr. Roy, I mean, most of them were starting from the oocytes. And this is not a new information. 400 years ago, it was described. The Romans said that all life starts from an oocyte. So this graph represents all the factors that are involved in oogenesis. So imagine if before lunch, I need to go through all of these. I think everybody will leave. So what I decided to do is to break down this topic into three simple phases. We just go um, 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 around the important information, and hopefully at the last few slides, we will be able to see if we were able to successfully implement this in our current practice. So the first step is the multiplication step. Now, during multiplication, which starts maybe at three weeks of gestation, we have a specific population of cells called the primordial germ cells. They start to replicate by mitosis, and they migrate from the um, uh, primitive streak to the gonad ridge. Now, these same cells are the ones that either will produce oocytes or sperm. It's the same, the same cells. The only difference is, if you have an, ex an expression of the sex-determining region on the Y chromosome, these cells will produce sperm. If you don't have, so you have an XX embryo, then you get an oocyte. So assuming that this embryo is an XX, so these cells are destined to become the oocytes. So what happens is, after around 12 weeks of gestation, some of these cells start to go through meiosis. So each cell divides into mitosis, giving two cells. One of them will go to meiosis, the other one will go into mitosis, and so on. So and probably by the 20th week, you will have six or eight million of these cells. But the ones that are doing the mitosis will stop. So mitosis will stop at 20th week of gestation. And we will continue with the meiosis. By birth, all these cells that are not incorporated in a follicle will be regenerated. That's why at, at birth, we see that we have a reduction from eight million, a population of eight million to one or two million. Primordial follicles at birth are actually representing the ovarian reserve. So now we're done with the multiplication um, phase. We start with the um, um, uh, growth phase. Now, the growth phase is sensitive to gonadotropin somehow, but is not dependent on um, gonadotropin. That's why there must be other factors that are responsible for these cells to grow. We know they grow in size, you have different layer of cells, there are more in nutrients and more transcription factors during this phase, so it's a very important one. And the recruitment is also starts from here. So how do we get these um, recruitment initiated and how do we go to the growth phase? Several factors, of which we will talk about one that is um, stem cell factor. So simply, once the sket ligand binds to the receptors, it activates the um, phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase pathway. Now this will activate the AKT pathway, which will do phosphorylation for the FOXO3. Now FOXO3 is a transcription factor responsible for the expression of the gene that is responsible for the cell cycle arrest. So once this is phosphorylated, it is inactivated. So the, the gene that is responsible for um, arrest these cells is inactivated. So we start the recruitment for this follicle. Another very important factor is the anti-Mullerian hormone. Now, anti-Mullerian hormone is produced, let's say 60% of the anti-Mullerian hormones are actually produced by pre-antral and antral follicle, um, follicles of size 2 to 9, let's say and they have a responsibility towards the inhibition of recruitment. So actually, AMH, which is an indicator for the ovarian reserve, actually inhibits the recruitment of a follicle. 
Why is that? Because if we don't have any regulator for this recruitment, we will not be able to sustain um, ovulation for, for 30 or 40 years. You will see that after five years of puberty, we exhausted all our primordial follicle because there is nothing to stop these cells. So the AMH plays a very important role in the growth and the recruitment phase. So we started with the primordial germ cells. We finished the, um, the growth phase, and now we are in the phase that is FSH-dependent or LH-dependent or, in general, gonadotropin-dependent of which we know that ovulation happens at this stage, and then, only then, you start to resume the meiosis. So, from the moment they entered meiosis and they got arrested, until maybe 20 years later, they are still arrested in all these phases. So, what is that factor that will induce, after 20 years, the resumption of meiosis? So since it's correlated with the, with the um, ovulation, and we know ovulation is dependent on the LH surge, there must be a correlation between the LH and FSH when it comes to maturation. In fact, the um, FSH receptors are present on the granulosa cells, the LH on the thicker cells. We know FSH is responsible for the proliferation of the stem cells, responsible for creating the LH, and also, very important, is responsible for maintaining the cyclic AMP control inside the cell. On the other hand, the um, theca cells are responsible for producing the androgens that eventually will be converted to estradiol through the FSH. That is good. But still, we didn't talk about the maturation. So what happens actually is, once we have FSH binding to its receptors, it activates three things. One of them is the intracellular liver of calcium, the second thing is the inositol um, uh, triphosphate um, pathway and also the MAPK pathway. Now, the interesting information is that once these three pathways are activated, you have more than 100 genes expressed. This is the role of FSH, and these genes are important for chromatin remodeling, gene transcription, mRNA translation. So these are the most important factors that will control the maturation itself and also the further development of the embryo. In addition to that, once we have the LH surge and the LH binds to all its receptors, what happens is it increases significantly the cyclic AMP levels. And then after the ovulation, it drops down. This action of the change in cyclic AMP inside activates one very important factor. It's called the maturation promoting factor. So maturation promoting factor is activated. The first thing it will do, it will start or induce the germinal vesicle breakdown. Okay, maybe I missed sharing this information, but when we said in the gestational age, we started the meiosis, we didn't complete the meiosis. It was arrested at the prophase one of meiosis one. Until then, till the maturation, we kept them in the GV stage. Until LH induced the breakage of the germinal vesicle, which is the first step of oocyte maturation. Now, unfortunately, oocyte maturation is not simply having a metaphase two or the mature oocyte, what we always refer to. And we've seen in all the, these sessions, the previous Dr. Laura, Dr. Barbara, and Dr. Generoli, all of them, they were referring to the number of oocytes as a parameter. But we, what we want to see here is that oogenesis is not only nuclear maturation. It's also cytoplasmic maturation. So once LH induced the germinal vesicle breakdown, it gave the green light, we can continue meiosis. Once you continue the first um, um, round of meiosis, the oocyte enters another round of meiosis, but at this time it will be arrested at the metaphase two stage. Now, metaphase two stage, in our terms, it's called mature oocyte. We have a very clear physical indicator for this stage, which is the presence of the polar body. Now, the other type of maturation, which is important, that should happen parallel to the nuclear maturation, is the cytoplasmic maturation. Now, cytoplasmic maturation, during this stage, what happens is the organelles in the, in the cytoplasm rearrange themselves. We start to see, I mean, I mean the, these, uh, all the organelles responsible for the storage. You have more ions, you have more transcription. Why is that? Because we know that from fertilization until embryonic genome activation, 
the stored material of the oocyte is responsible for the development. So cytoplasmic maturation is not only important to inject the oocytes or for fertilization. This will decide what will happen to that embryo in the future, in the next few days. Um, Dr. Laura showed this paper. It's um, accepted. What we did here, we compared a normally mature oocyte to one that is delayed. And we checked, we found that euploid is the same. So we assume that most likely the reason of um, lower fertilization and blastulation is not the nuclear maturity, right? Because otherwise we would have seen, I mean, a decrease or a change in the euploidy rate. But we've seen the effect only on the fertilization and the blastocyst biopsy rate, which means that embryo development, we had much less embryos reached the blastocyst stage. It means that the cytoplasmic maturation is directly correlated with our outcomes. And normally the outcomes are blamed to the lab or asked to the lab. If you have a low blastulation in the, in the, for any cycle, the first question you ask is what? Do you have a problem in the lab, right? Did you change your culture media? Why, it could be something that happened much, much before. So this is um, the, the, the uh, we showed, I mean, uh, how the meiosis happens, and we know meiosis is dependent on chromosomal segregation and duplication. So of course, in error during this, will result in an aneuploid oocyte. Aneuploid oocyte means aneuploid embryo. And uh, unemployed embryos not only affects the clinical outcome, but also it affects our KPIs in the lab because we will have less blastulation, we will have more arrested embryo, and we have published this data last year showing that most, the most common reason for embryo arrest is aneuploidy. And to be more specific, segmental duplications and monosomies. We saw in Dr. Barbara's presentation this figure representing the um, percentage of um, receptors of the FSH at the beginning. So 80 to 90 percent are FSH receptors. At the end, we have 80 or 90 percent LH receptors. We've seen also this figure, which is the stimulation that we do. So FSH, we start with the dose, and FSH keeps accumulating. But this is contradictory to what we see in nature, because by the end of the cycle, I, I don't have FSH receptors. Why am I having higher levels of FSH? In fact, this is how a stimulation should look like, right? We should go down with the level of FSH if we want to match with these, um, uh, the, the, the pattern of receptors. So the question is, will this have an impact on our outcomes? The fertilization, the, the embryo quality, the implantation, euploidy. Now, most likely the answer is yes. So in this paper, they compared patients with high FSH and low, uh, sorry, this was the low FSH and high FSH at day of trigger. And they saw that even the high group of FSH, they have a um, specific even physical characteristic. They were darker, the zona pilosida, the cytoplasm was darker. But interestingly, they found that there was no difference between the low FSH and high FSH group in maturation rate. It was the same. Not even fertilization rate. Again, it was the same. They saw the effect on the clinical pregnancy and the quality of embryos. So in the group of high FSH, they had less, significantly lower rate of good quality embryos. This is one of my favorite paper. So this study aimed at blaming the embryologist after the generation of the ICSI. So the question was, is it the one who did the ICSI or the one who did the denudation? Luckily, the answer was neither of them. While they're analyzing their data, what they saw is, actually, the higher level of FSH and the lower level of estradiol at day of trigger are, have higher chances of degeneration. So something that was supposed to be IVF lab related became stimulation or um, patient related. Dr. Raquel um, presented um, this data in Ishri last year clearly showing that the higher FSH at day of trigger, the higher the rate of aneuploidy. And this was supporting previously, um, previous studies. Um, the only difference is here they did polar body biopsy instead of trophectoderm biopsy. And they saw that, again, the higher the FSH, the higher the um, chances of having an aneuploid oocyte. If you have an aneuploid oocyte, of course, you will have, I mean, lower quality of embryos, you will have less implantation, it will affect everything. 
So what about the progesterone levels at day of Tegel? Because they are also a reflection of our stimulation. If you push too hard with the gonadotropins or with the FSH, eventually at day of trigger you will have high progesterone levels, right? In this study, they showed that if you have one point, more than 1.5 or 2 um, nanogram per ml, you have significantly lower top quality embryos. And we can explain that probably because progesterone itself is a mediator in the cytoplasmic maturation. Progesterone is involved in the cytoplasmic maturation. How? Because there are several genes that are very important and essential for the cytoplasmic maturation are progesterone responsive. It means if you have high levels, you will affect their expression. And then you don't have a competent cytoplasmic maturation. Again, there were several studies comparing even the type of gonadotropin they use, that we use, and they found a difference. So here it was in favor of the gonal F with the number of oocytes, number of embryos. This is a study comparing recombinant FSH and HMG, and they found also, again, with the quality of embryos, significant difference. I'm not supporting one over the other. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm just saying that if we can see difference uh, with the type of gonadotropin, imagine what we will see with the type of dual trigger or the type of trigger with the, with the dose, with the number of days, and other decisions. This is an example of a study that they compared that, uh, two triggers. It's CG with a dual trigger. And what they found is that the um, dual trigger group has significantly higher fertilization rate, which is a lab parameter, right? It's a lab parameter caused by something decided during the stimulation. You have higher day three embryos as a number and also as a quality. So these, and, and, and this is what we were talking at the beginning. We go back to the basics because we complete each other. We cannot make miracles. Um, I mean, uh, we are as good as the, the, the material that we have received. And also imagine the opposite. There are so many things that we do in the lab. We will waste all your endometrial preparation, what Dr. Fatima was explaining, naturally. Imagine you put all of this effort, and then we don't do our job properly. So at, at, at the end, we, as embryologists and also as a clinician, complete each other if we want to compete and improve our um, um, results. So to summarize, we all understand that oogenesis is a complex process. However, it's, it's essential. It's the, the core of what we do. Um, the evidence showed that we at this stage should avoid having higher FSH and P4 levels at the day of trigger. I mean, something I didn't write because probably I still want to be employed, but maybe we need to stop blaming the embryologist and start first asking ourselves a question. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim, for the very informative presentation. And uh, as we are behind the schedule, uh, we will continue with the symposium now in individualization of art with Professor Fatemi. And if we can kindly ask if there's any questions for the presenters, if you can address to them during the time in lunch, please. And we will be meeting for session three as well at 2.15. And for now, please give a welcome to Professor Fatemi. I know you're all hungry, so I'm going to keep it short, fast, and to the point, uh, because we are running indeed behind. You have heard a lot about individualization today, and there will be some repetition, but I think repetition is good in order to understand things and translate it into the daily practice. Now, if you take a look at the ovarian reserve of a woman, you see, we used to define the age of a woman as a predictor for response. But that's not always correct, because you can be a young woman, being a poor responder, you can be an all elderly woman and being a high responder. So age is not the only factor which is determining the ovarian reserve. So at any given age, you can have any response. You can be poor, medium, or high responder. Especially in this part of the world, as Dr. Laura Melado published last year, 40% of women in reproductive age are poor responders. Four zero. It's a huge number. So 40% of women in reproductive age are poor responders for various reasons. And those reasons we have published on multiple occasions. So age is one variable. Ovarian reserve is another important variable to have a look at. Now, when we stimulate a woman, it is important to understand 
that it's only a fraction of the time that these follicles are responsive to gonadotropins. It's only a few days, the last few days, that these follicles are FSH dependent. What happens before, they are absolutely FSH independent. Now, when we are stimulating a woman, there are different factors that you're looking at. One of them is efficacy, safety, cost, patient acceptance, and of course, to make sure that it's a safe environment that we do so. Many studies have looked to the ideal number of how many oocytes are required in, only, in order to be successful. And they have shown that basically somewhere around 8 to 10, 14, 15 oocytes is the best time where you have the highest pregnancy and you have the lowest cancellation rate. Too few, it will lead to cancellation. Too high eggs, obviously, even with an agonist triggering for the final oocyte maturation, it might lead to complications like bleeding and not only OHSS. So in order to individualize, not only the number of oocytes is important, the age of a woman is also important. Because when you say 14 oocytes, I would ask you, 14 oocytes with whom? 14 oocytes with a 30-year-old patient? Or 14 oocytes with a 41, 42-year-old patient? Because 14 is not equal 14, right? So imagine you have 14 oocytes with a 30-year-old, your chance of having one baby is 80%. But 14 oocytes with a 41-year-old is only 30%. So it's half. Why? Because obviously, with increasing age, you have more genetically abnormal oocytes. And that is something which we should keep in mind, that there are genetically abnormal oocytes. The most beautiful embryo that you have, the most beautiful oocyte that you have, it might be abnormal. You know that one of the greatest looking embryos is a trisomy 21 embryo. Is it a good embryo? Yeah, but it's not normal. So this is why only the shine, the surface, is not important. I always explain it to the couples, especially to the husbands, because most of them they are not really following what I'm explaining, so I go into cars. I tell to the husband, it's like I'm selling you my car. It's a beautiful car, but the engine has a problem. Is it still a beautiful car? Of course it is, but the engine has a problem, and the engine is the genetic information of these eggs. Again, a very recent paper, which just came out a few weeks ago, Fertility Sterility. You see, the more eggs you have, the higher is your life birth rate and clinical pregnancy rate. So more eggs, and this is in line what Professor Gianaroli mentioned. Basically, it's, it's a numbers game. The more eggs you have, the higher is your pregnancy. But you have to be cautious. How do you get these eggs? How do you stimulate women? Because as you have seen, stimulation might jeopardize the outcome. And that's also important to realize. So we have various parameters. You have ovarian reserve assessment, you have AMH, you have antral follicle count. Um, all these variables have been described in order to predict a high response, normal response, or a poor response. And in fact, if you respect these variables, you can easily predict the response and you can easily go towards the point of having your 13, 14 eggs based on the age of the patient. So Antonio Lamarca published this paper a few years ago that based on these variables, he made this normogram that he can calculate which is the best dose to start a treatment. But we have to be cautious. Today, you have heard a lot about individualization. When you speak on individualization, there are two factors that you have to put into cohesion. One of them is, what is the dose that you initiate a stimulation? Obviously, you have graphs that you can calculate the dose. But let's say you initiate with a certain dose. Do you have to continue with the same dose? Or do you need to adjust the dose according to the patient's requirement and according to the patient's physiology? And I think this is an important issue to look at. Furthermore, when you stimulate a patient, we need to understand that FSH that we administer has different isoforms. FSH is not equal FSH. You know that an FSH molecule has four arms. 
or four legs, as you might define it. And each one of these arms, you can attach four different sugar residues. And the more sugar residues you attach to these four arms, the higher is the acidity. So basically, you can have two, three, or four sugar residues attached to the FSH molecule. And obviously, that will also have an impact on the half lifetime. The more sugar residues you have, the higher is the half lifetime of that FSH molecule. But also, the biopotency and the affinity, this is called the antenna of FSH, the affinity, the bioaffinity to the receptor and post-receptor activation is also influenced by the glucolization of that FSH molecule. So the moment we administer a certain drug, a drug is not equal drug, the dose is important, the activity is important, the half lifetime is also important. You have heard about the change of endocrine environment, the window of implantation. The moment we start stimulating a patient, we change the endocrine environment. And that can have an impact on the receptivity of the endometrium. And you have seen that progesterone initiates what we call secretory transformation. Endometrium of all women is advanced, gene expression changes, and if you stimulate wrongly, your progesterone goes up. You have heard that this morning. But you might say, okay, endometrium is advanced. I don't care about the endometrium. I'm going to freeze the embryos. I have to disappoint you. Because if you stimulate wrongly when progesterone goes up, because you have given too much of FSH, not only the endometrium is disturbed, but also the quality of the oocyte is disturbed. So you have lower oocyte quality, you seem to have also more abnormal embryos, and that is present in all women. There are many publications coming more and more to describe that if you don't do those adjustments and you stimulate one size fits all, your embryo oocyte quality goes down. Now, progesterone is usually growing because the follicles are becoming bigger. So the bigger the follicle becomes, the more progesterone it produces. Why does it produce progesterone? Obviously, because it has more LH receptors. FSH induces LH receptors. The more LH receptors you have, the higher is your progesterone. This is why the bigger the follicle becomes, the more progesterone it produces. As you can clearly see, LH receptors are directly linked to progesterone, different statistics significant. LH receptors, higher progesterone, Higher LH, also higher progesterone. So you already have many variables which are contributing to that factor. And what is creating LH receptors to increase the progesterone values? FSH. As you have heard from Dr. Barbara Lawrence today, the more FSH you administer, the more LH receptors you create. Why do we have LH receptors? Very simple. For the final oocyte maturation. Because LH is needed for nuclear and cytoplasmic maturation. So this is basic physiology. You have seen this slide on many occasions today, but this is extremely important. You know, a follicle which is 14, 50 millimeters has almost no FSH receptors. But this is the time where we are bombarding the follicles with FSH. Is it correct? No, it's not correct. And we have to be cautious, because if you give too much FSH, it will backfire. Now, if you look at that slide, this is what we do on a daily basis. But once we reach a threshold of follicular recruitment, we continue stimulating. But this is the way it should have been done. You stimulate, and once the follicles grow, you go step down. And do we do that? No, not really. But this is exactly the way it should be done, because the number of FSH receptors, as you see, is going down. And this is what is happening in nature. So this is a paper we have published a few years ago, and we correlated the FSH values based on the days of stimulation. So if you have high FSH here, day five, let's say, your progesterone is higher. But the moment your FSH goes down, day eight, your F progesterone goes down. So you see, FSH is in direct correlation with progesterone. Why? Because you create simply LH receptors, as simple as it is. And you have seen this publication by Dr. Lawrence. If you give a certain dose to a patient, let's say you take Mrs. X, she is 30 years old with a BMI of 25, with an AMH of 2.5 nanogram per ml. You copy-paste that lady. Two friends, identical demographics. 
You give them at the same time of the day the same dose of FSH, and you measure after five days after the administration of antagonists to suppress the endogenesis of FSH, the systemic FSH values. It is extremely interesting to know that you can have an FSH of seven or twenty-seven with the same dose of FSH. The same woman can have an FSH of seven. Or 27. Now you can imagine that this FSH will have an impact on LH receptor creation, on endocrine profile, and the quality of all site, and 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 and. So do we look into that? I think we should because that has an impact on the all site quality. Hence, this is why we published this paper last year, reintroducing systemic FSH, era of individualized medicine. You need to understand what you have administered, and you know, to me, it's very simplistic. Many people publish. Let's say compare 150 with 250. Let's compare 200 with 300. Let's compare 300 with 450. This is a joke, because you might give 200, your systemic FSH is 40. You might give 450. Your systemic FSH is eight or nine because that patient has high basal metabolism, high clearance, liver, kidney. So it's too simplistic. Most of these studies need to be more detail-oriented. So again, recent publication looking to FSH and progesterone, there is a direct link. And as you have seen, too much FSH seems also to be linked to more unemployed. For those among you who are interested, we publish many papers. On describing the basic physiology of individualization of the endocrine profile in ovarian stimulation, I think to put that all together, and I know you're all hungry, and I kept my promise of staying below 10 minutes. Individualization means individualization of initiation, but also individualization while you stimulate those adaptation towards the end of follicular phase. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, absolutely. It is time for lunch. That is what we're. No offence, I was going to say it's what we're looking forward to. Worrying, isn't it? Right, lunch is served. It's around the other side, but again, we are trying to catch up with the schedules, so we're going to be back very shortly. I think around about 45 minutes. But if you listen out for the bell, and we will see you for the next two sessions of the day. Thank you so much. No. Mira.
can hold any questions until the coffee break and then we can take care of all of those for you. But for now, we'll move on to the next sessions. Thank you. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. So it gives me great pleasure to announce Professor Watie. I mean, the formal CV is he is the head of the gynecology department at the Latifa Women and Children Hospital in Dubai, director of advanced course in gynecological endoscopy at IRCAD in France. In addition, he is the chairman of European Academy of Gynecological Surgery, the founder and director of the Winners Education Program, as well as the founder of Miss Academy. But we all know that I've been personally watching your videos, listening to your lectures, I think, yeah, like since late, my, well, since the end of my residency. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's great pleasure to listen to you again today about the role of surgery in infertile endometriosis patients. Please. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice but frightening introduction. And so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Fatemi for the invitation. Um, alors, I will I will probably disappoint you, but I want to start with this video, and I would like you to look at very attentively. This is the ovary on the left side, and this is the fembria on the left side. Okay, and this patient became spontaneously pregnant. And so we doctor, we, we do algorithm, we have statistics, and we confuse sometimes mathematical hope and desire of pregnancy. And so you, we have to always remember that nature is strong. And we have to give some hope to the patient. So what is the role of surgery in an infertile endometriosis patient? I, I start to tell you I will probably disappoint you because uh, I think the treatment of end endometriotic patient is a huge algorithm. And the problem of the algorithm is that every single patient is another patient. And probably the algorithm do not fit exactly for that patient. Uh, and, and probably, and we never think about it because when we speak, uh, actually it's very efficient to speak about artificial intelligence. And this is where probably the artificial intelligence will help us a lot. Because, uh, uh, because it's a difficult task. So whatever endometriosis uh, lower the spontaneous fertility rate of patient. And we have data for this about by 10, 10 times fold. So the fertility, uh, the monthly fecundity rate of an endometriotic patient is 10 times less than another patient. And so this is... Uh, with what we have to start. The second point is to observe. When we observe, the link between endometriosis and infertility is very tiny, and no one can explain it. And so, obviously, if you have huge adhesion, inflammation, tubal blockage, we understand that mechanically. Then you have the inflammation and all these uh, uh, microchemical alteration, we can understand it. And then now you have what is very interesting, what we call the crosstalk between ectopic lesion and atopic lesion, that may be interesting you. And that's why we receive a lot of patients from uh, infertility center for doing surgery and removing those lesions. But there are not strong data on that. And so that means that if we do not understand why, probably we, we can do palliative things, but we cannot do curative things. And so we have some society, and here is the Yeshre, that look at, this, at the problem very simple. So if you have infertility, you go to a doctor. So if you find a medical doctor, it will give you hormones. If you find an infertility doctor, it will propose IVF. And if you come to me, I will say surgery for the same thing. And so this is the, this is the, way, uh, the way the Yeshre look at the system. And I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit too simple. And so I mean that uh, the, the, the problem we have, at least we agree with them, that there is not that much place for the moment. Maybe it will be, but for the moment, there is not much place for infertile patients with hormonal therapy, either pre-op or post-op or then. 
The good news for this audience, and I, uh, I'm sure you will appreciate this slide, it means that the time of surgery for all is probably over. And so I mean that it's not any more time to say, you have, you know, this famous phrase, uh, surgery is the first line therapy for endometriosis, is probably not that accurate, and, and we should probably rediscuss it. And so the situation is more something like this. You know, we are, we are in a very uh, unprecise way, and we are three partners for infertile patients. We have the patient first. I think we have to put the patient first. Then we have the, the surgeon, because surgery has a role, and we have the infertility doctor. So it should be a decision-sharing system. And uh, what amazed me a lot is in my profession, I am a surgeon, I don't do any infertility uh, in terms of IVF. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed that they all, always push me to tell that surgery is a multidisciplinary uh, task where we should have colorectal surgeon, urologic surgeon, etc. We never talk about infertility people. And so I think that I need more an infertility competence that I need a colorectal competence that I can take care. And so this is something that we have to, to see along. We have to start by the beginning to see where we can go. Alors, first thing, we, we deal mostly with young patients, which is interesting because when you observe the demographic data comparing, for example, Europe to Middle East, uh, we are in the Middle East, in Europe, 85% of the patients with deep endo are nulliparous. Here, 85% of the patients with deep endo are multiparous. So it means that something is different. Alors, we understand the, 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 the social facts that patient comes to get married earlier, so probably before the, the, the impact of the disease on the fertility is too high, there are pressure, et cetera, but, but nevertheless, so it is still question, what is the link between infertility and, and endometriosis? The second point is a benign disease. And I pay attention to what I say because I told the same word in front of patient recently, and they told me it's not benign at all. So, I mean, it's benign in terms of oncology. It's probably a very, very... Uh, self-threatening disease, but it's still a benign disease in oncological worlds. Until when, we will see, because this is also a warning I want to tell you. So benign disease, not a cancer, very important. And then, mostly, as they are young, we mostly have to deal with, you know, fertility preservation, that we have to deal with infertility. I think infertility is quite easy, thanks to you, by the way, but it's quite easy. And then, the last but not the least, this is a surgery associated with a lot of complications, and especially in hands of non-trained people. And so let's go like this, and let's just give a word on the fact that it's not a cancer. And it's not a cancer, so it means that when people say it's an oncological-like surgery, it's totally wrong. It's absolutely not an oncological-like surgery. It may be that we use the same anatomical planes, but we don't do the same. And why we don't do the same? First of all, because there is no clear evidence today that we have to do an optimal cyto cytoreduction on all patients. And why this is important is important for you, because there is no evidence that when you have an endometrioma, for example, that we should remove it. And this is important because, and this is just because it's not a cancer. And so the, the, the second part is, there is no safety margin. And so it means that when you do, uh, uh, when you do a cytoreduction, you can be very economical. And so it means that the trauma, the mutilation you do to the patient can be very limited for an optimal reason. And I think this is also something that is important in the dealing with infertile patients. And so, if I can get, so preserving the fertility, the list is probably not, uh, not uh, exhaustive, but you have all the art techniques, and I'm very interested by the in vitro maturation of immature follicles, because if we had this working, it will open the door to 
better surgery. Uh, we can discuss this in another, another way, but that, that is very promising, probably for you, but for us. And then you have all the rest, but you have mainly either to do a partial surgery, so it means that if the patient is infertile, I just big endometria, fix the endometrioma, even though she has deep lesion, why to touch them if no symptoms? That may be accepted. We should discuss it, but may be accepted. And above all, we have this concept, economical surgery. So we develop a concept, the concept which is called economical radicalism. Now, this has a price to be paid, is competences, excellences. And so you can, not all surgeons can do that because it requires special training. But this is a very interesting concept. Now, let's go to, to surgery. Surgery is very challenging, we know, because we deal with a lot of, uh, of location. The location are not always a, a gynae location. So we have bowel, we have everything, nerve, etc. So we have challenges and we have a lot of complications. Alors, you know that if you look in data, you will find uh, numbers like uh, 9 to 12% of, of complex and, and grave complication. Thanks God, I cross finger, we don't have this here. In a recent paper, Horace Roman published 8 to 9% of fistula and pelvic abscesses after discoid resection and segmental resection. If I had this complication, I will lose my license here. So it means that something is wrong. You know, I mean that, again, that proof that that should be done in center. But more than this, forget the complication. We can deal with them. We have late complication, and those late complications are much more preoccupied. We have bladder complications, which are the more frequent, 5.4%. We have bowel and sexual dysfunction, which are problematic. And if you have a sexual dysfunction, what is the role of the sexual dysfunction in infertility? This is also a question we can ask. If you have no intercourse, you have no pregnancy. It's very simple. And so we have to deal. So again, every patient is another patient, so it's very difficult to, 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 to design a very strict algorithm that fit for all. And so it means that we have to be as much a radical as we can on the disease, and we should be as much as conservative we, we could be in the, in the functions. And we have, above all, I think, uh, to respect the, the patient requirement. And there is probably a limit that we have to discuss one day about patient requirement and medical duties, but uh, this is a subject that I will, we will address. So quality of life, obviously, fertility, if we can, preservation, always, and this is where, where uh, we go. Oh, the first question is uh, surgery effective in increasing the, the chance for, uh, per, for spontaneous pregnancy. We have data. Most of them are very old. Those are the classical from uh, Marco is from 97. So you see we are far away, 20, almost 25 years ago. I think we probably do better now. But already at that time, they say if you have infertility and peritoneal implants, reject the peritoneal implants instead of coagulate them and you will get a better result in uh, fertility. Alors, the main question we have all is this, is endometrioma. Alors, endometrioma is very interesting because we have different data and data are confusing. The first data which is used by the, the surgeon is this one. The surgeons say, okay, we don't do surgery on endometrioma, but the disease itself, you know, decreases the ovarian reserve of the patient by inflammatory things. And now, you have to read clearly the paper. It's true for bilateral endometrioma. It's not strictly true for single unilateral endometrioma. But nevertheless, the disease itself may, improve, may, may impact the ovarian reserve and decrease the ovarian reserve. Now, if you look the result in the opposite of the surgery, we have data that are very clear that we are impairing the ovarian reserve. Now, you have to look carefully also in number because most of the time, if you look at the AMH post-op immediate, we have a large decrease, but if you look at it six months later, it's a slight re-increase. And so uh, this is what we have to check. And obviously, it certainly depends on the quality of the surgeon. So if you do an endometri endometrial ambulation on that patient, if you are the surgeon, 
you have to confess that you are a poor surgeon because you look, there is almost no ovary left. And so I mean that if you have this result after an endometrial ablation, it's very better to just drain in and leave it in place. And so that is the point. And so uh, I just come back here, but I think techniques, techniques are very important. And so it means that w we have protocols, but when you free the ovary, the first thing you should never do is to leave half of the cortex on the lateral side of the, of the, of the pelvis. And you see that this is something which is quite uh, small, slow, under control, so we try to free and we free the ovary correctly in order to not damage the ovary. And then after that, if you do, sorry, if you do, I have to come back, I think, yeah, as a, okay, I did, no, I would really like to show you this one. Well, I think, I don't know if this is the one, no, it's the one. Okay, doesn't work, whatever. There is a technique to, to, to do a cystectomy, it was this slide but you all know that is no issue. And then after that, you can use alternative technique like this one, which is the sclerotherapy. So you have the cyst, you just very simply put a trocar, you aspirate the liquid, you replace, you put a Foley catheter, you inflate the balloon, you inject uh, as much as alcohol uh, until spilling. Uh, the alcohol should be 90 or 95 degrees, and then you leave this for 15 minutes. So you have to be patient, and then you remove, you re-aspirate the liquid, and then you leave. You don't touch anymore the ovary. And I must say that uh, we, we are looking at our series of patients with sclerotherapy, and we are very amazed that I was expecting much more recurrence, because we tell to the patient, you probably will recure, we don't know when. And we have a lot of young patients pregnant, but they are young, and we have a lot of patients which, uh, which do not recue. So, the problem is this one. Does an endometria give pain? And the answer is no. So, if you look at the data, in 98% of patients with endometrioma and pain, you have deep endo. So, that's the problem. So, the question is, can we do a sclerotherapy leave and leave the deep endo? Well, if the patient has no pain, what, why not? Why not? And then you can do, why not, an assisted uh, on IVF. But what is the problem with deep endo and IVF retrieval? Well, I know that it's, it's very common to say, no problem, we can pick up the eggs. But I am in the other side, and I get your patient with abscesses. And so it's not that, that easy. When you have the bowel inside the, on your way, you have to pay attention. Alors, so I, I, I will pass uh, rapidly because I, I don't want to show you uh, surgery. I want to, to discuss. So, some people, and this is Massimo Candiani from Milan here, is one of my ex fellow, and he, he does the vaporization with the laser like Donez was in the past, and he makes a small randomized trial, so not a lot of cases, but try to see that the vaporization of the, of the wall is. Uh, associated with a less decrease of the uh, image. What I want, I want to come back to this. You know, when you have this, you have a famous kissing ovary on the back of the uterus, so you free everything. I, I just want, and then you have this. So you see, when you have removed the ovary, you have all those lesions. The rectum is little bit retracted, all the peritoneum is inflamed. You have the famous, you know, crosstalk of lesion, and that's where we, we do a lot of called Douglasectomy, peritonectomy. And we know, by the way, and we have to check that those peritonectomy may be associated with adhesion. And the question is, does adhesion are better than lesion? And so this is also where we are lacking data. So you see that this is not uh, finally an easy technique because you have veins, you have ureters, you have rectums, so it may be associated with complication again. So you have also to do it in. In association with this, you have data, which is very recent, and it's 21, that say that both ablation and cystectomy have a significant effect on IMH, probably the ablation a little bit less. So now we are not anymore cystectomy bad, ablation good. We are both are not that good. So that gives the, you know, why not to not touch it, and then we can rediscuss this after. 
Alors, I think that you have to refer patient to expert center. I think that, you know, we have data in oncology. If you have a, a gynec cancer, and if you are treated by a standard gynecologist, you have five times less chance to survive compared to gynec oncologist. So go to the gynec oncologist. The same for endometriosis. I don't say that expert are always, you know, even expert gynec oncology, you have still patient dying. So we have still patients that recure, we, we miss, we fail, we have complications, yes, but, but rather lower that uh, people not train. Alors, so I mean that surgery is still actually, uh, surgery of endometrium is teach advice before many of the procedure, and by the way, this is the main referring to us for endometrioma are infertility center. Alors we have hydrosalpings first, and then endometrioma as referent. So we have developed, uh, I cannot go through, it will be too long, but we have developed a, a very clear decision tree for endometrioma. So we know, we know, and I, I just show you that, that has been done uh, in, uh, in Strasbourg, so we just issue it with the Strasbourg consensus that will be published next month. But you see that, always look at this, start by this, ask your question on the malignant potential. I want to tell you, one of my patients died last week, 32 years, endometrial cancer, clear cells cancer on endometriosis. So eliminate always, even for infertility, even in young patients, the malignant potential. We have the tool for that, and it's very important for the patient. So what now about dependo associated with endometriosis? So we know to how to treat dependo, we know to do bar resection, uh, ureteric anastomosis, bladder resection, we do everything. So now we are very, very performant. And then, but what do we do? Uh, do we improve the spontaneous fertility? So I just put a very discuss, but this is also a very recent paper from 21 uh, in the GMIC that from Casals and the, the team of Carmona that shows that, you know, if you look, uh, the, the, the result favors surgery before, uh, before pregnancy, either spontaneous or IVF related. So I think that, uh, that again, but that are, that are uh, data which are uh, made from out of expert center. So I come to the end. So you see, finally, we have three groups of patients. We have patient with pain, or again, pain, you know, pain resistant to medical treatment. If you have pain that you take a small uh, brufen, it's gone, we are not in that case. Patient come and try everything and is in pain. So here is easy, is surgery, and surgery if the family completed or if no desire of pregnancy, radical or conservative, we can discuss, is not the subject today. Now, if there is a prospective desire of pregnancy, this is where probably the, to consider fertility preservation is important. Because, you know, honestly, when I see a patient and he say, should I uh, collect my eggs? My tendency is to say yes to everyone. The problem is the cost, accessibility, and this is a real problem, especially here, and for example, in Europe now, they start to accept fertility preservation free of charge for endometriosis. Actually, it's only for cancer. So now they will do it for endometriosis, but not here. And so it means that we have to consider and to offer. We have to remember also that less than 25% that of the eggs collected are used for fertility. So it means that 75 are made useless. So we have to, we have to find this. We, we have to discuss this, but we have a, we, you know, this is the same of Cleveland Clinic of all those areas, nothing new, but I think we can be a little bit smarter. So I have two minutes left. Then we have the second group, which is pain, still resistant, and infertility. And so here is a little bit uh, more difficult because we can discuss immediately in this group with bilateral endometriosis, unilateral OMA history of surgery, uh, history of multiple surgery or at risk of multiple surgery. And this is where we welcome the group of the deep and low. And those we have to discuss the, 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 to consider the fertility preservation before the surgery. And, and then we have to discuss OMA, yes, no. And then we have to, uh, to go through and to do surgery. And the surgery, if we do, should be an economical radically specialized center. 
I think that this is fine. And then the patient either has a potential to be spontaneously pregnant, pregnant and we give her eight months or, or she is not and we refer to the fertility center. And then we have the third group, which is the infertility only, so no pain. And so then we have, alors, we, we have to start still by a total workup of the patient. Uh, I had my, one of my medical students that lost a kidney, never got pain. She was 27, never tried to get pregnant, and she lost a kidney. So we still have to do the full workup for the disease, and we have to consider if we have a functional impairment, so stenosis or hydronephrosis, stenosis of the bowel, etc., on which we still have to do surgery, and the, despite the infertility and the absence of symptoms, or we do not have. So again, we also have to look at potential malignancy, and then we have the famous question, hydrosalpinx, endometrioma, and then you can go down and you can choose the way you treat IVF, uh, classical cystectomy, and or alternative technique like, uh, like uh, uh, sclerotherapy. Alors, everything, and this is written here, and I go fast because I have less than one minute, all posturity management are guided uh, per the pair operative finding, and we use the FE score. Now, the FE score has an excellent correlation in terms of the chance to get pregnant post op. So, I mean, the good point of the FE score is that half of the data you know before the surgery. You still have to put the scope, but you have half of the data before the surgery that it helps you. And so, the FE score is very well correlated, and this is a recent paper, again, that you can, I cannot pronounce the, the name of the author because uh, it's very difficult to pronounce. And then we have the variable. Again, all the patients are different. We have the variable. So just to, just to show you one, adenomyosis. I mean, adenomyosis, if you look some data, reduce the chance to get pregnant by 70%. It's not, it's not a lot. Huh? It's, it's not little. It's a lot. So you know that whatever, there is always one variable that comes in your, in your superb you know, algorithm and breaks the the beautiful machine, what we set up. So that's why I, 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 I say so. The conclusion, the conclusion that as every patient is one, as I am competent in surgery, but I am mostly incompetent in IVF. So I need someone competent because he can light my ignorance. And so it means that we can decide by by this shared decision, we can have, including the patient, by the way, because patients have the right. Huh? You see, you, if you look, huh, pain is almost the, the most important, you know, decisive factor for surgery, but not always. The wish for conceiving uh, and the strong fear of complication are really the things that change the, the choice of the patient, even if the fertility is important, but not always. We have a lot of patients say, I don't want to get pregnant, it's fine, I want to get rid of this pain. And this is why, why we have to change them. So you have to follow what I tell you, share decisions that include patient, uh, fertility doctor, and surgeon. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure and honor now for me to introduce my, I'm always kidding a bit, my German uh, boss and friend. So I want to introduce Professor Sarah Brucker. She is the head of the um, Women's Department Hospital in Tübingen, which is one of the oldest German hospitals. So she is excelling in a lot of gynecological things. So I cannot always all put them all together. Now, but her main focus is on genital malformations. So she developed a technique to create a neovagina for patients with vaginal aplasia. However, Tübingen is also a place, the only place in Germany until now, which um, performed uterine transplantations for patients uh, with an uterine aplasia. And now I'm very happy that you are sharing our experience with us. Thank you, Sarah, please. Dear Barbara, dear Mr. Fatemi, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for the invitation and to be here. Um, it's always great to see how scientifically 
you approach um, the daily therapy and the daily diagnosis. And this inspires me always to everything question, questionable. You said it this morning, so always ask about what is the routinely what is routinely done and is it always right what you are doing? I take you now to a totally different um, yeah, therapy which you might have heard but of course not performed and it's definitely not a daily routine. We are talking about uterus transplantation. We heard the whole day and the morning started with the terms of endometrium and endometrium and the receptivity of endometrium, but those patients who need a uterus transplantation, they have no endometrium because they have no uterus. So we go to uterine transplantation and it's, it's a quite, we heard about interdisciplinarity. It's a topic which has two different type of thinking. The one is the fertility or the infertility Part, and the other part is the transplantation, so the surgical part. And we as gynecologists have not been in touch with an organ transplantation except ovarian tissue transplantation. So we had to go in a totally new field. And on the other hand side, I had to convince the transplant surgeon um, that they go for an organ, for transplantation of an organ, which does not save lives. And this is the totally different thinking in uterus transplantation because uterus gives life. This is why you are all here. You want to give life to your patient. We want to give life to our patient, but the transplant surgeon wants to save life. So at the beginning, this was really challenging because we needed a transplantation surgeon because we wanted we need to um, learn about immunosuppression. We need to learn the technique of vessel anastomosis. So we had to come together. And these are the patients why we had to come together. As uh, Mrs. Lawrence just told you, we are dealing since now more than 20 years with patients who have a congenital vaginal and uterine ablation, the so-called meyer rogetansky Hauser syndrome. It's a rare syndrome, but on the other hand side, it affects one of 4,500 female newborns. So there are around 8,000 newborn uh, or 8,000 women living in Germany. So although it's very rare, um, normally none, even of our uh, colleagues, have even seen a patient or was aware of it. The good thing is that they are young when they get the diagnosis, so that they're not according normally to the infertile patient. You know they are coming with the age of 35 um, and did not get pregnant. They know normally at the age of 16, 17 that they will not get pregnant because they have no uterus. So they are young, they have normal ovaries, they have a normal pheno and genotype, but they have no vagina and they have no uterus. But they look on their external um, um, sexuality, they look totally normal. And this is also an aspect which I have to tell our colleagues, our gynecologists, if you have a young girl, age of 16, 17, who has a primary amenorrhea without pain, so asymptomatic, primary amenorrhea, think of an aplasia. So I said the three A's, remember it, because we have seen a lot of misdiagnosis and mistherapies, malpractice in those women. They came first and they get, at the first impression, they get the hormonal therapy because the doctor says, well, you start to bleed, you are 70 years old, we just give you the pill. Of course, they do not start to bleed. Oh, they say just it's a hymenal atresia and we just make a little cut and then the blood will go out. Of course, there is no blood there is fresh blood if they cut into this hymenal. And so we had to start an awareness campaign in the last 20 years to get an awareness that this syndrome really exists and that they have associated malformation. And these associated malformations are important if you go to a surgery. So you have to know that about 40% of those patients have kidney 
disorder. So they have only one kidney, they have um, a horseshoe kidney, or they have a double ureter. And of course, this affects also uterine transplantation because you all know if the kidneys are impaired, then you have the chance, a high risk, a chance to get preeclampsia. So those patients who had only one kidney in the series, for example, of Matt Sprenstrom, who was the inaugurator of uterus transplantation, they had all preeclampsia problems during their pregnancy. So you have to be aware of this. But when the patient comes to us at the age of 16, 70 years old in their puberty, they don't think about getting pregnant. They think about having a normal sexual life. And this is why we um, invented the laparoscopic assisted neovagina, which exists only um, in terms of stretching the vaginal dimple, which you can see on the, um, on the right side in the video. Just one second. So it should work. So that means that in around four to five days, we stretch the vaginal dimple, and then we create a vagina of about 10 centimeters. Currently, we have performed more than 600 neo-vagina in the last 20 years, and we have really good long-term results. And this is what, at the age of 16, 17, 18 years old, this is what the, those um, patients want to have, they want to have a normal sexual life. We measure the sexual satisfaction, the female sexual function index, and we could prove it that it's the same aged match control, because this is very important, as the same normal population. And this vagina stays stable over years, and they have a good lubrication. They don't need any hormones to have a good sexual intercourse. But then they get at the age of 25, 30, and their maybe sister, friends get pregnant, and then the desire and their um, fulfilling of child which um, came up again. They need normally then a bit of psychological um, treatment, but then they come to us and they say, can't you help me? Adoption, of course, is an issue, but in Germany, as well as in many countries, it's not that easy to adopt a child. It's very, very hard. Surrogacy is not allowed. So uterus transplantation is the only thing that they can have their own biological child. We have only done so far four successful transplantation, and this is because of COVID. So we had to stop our uterus transplantation program like it did worldwide, because you can't do and transplantation of an organ in a healthy um, woman and put them under immunosuppression if a virus is there. So we will restart again this year, but we have done so far five successful transplantation. And why in Tübingen? As I told you, we have a good standard in neovagina creation. <coughs> Sorry. We have a long standing experience. And we have an established interdisciplinary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And we have an established interdisciplinary cooperation with our general surgeon, with the genetics, and with the psychosomatic um, doctors. And we have done a lot of intensive training on cadavers and animals. So when we started to think about treating patients with genital malformation, we started also a translational research program on genetic, on psychosomatic, on, psycho, on, on pathology. And beside this, we also started to cooperate with Gothenburg. And I tell you, I always say it's a domino surgical method, so you start with the neo-vagina, and then the second step is that those girls become really a mother. And Professor Mats Brandstrom saw a talk of mine um, concerning the neo-vagina creation many, many years ago, around 12 years ago, and he invited me to come to Gothenburg, and then I got in touch with his dream of uterine transplantation. And so the cooperation was very close, and he came to Tübingen 
for our first uterine transplantation, which we performed in 2016 and have now performed four of them and all four of them get their baby. We had to do a multidisciplinary team and you can see there are a lot of members. They come from psychosomatic over ethic institute, which was really important in Germany that we got the approval that we really are allowed to start, but also all the other departments who are in terms of transplantation are needed. And I needed to go and to open many, many doors. I call it always ethically, socially, and legally, because it was not easy to convince our healthcare system and as well the transplantation society that we go for an organ which is not life-saving, but as I told you, which gives life, and which is a transient transplantation. Because after at maximum two children, we remove the uterus not to have too much time of immunosuppression because immunosuppression has side effects. And after that, we then got the approval of the Ministry of Health that we can do the first four to five transplantation and to start this trial. We had to do um, and to define inclusion and exclusion criteria for donor and recipient because it's a live transplantation. So that means that we have living donors, which is normally the mother, or we also had a sister, and they go surgery, and it's not just a simple hysterectomy. It's this really, really heavy surgery which takes about nine to 10 hours for a normal woman who gives their uterus to their daughter. So we have to be very, very safe that this donor is not harmed by anything what we are doing. So this is the topic of everything what we are doing. The donor does not have to be harmed. So therefore our inclusion criteria were very, very strict. And this was the fact why we had many, many patients to exclude. Because if you remember, which 60-year-old woman does not have hypertension, did not smoke in their life, has no um, chronic um, vessel disease, for example. And all those things were exclusion criteria. Of course, the recipient is very young, so there we had not that problems to find a healthy recipient, but also um, we have a limit of the age of 38, because if you start to think about uterine transplantation, you have to do a lot of steps. And from the first appointment until we can do really the transplantation, it takes you half a year, um, nine months. And then you can't not immediately after the surgery go for a pregnancy. So at least you need one and a half or two years. And then the patient is 40 years old and who knows it better than you at a pregnancy with 40 years has additional problems beside a uterine transplantation. So we set the limit at 30 years. And of course, we have to tell the recipient and also the potential father and the donor about the risk what they have. Because they think about a child and we have always to think that there could be a missed abortion, a stillborn, a preterm delivery, a small for gestational age babe, and so on. What we know so far is there is not a risk of more malformation in patients who give birth under immunosuppression. There's a big data about women who get an organ transplantation, for example, a kidney or a heart or a liver transplantation, and they get pregnant afterwards. And those children are followed up to 10 years. And we know that they don't have malformation. Of course, we don't know if they have in 30 years uh, diabetes, a risk for diabetes, for example. But we know that they don't have a risk for additional malformation. As I told you, at the beginning, um, when we started, we got more than 200 um, pairs who asked for uterine transplantation. And if you look at the um, right side, 
only about 10%, 5 to 10% of them really were eligible for uterine transplantation. So there's a really, really high dropout rate. And also, those 90% who are not eligible for uterine transplantation, we have to take care of them as well. And this is what I always tell my colleague. Those patients, we do not have to forget because they suffer from not getting pregnant. And this is why we convinced also our Ministry of Health that we said, okay, if they come to us and they suffer and we cannot offer them a uterine transplantation, we have to have to take care of them as well and to help them in any other psychological way and to show them other ways of helping them, but we need and do not forget them. We have done um, a lot of work up for the preoperative screening and the postoperative surveillance. And you have to remember, as I told you, we have the limit at, th at the age of 38 because there are many, many steps until we really have the pregnancy and hopefully a child, healthy child delivery. First, after the medical evaluation, we do a stimulation and oocyte retrieval before the uterine transplantation. Why? Because we do not take the fallopian tubes with the uterus. Because if you perform a surgery and you touch the uterus for eight hours, nine hours, the risk that there is an ectopic pregnancy or that the fallopian tube are not very good is very, very high. So this is why we removed the fallopian tubes um, when we um, took out the uterus and therefore before we need to do an IVF procedure. And the second reason for it is that we prove that this patient is really fertile because we have an MRKH syndrome. And there exists some literature that the AMH, so the ovarian, uh, ovarian reserve, is reduced in MRKH patients. So when we do then the oocyte retrieval and the IVF, we prove that they really can get pregnant because egg donation, for example, is not allowed in Germany. So there is no need to do a uterine transplantation if the patient will not get, uh, will not get pregnant due to the ovarian reserve. So then we do the transplantation, the embryo transfer, and then hopefully have a successful pregnancy. There I, I, I really skipped this because um, I don't want to tell you about a stimulation and oocyte retrieval. Um, I, if you only show the data here, um, that although the patient were very young, especially um, patient number three, you can see here, um, we needed, for example, to cycle to get enough um, um, cryopreserved um, fertilized oocytes. Um, we said we need about eight to 10 fertilized oocytes before we start uterine transplantation because you know it better than me. Our rates in Germany are not that high than yours are here. So uh, maybe we need more than one um, embryo transfer before we get a successful pregnancy. We were the first ever who published that the re-stimulation after uterine transplantation is also feasible because two of our four patients didn't have any fertilized oocytes anymore after uterine transplantation, after several embryo transfers. And then we had to say, okay, what do we do? So under immunosuppression, we can do an IVF and we can do an oocyte retrieval, although the uterus is at a different level, and although the ovaries are higher because we, um, we pack them and we attach them a bit higher because of the um, vessels which we had to attach to the iliac external arteries and veins, and we remove them from the internal, but we attach them to the external, and therefore we had to um, higher up the ovaries, but it was feasible and we have done it. So uterine transplantation is like another organ transplantation. You do an explantation, you perfuse and you remove the vessels from blood to be sure that there is no thrombus and nothing which closes the vessels and then you do the implantation. And this is the major step the, of the explantation is to explant and get enough length of the uterine 
veins. The arteries are not the problem. There is only one artery on both sides, but the vessels are the problem. Sometimes there are two veins, sometimes there are three veins, sometimes the ureter goes um, underneath and below one vein. So there are a lot of um, uh, thoughts now about taking other veins, the upper uterine vein, for example. But this is a challenge, and this is why we need about eight to 10 hours to remove the uterus. So this was one of our examples here, um, of our, one of our uterus with the arteries and the veins. And this is how it looked like just before the graft hysterectomy. So you can see there are no adhesion, and this is a very good thing about immunosuppression, because immunosuppression reduces the adhesions. So um, we have done an open surgery and put the uterus inside, and three years later, no adhesion at all. So this was a good thing. We have done the first uterine transplantation in October 2016, and we put some um, special um, clamps around the uterine artery to see that they are really working in the first four to six days. But is the transplant really working? This is something which you only know, of course, if there is a child birth. So we define three phases of evaluation of the outcome. The early surgical outcome, of course, is that there is no rejection and it's a vital organ. But that is really function is that you get a regular menstrual bleeding. And this is the exciting um, phase and day for the recipient because for the first time she really gets her bleeding. For the first time she really thinks, okay, this could work, I could really get pregnant. But of course, the proof of fertility is still needed after a successful pregnancy resulting in a birth of a healthy child. Here you can see our, our uh, four um, uterine transplantation. You can see that the first needed um, four embryo transfers until she delivered her child. All the others only needed one embryo transfer until, which was successful until they could deliver her ch child. Um, you can see here that we had um, three times a daughter and once was a sister. And what I would like to show you is that one of the mothers was postmenopausal. She was more than three years postmenopausal, but when we put the uterus back, her daughter developed a regular menstrual cycle. And this was very, very impressive also for myself. And I said, wow, we are really fascinating as a woman. So that the endometrium really starts again if you put it back to normal functional ovary and a normal functional hormonal um, recipient. Um, these are our um, pregnancy rate, and you can see that we delivered in the 36 and 37 weeks of gestation and the last two in the 34th weeks of gestation. All those babies are healthy, and the first is now six years old, which is very impressive. Um, and all they, they got always um, their examination, and they are doing very fine. So the future development is on one hand side that we really reduce the duration of uterus explantation, that we look that we can avoid the surgical risk for the donor. Of course, we only can it avoid if we do a post-mortem, a deceased donor transplantation, but we have to reduce the surgical risk and we have to maximize the organ quality and to minimize the graft failure. But the other thing is, can we expand the indication for uterine transplantation? For example, for those who have so many fibroids in their uterus that they will never ever conceive, or for those young patients who have lost their uterus due to cervical cancer. Not yet is it allowed in Germany, and there are only two worldwide who have had a cervical cancer and had got a uterine transplantation. So postmortem donation is an issue, but it's not an issue in Germany currently. There have been done a few of them. We have implemented the living donor uterine transplantation, and we have been the first 
worldwide and since now the only center worldwide who get the approval of the Ministry of Health and negotiate it with the health insurance company so they pay for this therapy in Germany. And we were the first to publish that the graft hysterectomy after uterine transplantation is possible also via minimal invasive approach. Currently, it was always performed via open surgery, but we have done it the first time with minimal invasive surgery. We had a bit of concern that we could really remove the whole tissue. Here you can see the attachment of the ligaments, but we could do it. And we were very concerned after removing of the, um, of the graft because we have seen suddenly um, here um, that we have seen something which looked like an aneurysm when we removed the vessels from the iliac external artery and vein, but it was just a stump, and we have seen um, after six months of follow-up that it's quite normal and the patient is really healthy. So the current status worldwide, just the one, the nearly last picture, is from 2021 because, as I told you, we have not performed transplantation during COVID and we were restarted again. So nearly 90 transplantations are performed so far. You can see that most of them are living donor, some of them are deceased donor, and there are already 40 healthy children born in the living donor and nine in the deceased donor cohort. And with this last video, I would like to thank you for your attention. Herzlich willkommen. Oh, der süße Erdbürger. Thank you so much. Thank you for this inspiring lecture. Um, so it gives me great pleasure again to introduce another world-renowned expert, a leader in the field, Professor Meiro from Israel. He is uh, very well known. Always. Anyways, he's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first um, live birth with ovarian tissue transplantation in a cancer patient. He's published in Science describing the burnout mechanism for or depletion of the ovarian reserve. So it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Please, Professor Mayro. Thank you very much for inviting me here. My first time here in the Gulf area. Thank you, Dr. Fatimi. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, my lecture is about where are we today with ovarian uh, tissue transplantation, and uh, I'll show our experience, if it works. Okay, so I'll talk in general on fertility preservation. What do we, why do we need it? It was discussed today by several others, but mostly for cancer patients. This was the initiation uh, to start with this, but also for gynecological patients like the endometriosis that we discussed. There are patients who have accelerated biological clock by disease, by genetic disease, like the Turner patients and the galactosemia and other diseases. And of course, there is the social uh, fertility preservation. So this is where we started. We saw oncological patients facing bone marrow transplantation, and you see that even children, very young children, after bone marrow transplantation, 80 to 90% of the patient will become totally sterile. Also, 
ovarian reserve is diminished by chemotherapy and not only by uh, losing total and the patient is sterile. The mother might think, my daughter is okay, she, she got chemotherapy, but she's menstruating. So this is an example after breast cancer. You see that after chemotherapy, ovarian reserve diminished significantly. And children that are born and treated by chemotherapy go, go into premature menopause. So we have a list of uh, medication and we consult the, uh, the patient, the oncologist and other teams coming actually from all over the country. Uh, what are the risks uh, of future fertility? And then we decide yes or no to perform fertility preservation. And this is the way our clinic works. Uh, we have several doctors in the fertility preservation center and we get the patients, we see what is the ovarian reserve of this patient and what she is facing, and according to this, it's individual assessment and consultation. And then, of course, we don't want to tell the patient you have cancer, so you will also be infertile, we have to find solution. So these are the two options that exist, and the New England Journal put it very nicely. Either we do, do outside or embryo freezing, or we do ovarian tissue freezing. These are totally different methods. You have to understand that by freezing embryo or oocytes, we take the mature oocytes. However, when we take the ovarian tissue and freeze it, it's the primordial follicles that we keep them. So this is uh, totally different, and the clinical implication of this is very important. Again, here this is the ovarian tissue with the primordial follicle, and here the mature oocytes at almost mature oocytes. So, in order to speak about uh, ovarian tissue freezing, just to oncological patients, what are the success rates of oocytes embryo freezing? It's according to the age and the number of oocytes that we cryopreserve, well known. And with oncological patients, it was published by the EV a few years ago, that because we have limited number of cycles and patient's general condition, these are the results of oncological patient that cryopreserved oocyte. About one third of the patients after treatment will go home with a baby. Can we do it on children? Well, uh, there has been publication about pickup of oocytes in children, one of them from Israel, seven years old a child with Turner syndrome. She had a mosaic and she had, was losing her ovarian reserve, she went for ovum pickup and they cryopreserved some oocytes. You have to remember this fact, that oocyte freezing in children, the genetic risks are very high, like to freeze oocytes in more than 40 years old women. These are the publications that came in Science in 2019, and you can see here the proportion of aneuploid M2 oocytes in very young children. Another problem with uh, freezing oocytes is after chemotherapy. It was published years ago uh, that we published together with uh, Donez and uh, Ginsburg and Chang from US about a uh, Oocytes, uh, freezing oocytes, stimulation cycles immediately after chemotherapy, it has a lot of genetic malformations, uh, 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 genetic uh, risks and future malformations and high risk of abortions. So in our centers for six months, we do not freeze oocytes or embryo or perform IVM to patients that received any kind of chemotherapy six months before, except methotrexates for ectopic pregnancies. So to conclude this part uh, and going to ovarian tissue, the more oocytes, uh, the better, it's uh, effective, and all we, this was discussed today. So what happens with ovarian tissue freezing? So these are the activities of our center at the uh, Shiba Medical Center in uh, Tel Aviv. And you can see here that we freeze ovarian tissue for children from the age of one year old until the age of 40. And this is the distribution of patients. The second thing, because you freeze primordial follicles and not growing follicles, you can freeze ovarian tissue for future reproduction. And I will show you the results later. And you can see that substantial number of our patients, according to the disease, had 
chemotherapy before fertility preservation procedure. And these are the numbers. We have uh, almost 800 now a day of uh, ovarian tissue freezing. 10% of the patients uh, died because of their uh, disease. And now they, we have more than 80 transplantation of ovarian tissue. There are different ways to prepare the tissue. And the size is important. We had some publication about it. What are the effects of tissue size on uh, the burnout phenomenon after transplantation? But it is also successful. These large pieces are not suitable for freezing, only for fresh transplantation. So in our center, this is the way we freeze ovarian tissue. Here is ovarian tissue for a young child with Turner disease. Uh, you can see here, maldeveloped uterus. And this is two ovaries, and we took one ovary. For children, we remove one ovary, we make ophorectomy. And these are the tissue that were stored. This is a patient. She was five years old. It was diagnosed with a Turner syndrome by amniocentesis. And when she came to us, AMH levels was normal, so we just monitored her. But when AMH started to decline, we performed fertility preservation at the age of 11. We couldn't wait until puberty. And these are the histology you can see. She had a lot of follicles at the time of freezing. Can we overcome Turner-related or genetic disease-related infertility? Worldwide, there are no publications on this. We rely on our work on cancer patients and other etiologies, not for this. Yes, there are deliveries of children that store the variant tissue and use it later on, but all of them are not by genetic indication. So our first success of transplantation of ovarian tissue was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And actually, this was the proof that this procedure works. We performed the transplantation. We got the endocrine function back. The patient was sterile. We preferred IVF. We have egg, embryo, and make on day two transfer the embryo. We got pregnancy, and this was the proof of concept. But in order to work on this technology day by day, you have to show efficacy and you need to show safety. So about uh, the technology, all our transplantation today are done uh, by a laparoscopy. This is quite an old movie, but, but you can see we create a pocket in the atrophic ovary and we just put the, the ovarian fragments that were thawed inside and thaw it. If you don't have ovary or you want to put more pieces, you can do it into a peritoneal sac. That's it. That is all what is needed. When we have small fragments of ovarian tissue, this was published two months ago in uh, the JARG journal. We use the pipel technique. We take the small pieces of the ovarian tissue, put it in the pipel, and just put it inside. And that's it. The operation is very easy. And actually, we've performed it on five patients, four of them already delivered. In Israel, IVF is free, like many other places, so we do a lot of IVF on our transplant patients. We use the, most of the cases, modified natural cycle, but when we have good uh, endocrine function, we do conventional antagonist uh, stimulation. And you can see here sonography of a graft that was functioning after transplantation, and you can see the endometrial leaning. So according to endocrine function and sonography, we decide which uh, way to go. But many of our patients conceive spontaneously as well. So what are the success rates of this technology? These are some publications that were published from different places all over the world. This is a meta-analysis, but 
Uh, you can see here from the Denmark group, very active group, one third of the patient conceived, and the, from the 30 protect in Germany, 25% of the patient conceived, and similar results come also from Belgium, from the group of uh, uh, Dolmans. This is our publications that uh, were performed and were published in Fertility Sterility not long time ago, and these are the patients that uh, were the indicated. So Hodgkin lymphoma, not Hodgkin lymphoma, leukemia patient, which is very important, uh, we'll talk about it later, breast cancer, etc. And we gathered patients from Free Center, our center, the Belgium Center, and Sherman Silver in the uh, United States. But the majority of the patients more than half were from our group. And this is the success rate. Of 60 patients that underwent 76 transplantation, almost 95% resumption of endocrine function, which is unbelievable. 50% of the patients conceived, and 41.6% of the patients went home with at least one baby. In addition, we had prolonged endocrine function, prolonged fertility, and repeated pregnancies. Just to show you, this was published in, the new, uh, in Israel News uh, three months ago, a family totally created by ovarian tissue transplantation, four babies. And this is another family with uh, four pregnancies. So repeated pregnancy and delayed menopause. What about previous exposure to chemotherapy? So you can see here we, in our publication in Fertility Sterility, we, we looked at the patients that received chemotherapy prior to ovarian tissue freezing and those who did not. And you can see here, menses recurrence, no effect. At least one pregnancy, no effect. At least one live birth, no effect. So we use this in order to make our transplantation more safe, as I will show it later. So the advantages is that we store large number of premodal follicle. It's a fast fertility preservation procedure. It is well adapted to children, and it can be performed after initiation of a chemotherapy. And during the procedure, on many occasions, we can also recover M2O sites for fertilization or for freezing. But it's invasive. True, minor surgery, but it's invasive. It's not economic. We lose a lot of primordial follicle. Nevertheless, it functions for a long time. And here is the risk of cancer cells that I will talk now. So about safety issue. We show that it's effective. Now about the safety issue. We already discussed it. This is the first publication in the world in fertility sterility describing the technology of ovarian tissue freezing in cancer patients. It was ours. It was in 96. And then we collected evidence searching for cancer cells in the ovarian tissue, and it's quite a big issue today. And you can see here that diseases that have really the risk of leukemia cells, of not Hodgkin lymphoma cells in the ovarian tissue. And this, actually, you make transplantation from sick patient into healthy patient, which is something that it's not usually performed. So we have to take care of this. So first, we adapted to what we showed before. We perform ovarian tissue freezing, for example, in leukemia patient, after first-line chemotherapy, only after they are in remission, before high-dose chemotherapy. And as I showed, it doesn't lose effectiveness, but it increases safety because at this time, minimal residual disease in the peripheral blood and the bone marrow is zero. In addition, we have a special lab that looks for cancer cells in the ovarian tissue just prior to transplantation. We throw one piece of ovarian tissue and we make all the tests according to the disease. It's patient tailored, and we look for histology, we do fish, we do real-time PCR, and for high-risk patient, we transplant pieces of ovarian tissue into skid mice for six months. And only when all those tests are negative, then we perform the transplantation. And actually, this is the first patient in the world, also published in Fertility Sterility, 
that conceived and had a child after transplantation of ovarian tissue in leukemia patient. When this was published, she had a second baby, and actually she delivered the third time, and now she is under treatment for her fourth child after second transplantation. But sometimes we found cancer in the ovarian tissue, and then transplantation is not performed. This is a ALL patient, acute lymphocytic leukemia, and we perform the test, and with the marker, we look for a marker, a specific marker, and it was positive in this patient, so this patient could not go for transplantation. These are the patients until now that we discovered disease in the ovarian tissue, but this also gave us the other table that is not here for the patient that we did not find a cancer cells. But this, you can see here, these are, these are leukemias that were positive for cancer cells and transplantation was not performed. So this, this I can skip. So this is the activity of our center. You, you see it's a very big uh, center. We have more than 1,100 consultations annually with uh, sonographies as well. We freeze ovarian tissue around 70 to 80 annually, and also we do IVF. It's, I was asked if we do all, only ovarian tissue. Of course not. We, we have the tools of both tools in hand. We are professional in IVF, so we do either IVF for fertility preservation or ovarian tissue freezing, and we look for the MRD. So this is a case for last week. A, a girl, eight years old, came from Ghana. She was operated in St. Jude Hospital in the United States, and she came for fertility preservation. And I have to admit that all this issue is very stressful for a children and the family, and uh, we created a way to reduce the stress together with the uh, psychiatric, pediatric psychiatry de department, and it's in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. I will start with the Arabic version. <laughs> Okay, can you put it forward? If you have just been given a diagnosis of cancer, I'm sure you must have received a lot of information about your medical treatment on your way to recovery. Some of the information is also related to the process of fertility preservation. I'm sure a lot of thoughts, questions, and concerns are coming up now. So let's start from the beginning. Make sure your parents are near you, and there is enough silence so you can hear, and we will explain everything. All along the way, you and your parents can ask the medical staff any questions you have. So what is fertility preservation? Fertility preservation is the medical procedure that children who receive chemotherapy or radiation undergo. In order to have the possibility that one day as adults, you will be able to have children, if you want, of course. The ovaries are here in the lower part of the abdomen, which contains a lot of healthy eggs that can be damaged by the treatment, usually given to cancer. The purpose of a fertility preservation procedure is to collect, keep, and protect the eggs so that they will not be damaged by the chemotherapy treatment. Many parents think that their daughter is too young to understand what the fertility preservation procedure means, or that it is not suitable for them due to her young age. However, it is important to know the ability to have children depends on the egg stock that is already there from the day we are born. The decision regarding the need for fertility preservation and which medical procedure is suitable for each patient is made by the fertility preservation team and the oncology team treating you. And it depends on your gender, your age, and the type of treatment you are expected to receive. At the first step, you will meet the medical staff at the clinic who are experts in the subject, who will explain what you were expected to go through. After the first conversation with the doctor, you will meet the nurse, who will help you start the process, and will describe exactly where you will be hospitalized, what is expected, and what you were about to go through, and you will be scheduled for the day of the procedure. 
Since the ovaries are inside the abdominal cavity, we will perform a procedure called laparoscopy, in which a sample is taken, it means a part of the ovary is removed. The ovary samples that are removed are frozen at an extremely low temperature so that they can be preserved for many years until you need them again. Then you will meet an anesthesiologist and a surgeon. Okay, uh, it continues to all the process. And we are performing fertility preservation hands-on courses. Actually, now updated is 18. Some of them on the web, most of them inside, mostly before the, the corona. And it's a huge team involved in this procedure. And this is the Shiba Medical Center. And this is the fertility preservation and IVF team, my research lab, the Cancer Research Center, and the Pathology Institute. Thank you very much. So after we had now a couple of uh, surgical presentations, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our team. So it's Raquel Del Gallego. She is um, graduated in biological sciences and has a master degree in biotechnology of human reproduction. She is about to finish her PhD in artificial intelligence. For our team, let's say she is the queen of our data and all our research would be uh, extremely more difficult without her support. So she already is also co-author of 40 publications and with her help we are increasing our research and our, hopefully our publications and now she will present on artificial intelligence. So she's setting up an artificial intelligence system for our clinic. Please, Raquel. Thank you very much, Dr. Barbara, for the very kind introduction. Uh, okay, so today, as Dr. Barbara said, we are implementing in ART a new AI program. So I've talked about this topic many times, but I'm going to give it a new perspective out of it, like how are we going to implement this into our daily routine and how are we going to work with it. And the first thing is what application does AI have in ART? So where could it help us? And the two main groups would be for automation and for prediction. They are both very interconnected, however, yes, they are very interconnected, however, automation, I would say, is more to help us as clinicians and professionals in the field because it will help us to standardize techniques, to help us classify or grade things, and to make uh, decision-making processes with more information. And in the other side, for prediction, it will help more the patients, but of course also us, because it will tell them how uh, soon are they going to get pregnant and what's their probabilities of their outcome. So what are the specific questions that we have to ask, answer in these two main groups? In the first one, automation, and we've been going through many of these questions today, uh, we can start with which stimulation protocol should we use? which medication and dosage for a specific patients, which is this the right hormonal balance for them, uh, when should we trigger, when is the right time for this, what fertilization technique should I use, AV, uh, IVF, sorry, ICSI, which uh, sperm should I choose from all of them, what's the highest grade embryo that will lead to a successful implantation, when do we biopsy, what's the endometrial protocol that I should use for this patient, and when do we transfer? These are all outputs. And if we go to the other one, to prediction, we can see how is my treatment going to perform? How many cycles, uh, ovarian stimulations, do I need to do with this patient so that she can get a life born? How many COCs or M2s will I obtain? How many oocytes do I need to freeze for a fertility preservation program? How many blastocysts, in particular euploid, will I get? How many transfers should I have for this patient? Will she implant? Will she miscarry? Should we have ongoing pregnancy? And what's the time to live birth? So all of these are outputs. All of these answers to these questions are the outputs that we train our model with. And of course, we need first to have the inputs. So for the inputs, we have years of data and more in ART, we have a thousand data points of, for example, pre-stimulation, like patient characteristics, 
And of course, in these categories, we have the ones that the patient come with. We cannot change many of them. And also, we have some of them that are a bit more variable depending on the laboratory. But we will go through that. Then the stimulation ones, that these are more variable and it depends on the professional performing it, what's the protocol, medication, dose, everything we're going to use. Uh, we have also the implantation or the endometrial preparation treatment. And of course, my topic embryology, the laboratory parameters, which we have a million different ways of doing things. And since I moved to the UAE, I had the opportunity to see how differently all the labs work here. And we all believe in the way we are working and we'll trust our ways, so this can be very variable. And of course, now upcoming new data sources, there are thousands of them. The ones we are more familiar with are PGT data and morphokinetics for sure. But there's a million new ways of seeing how good an embryo is. And they are some of them more experimental, some of them more standard, but Still, nowadays, there's no one that we can really implement into our lab settings and that will be easy enough to use in our normal workflow. So all of these big data, there's no other way that to analyze it than with artificial intelligence and with these models. So what are our main challenges? First one, I would say, and main one is bias. bias. Now I'm going to talk about bias in general in global data sets. So I have two examples. The first one was a deep neural network system that they developed to identify with images melanoma in patients. And this is a very, very nicely developed uh, artificial intelligence because they could uh, identify melanoma in a 20% better than the doctors were doing because this is very difficult to really see in the spots of the skin uh, if it's really cancer or not. But the problem with this database it does that what they did is that they took this model to a hospital in Uganda and they realized that they were only doing 20% right uh, predictions of melanoma in the patients. And they went back into the training data set and they had only trained it with a 5% of black skin or black people uh, melanomas. So, of course, this model is not going to be able to identify this. And this is a big bias in the data set. And in fact, uh, black patients have the highest mortality rate for melanoma. So if we are going to develop an AI system, we should really understand what's our, our population in need for this. Because in fact, the five-year survival rate for black patients is only 70%, and for white patients is a 94%. So we should really know who are we targeting. This other example I already gave before, but I, I really like it, and it's very, uh, we can explain very well the bias, because they used x-rays uh, for also detecting cancer, and they wanted to see uh, in two big hospitals if they could train a model to identify them. So the first hospital gave less amount of images, and if you can see, there were way more positive uh, positives than negatives. However, the other one had a bigger data set, and more or less it was a bit more equal, I would say a little bit more of negatives. So the AI model was trained, and they realized afterwards that it was not predicting properly. And when they went back, they realized that if you see these images from this first hospital, the chest is way more close the image, and there's less black blackness in the in the picture and this one has way more black it's a bit more far away so what the system learned to do was that if the image was close and white it's a positive cancer and if the image was far away and dark it would be a negative and of course this is because of the bias and for this there's many ways of standardized imaging and doing this but we really need to be aware of it and how this translates to us, to the Middle East, for example, uh, we've been seeing throughout all day that we have a very specific population here. And uh, it's been widely published uh, that we have a big rate of consanguinity, obesity, vitamin D deficiency, and very poor ovarian uh, reserve. So if we want to develop a model on these characteristics on, of our patients, which are like a 90% of our patients, we should really take into account if a patient is not from these characteristics, maybe the model is not predicting properly for them. 
So we should really take this minority population of uh, in any other nationality or regions and see if they are really balanced, if we have equal uh, positive pregnancies and negative pregnancies, and if it's any bias to see if we could use it on them. But of course, as I say, 90% of our patients are from this, uh, like, local. So in the end, it will uh, help us with our 90% of our patients. Another main challenge is which data do we input into the model? And uh, for training nowadays, uh, each person, like each group is doing it in a different way. And there's no standards in AI because it's very uh, innovative and new topic. But for example, there's groups using the blastocyst quality uh, as they want to predict it automatically. And there's groups using the morphokinetics, of, of the morphokinetics that we annotate as embryologists. And the problems with these two is that blastocyst quality and morphokinetics are still uh, linked to some bias or subjectiveness by us, the embryologists. And this has been widely published in many, many papers. Uh, we can see that uh, there is inter- and intra-laboratory disagreement of variability between technicians, which makes totally sense. And in fact, it's a bit warning because in this paper, they realized that two very experienced embryologists uh, doing uh, an analysis of 99 blastocysts, they checked that in 55, in 55 cases, sorry, uh, you can see them in green, uh, both embryologists agreed on the score of this blasto. However, in 37 of them, they didn't agree which are the yellows, and in six cases, which are the alarming ones, which are the reds, they realized that one of the embryologists wanted to freeze, uh, transfer, or biopsy the embryo, and the other one wanted to discard it. So, of course, this is going to make a difference on the patient's uh, future and decision, and we should really take care of this. And, of course, this is because we are a bit limited in the way we are doing this classification nowadays. And we are still depending on the typical categorical classification from Acevir or Gardner. And these are categorical variables. They are not continuous. So there's no clear boundaries between A and B and B and C, and they are very subjective still. And as well, uh, we compare a lot within embryos inside the same cohort. So if the first one was very good, we will see the second one as not that good when maybe it was more or less the same uh, category. As well, uh, we are limited to the way we, th we see things. And if we have a 2D image and it's uh, uh, the inner cell mass, for example, is in the down part of the image, if we are not allowed or able to move it around, it will be very difficult for us to see it if we cannot move the focal plane. And it also makes a big difference if we have static or dynamic images. If we can see the full development uh, or we can see only one time point. And this happens a lot in our lab, for example, we, like, we were commenting that sometimes an embryo looks really bad and in a couple of hours, an A embryo, it's a very good looking one. So stand, uh, evaluation time is not standardized. We shouldn't set a time to evaluate embryos. It should be more continuous. And also, uh, there are some parameters that are very difficult to do uh, as, uh, as humans, like uh, volume or number of cells in the trophectoderm exactly. These maybe the machines could help us a bit better. And also, of course, the human factor affects a lot. Uh, sometimes if we have a bad day or even the weather or uh, stress, fatigue, even our personality will make a difference if we are grading an embryo as higher quality or lower quality. And this is a, I, I understood it was a very interesting question. It was published this year in ESRE last uh, summer. And uh, what they wanted to see is, as embryologists, are we biased to select for transfer or earlier wells, like lower number wells in the dish as the best embryo rather than the latest wells? So should we, like, would we use uh, an embryo in one, two, three, four more rather than a nine, 10, 11, 12, for example? And uh, they found that there was bias on this. 
And I find this super interesting. The study still had a little bit of flaws because they corrected for the number of embryos inside the well because, of course, some uh, patients might have only five embryos and some of them can complete the full, uh, the full dish. And as well, maybe some of the laboratories they were working with were already doing a classification of the oocytes they were injecting, so maybe they were injecting the best looking oocytes in the beginning. So I think this should be uh, checked afterwards. So what everyone has uh, concluded by this is that we will use images. If, if we use uh, blastocyst quality and it's going to be subjective or morphokinetics and it's going to be subjective, let's use images because the images, it is what it is. Uh, this is the embryo, this is its development and we can train the model on this. It's the most objective way. But of course, it also has subjectivity in it because some people are still using static, static images when the ideal would be using the dynamic video. And as you can see, there's uh, way more papers using static images published up to now. And any, like all of them are working in a very different way. Some of them are using 115 hours after ICSI, 120, sorry, another completely different ways of working. So if we do 115, for example, we will completely forget about the day six, and maybe this is not the right approach for it. And this is a very, very interesting publication uh, this last year, and they were saying, uh, should we use a static image uh, to do the artificial intelligence model? But the area under the curve they were obtaining only with a static image was very low. Then when they introduced the video only of the blastocyst stage, it was increasing. Then they in introduced as well the cleavage stage, the age, the morphokinetics, and finally what they did was they put all the video in, they checked the model, and the model was telling them this part of the video or this time of the video is giving me a lot of information or this part here is giving me a lot of information, but the middle is not giving much, it's not uh, giving us much predictive value. So they were selecting only the times that the model was deciding as predictive, and in fact, they, they could obtain a very high uh, area under the curve. You can see it represented here. And of course, there's way more things as the X-ray example before to be standardized. Some of the, them are doing segmentation, and it's to train the model to see where things are. Some people say this is not a good technique. We should let the model decide what to see. It, there's a lot of variability, really. We have to put the images. If they are coming from different time lapse, we should put in the same, uh, in the same colors, in the same hom uh, homogeneous brightness and everything. And also, for example, now the embryoscope has a smaller well than the Getty. We should standardize on all of these matters. And as well, this out of the well. So this is a very good paper, actually. Uh, this is one of the best papers I've read. And in fact, uh, they are the only ones <laughs> or very few ones that really explain the artificial intelligence model. How did they perform it? They really go into the materials and methods. You can really see there's a good data uh, team behind it. And the most interesting part about it when you read it is that they use all of the different object images you can imagine, even dogs and mouse and uh, apples, everything you can imagine to train the model first. And then they use our blastocyst images afterwards. And uh, they were seeing that it was predicting well. It's this way of doing things is just to give the, the artificial intelligence model like a very robust base to start training so that he gets used to images, pixels, and the way and, uh, like animals or everything look. So now we go to the clinical data. Clinical data is really important, and this is also a flow of many studies. They have only started with imaging. Of course, it's the very early stage, so this can be developed. But many uh, studies are saying now that as we add clinical data, like for example, age that we know it's super important parameter, or clinical practice, models start developing like better predictions. And uh, like for example, this one. And uh, as well, there are so many 
inputs of clinical data that we can work with. Uh, of course, suggestion is that we should always start with the most objective uh, inputs that could be possibly what the patient comes with from home, like for example, the AIDS, BMI, these things we cannot change, is reality of this patient. Uh, and then move forward into more subjective uh, variables that maybe could be biased by our own team or, for example, AMH, uh, Dr. Laura Melado was also explaining that depending on the assay that we are using, it could be better or worse. Uh, so this should be taken all into consideration to see if our uh, database is homogeneous and standardized. And we shouldn't be afraid of it, because we always can open the black box. Uh, it's the good part about it. We can just put everything into the AI model and then open it and see what it's he selecting. Is he using this? Is he using that? Does he like this parameter more than this other? And then if he likes a parameter that maybe we are not that sure if it's the right way to predict it, we can always go to the data set and see was it biased? Do I have a lot of data points missing? And go more into deep. So benefits and opportunities out of it. We can simultaneously evaluate massive amount of data. We can increase the number of parameters out of it, and it will save us a lot of time. And it will improve our clinic workflow. We can increase as well the subjectivity that we will, standard, we will be able to standardize the way we do the techniques as professionals, and we will increase as well the reproducibility between the centers. Uh, we will be able to maybe find, hopefully, new parameters that are associated with infertility, and at least we will be able to increase the accuracy and the precision of our predictions, hoping for better decision-making process, to reduce the time to live birth and our target goal of single embryo transfer as a gold standard. And only a comment about the novel parameters associated with fertility. I have this fun video. They created an AI model to play tic-tac-toe with us. And um, the problem with humans is we are biased with what we want to see. If we're looking for something, we will find it. So when they were training this model, they realized that it was thinking out of the box, fully. And, uh, and sometimes well, thinking out of the box is good, even if it makes errors. <laughs> so maybe the AI model can see these new parameters that we were looking for and uh, new things that we didn't expect. Because of course, as humans, we are limited to the parameters that we are experienced with and we, we've been trained on. But of course, and this is the question I always get asked, are they going to replace us? And of course not. Uh, artificial intelligence is still a very young field, uh, and it's giving its baby steps. And of course, even if it grows way bigger than it will be, uh, it's very impossible to train an AI model in all of the images we see throughout our lives, and all of the experiences as humans that we have throughout our lives. And, um, and we also have one thing that is called intuition. And this, this cannot be trained. So, of course, uh, they will never replace us. They will only help us to become better clinicians and embryologists. And we will always be there to perform the interpretation and the analysis of what they predict. We should always be there as a checkup that they are working fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Um, it was a, you know, like, Carl Engage inspiring session. So as we're running late, you know, we'd like to take one question each speaker and perhaps even skip the coffee break and just continue with the next session. So if anyone would like to get some coffee or cookies, you, know, you can do now. And yes, looking forward to questions and comments, please. Would you come closer? I mean, can we have the mic, please? And would you please you know, address the speaker who you were asking for?
Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for all lectures. And I have one question. Uh, why do you want to expose the ladies after uh, uterus transplantation, after, you fin after she finished with two pregnancies? You expose her to another surgery, which is total surgery, to remove the uterus. Why you don't keep her as any other lady with the regular follow-up? Yeah, thank you very much. It's because we want to stop the immunosuppression therapy. Because longer in life you have the immunosuppression therapy, the more you get the risk of damage, for example, of the kidney. Because um, they affect other organs, especially the kidney, and there is no use anymore um, for keeping the uterus, but we want to minimize the risk of a prolonged immunotherapy. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Sure. So first of all, thank you all speakers. Um, I have a question for Dr. Vatier. You know that when I was in Brussels, Jacques Tournay was promoting the idea of a second look surgery for endometriosis. So in order to not to damage the ovary, because obviously we say a cystectomy, but an endometrioma, we know it's not a cyst, because if you start operating, you don't have any cleavage area, so you just peel it off, you coagulate, you damage the ovary, and so on. So Jacques Donnet came up with the idea that initially you open the endometrioma, you just aspirate it, you suppress the patient, and after three months, you do a second look laparoscopy, and you just coagulate those areas which might be still active. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, you, you, you make me younger. So, I mean, <laughs> it was the fight between the Belgian team and the team of the French team, uh, cystectomy against the, the so-called three-step technique, so drainage, suppression, and second look. Uh, I think the, the cystectomy won at the end uh, with better results in terms, even in terms, uh, finally, uh, same result in terms of baby taken home and and less result, enfin, less recurrence, so less iterative surgery. Uh, now it become, it become again, uh, I, th I think the, con the, the, the concept, that's why we prefer to, the concept to do three steps is a, bit, uh, is a bit heavy. So we prefer to, that's why we try sclerotherapy, for example, we do it in once. So we don't do cystectomy, but we try already to burn the pseudocystic wall, I don't want to go in detail, to not come back. And so I think this, probably this is the only way to see the situation. I think the, the, the idea of, Don of Donetsk is, is driven by very good ID, but I think the technique is wrong. This is my impression. So I, I'm curious, I would like to ask for Mayrov a question. So you mentioned that fertility preservation in patients with Turner syndrome. So you froze the eggs very early, so to enable those girls later on to, to have a pregnancy. Now, I mean, I've read reports that uh, those patients are of a high risk regarding developing a lot of complications during pregnancy, like aneurysms, that they are really high risk pregnancies. So I would just like to know about your experience, whether you retransplanted ovarian tissue in Turner patients. As I mentioned, we did not transplant the ovarian tissue in Turner patients, so we don't know the results. Yes, uh, we know about the risk of pregnancy-related uh, problem with Turner syndrome, coarctation of aorta, and, and other complications. Uh, nevertheless, at this stage, uh, the parents mostly wants to give them the hope, uh, and and then it will they can deal with it uh, later later on. Many ways to, to solve it, but if you don't store now, there will be nothing to deal with afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Yes, yes. if there are no... Uh, no. Uh, thank you. I have a question uh, to Professor Dro regarding uh, updates uh, about nucleus transfer. You don't do it. But any, any updates in... Any idea, Professor Fatim? Nothing? Good. If there are no questions, I have a question for Raquel. Sure. Uh, I will ask a question, maybe you can follow. So, Raquel, 
the problem with AI is you are feeding data and you retrieve information out of the data you are feeding. But this is not a holistic approach because, for example, people are looking to the embryo dynamics. They look to the division pattern of the embryo, decide what is the best embryo to be put back. They completely neglect the stimulation. They neglect how this patient was stimulated. They also don't look to the cycle pattern, the endometrial preparation, and so on. Don't you think it's time to have a more holistic approach in AI? Because you see, an embryologist is looking to the embryology. A clinician is looking to the endometrium, whatever. But we miss a holistic approach, and maybe that should be the next step to go forward to. I, I fully agree. And in fact, uh, there's no studies that I know of that include stimulation into these images and so on. And um, this is one of the things that I love the most about ART, is that we are very mixed up. Stimulation, clinicians, embryologists, we are talking on a daily basis. Uh, but this is not the case everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, still, uh, there's a lot to work on to put us together. But definitely, the other problem I would say about it is data. How clean is the data that we are training our models with? And how uh, not biased it is. And it's very difficult to get a full uh, stimulation protocol, uh, doses, medications that is not biased and that it's clean. So that's why it's taking longer in stimulation models and so on, because it's uh, very tricky. There's a lot of bias. And uh, as we are seeing in other studies, there's a lot to clean. So that's why it's taking longer. But of course, that would be the ideal to go to the future. Uh, question for Professor Arnaud. Just to bring you back to your real age. <laughs> uh, what do you mean real, uh, exactly by economical? Or how do you do economical radical specialized center? I mean, some contradict economy and radicality. Can you please explain it a little bit? I, I, I... I don't know if I can explain, I can give you an example. Um, for example, you, you, the only subject on deep endo we still discuss between surgeons is the bowel. We don't discuss the ureter, we don't discuss the bladder, we don't discuss the peritoneum implants, we all, all, almost not discuss the endometrioma, we discuss the bowel. Why? Because we are gynecologists and we are lacking competences. Okay? So, what we have done for a very long period, we were calling the colorectal surgeon that they were doing what they, they learned, which is a total mesenteric excision of the, meso, enfin, the sigmoid and the rectum. So they were removing 25 centimeters of sigmoid for a nodule, which is three. And so they were di dissecting the left angle, they were removing this long part, and they were doing an illostomy. So we learned. So we learned not only the competence, but the anatomy, etc. And we understood that, as I say, there is, no, uh, there is no safety margin. So if you have a nodule of three, you remove three. So you are radical and you are economical. And so if you compare groups, so now a patient, if you take the team of Dara in Paris, they got a huge bowel dysfunction post-op, and if you, can, if you look the actual result, we have no bowel dysfunction, and we have the same radicality. So we are semely radical and more economical, but the price to pay is to be a little bit more knowledgeable. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'd like to thank to all the speakers for inspiring lectures and everyone for attendance and questions and comments, and we'll conclude the session to continue seamlessly with the next one. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Yes, exactly, as Dr. Barry said, um, of course there is coffee available, so if you do want to pop outside, you can do. So we're gonna move on to the last session of the day. We obviously have dif uh, different chairpersons for this as well, however, we are looking for one of them. <laughs> He's out in the foyer somewhere. So if I can introduce, please, Professor Kazim Nouri. He's the Country Medical Director of TFP Austria, President of the Austria Society of 
sterility, fertility, and endocrinology, and he is affiliated to the Medical University of Vienna. So, Dr. Kazim, thank you. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, and I really want to thank the organizer, especially Professor Fatemi, to put together such a high-level scientific program. And without any further ado, I want to ask the first speaker to come, Professor Chung. Everybody who goes to international congresses knows her because of her all lectures, and I don't know if she's here, oh, she's here, I am seeing her. To talk about her will take a long time, but make the long story short, she's a professor of reproductive medicine at the University of Southampton, medical director of complete uh, fertility, and of course, author than more than 100 publications. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the um, kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very lucky to escape the very cold and dark winter in the UK, albeit only for a weekend. Um, so let me just figure out. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is about sensing what's happening in the uterus. Three things I would like to touch on. Um, firstly, to point out the knowledge gap that we have in this area. Secondly, to explore the biosensor landscape. And then last of all, uh, to uh, describe a few challenges and possible solutions that may be for us uh, that we face in the future. And of course, I will ask, I think, more questions than answers. Um, we all know this, uh, we, we have a, a sort of a gap between the number of cycles we start and the uh, success rate. I see that here we do a lot better, and I should imp increase that success rate there, but still there's a gap. And so the question is, how do we address that? Um, furthermore, uh, you know, those of you who, uh, you know, do obstetrics, gynecology, uh, we all know that there is a problem in terms of uh, early and later pregnancy complications. And these are very common. You walk into the labor ward, they happen day in, day out. This is most likely due to the limited understanding of the pathophysiology that we have, particularly of the in utero environment. And let's look at the current methods of monitoring that we have uh, for the uterus, uh, a very important organ that we all, at one stage or another, uh, came from. Yeah? Um, we have basic things like ultrasound, hysteroscopy, throw in a laparoscopy, take in a biopsy, maybe a bit of fluid, maybe some microbiome perhaps, but the limitation is that it, they're snapshot. They're snapshot, uh, they don't account for cycle to cycle variability. We don't know what, uh, you know, uh, we don't have any continuous data. It doesn't provide any global uh, view of the uh, uterine environment. So, ladies and gentlemen, if only we can accurately sense the environment in which we all put the embryos into. We can then start to personalize treatment in that aspect. So what is a biosensor? Well, essentially a biosensor is, it has a biocatalyst that detects, uh, you know, uh, what uh, the signals that is in the environment, and then it transmits that into something we can read, uh, an external signal. 
And this uh, schematic gives us a, a better uh, uh, understanding of it. You have your analyte, it could be enzymes, it could be antibodies, you have your receptors, transducer, either optical or uh, something similar, it could be temperature related, and then you have a signal output. That's essentially what biosensors are. And if you look at something as a biosensor that is really quite, um, uh, you know, uh, well used now, which is the glucose biosensor, it actually has a history of over 60 years, um, starting right from, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, mid 90s, all the way to the current um, development of wearables um, platforms that we are starting to see. Um, some of the advanced wearable biosensor uh, platforms are here, um, and they are, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, being trialed. As, uh, n uh, you know, there's very limited ones on the market just yet, but I'm sure, it, you know, in due course, we will be seeing them out there. I mean, it, anything from dentistry, uh, sensor on the tooth, a mouth guard, a tattoo, tattoo that changes color, that when it detects glucose or lactate or change of pH, um, and it's something that detects sweat, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, more and more you're seeing that these are combined so that um, eventually they are also integrated into electronic uh, platforms to aid the clinicians uh, and even the patient themselves uh, about their um, their own uh, medical condition. Uh, for those of you who are interested, of course, the biosensor market is actually big um, and it's growing. It's estimated to reach over uh, 40 billion, uh, you know, in the latter part of this decade. Let's talk about the actual biosensing within the uterus. When we talk about biosensing, what do we mean? Well. There could be two aspects to make it simple. The first is to sense perhaps the environment uh, directly with fluids and so on, talk about hormones, talk about enzymes, talk about uh, transcripts, whatever that we, you, we can find in the uh, uterine uh, cavity. And then of course you can also be talking about the biophysical profile which, um, which I, I have a particular interest in. Now. Um, if you look at the biofluids, um, as, as I said before, that, that these are, uh, are some of the markers, or surrogate markers, or perhaps diseases. And if you look at the biophysical profile, you have your oxygen, temperature, pH, uh, contractility, and so on. There, there are actually very limited data around biofluid sensing. Um, these are some examples of papers that have been published. People have used abdomens to detect different types of chemicals, hormones within the uh, 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 biofluid or uterine fluid, but, but these are really early stage work and uh, really very little clinical uh, translational uh, material at all at the moment. Um, but if we look at the uh, biophysical profile, but of course we all know and we've been talking about, you know, uh, how important it is to uh, manage the processes properly within the uh, IVF laboratory to keep it um, uh, sort of uh, all controlled so that there's no detrimental impact. Because we know that if uh, some of these factors, environmental factors are affected, we see bad development in the embryo. Uh, and this is well known, of course, uh, for all of us. And also the surgeons amongst us, with gynecologists, we know that when you put a hysteroscope in, in an abnormal uterus, again, I mean, that uterus cannot have a normal uh, biophysical uh, profile um, because it's grossly abnormal. For example, your severe adhesions, a huge fibroid, so on and so on. But of course, we also see apparently normal uterus in people that just repeatedly would not implant. There's a question, of course, uh, been uh, brought about, uh, discussed by Ka Robert Casper a number of years back, about the question around thin endometrium or thick endometrium or, you know, normal appropriate thickness endometrium. But, but it could be that there is a 
impact of the diffusion of oxygen, for example, into the uh, uterine cavity that's influencing development. So the questions are numerous, right? How, what is the impact of altered anatomy, vascularity, lymphatics, tissue density, uh, micro, microbiota, and so on, and even fluid in the endometrium we see it? How does that affect the biophysical profile of the intrauterine environment and therefore the subsequent impact of reproductive outcome. Our problem is we know if the condition is good, huh, um, everything's normal. We know if there's disease, things don't get normal. But there's a whole range of a gradient in between that we call biological gradient. When do we intervene? What is happening from the good to the bad, surely it's not a black and white line. How much do we know about the in vivo uterine environment? Um, in all honesty, very little, but here's some uh, data that we uh, have uh, systematically reviewed, and mostly they are uh, mouse data, very little human data. Um, and you know, if you're looking at oxygen tension here, uh, we, we observe in the literature it's been reported to be cyclical, um, and uh, we don't understand why it's cyclical, but uh, it could be due to various different physiological reasons. And also there's been reporting of uh, oscillation of these biorhythms of oxygen. Uh, if we look at pathology in terms of dissolved oxygen, and there's very little described. I mean, we found one paper and uh, really, really quite poor data. But you could see that there is indeed uh, and have been reported a, a, a variation of a range of oxygen. And if you look at pH, the lighter pink versus the darker uh, purple, uh, you see a gradation of pH from even in the reproductive tract through to the, uh, from the vagina through to the fallopian tube. And in terms of the uterus, this is probably the well, most well studied because temperature can be measured externally. Uh, we know and we understand it's diurnal, cyclical, increases in the luteal phase, it's lower in the morning of the day. So what are some of the current strategies that people can use to try to overcome um, perhaps some of these issues that I have just raised. So one of the interesting development uh, over the number of years, and now currently certainly uh, a com a commercial uh, available, is a, a device called um, uh, in vivo culture system, an in vivo device. And certainly uh, there has been some clinical data um, about this, and essentially what this device does is it's co uh, the, the gametes is uh, cultured within the device and the embryos develop and it's actually put, placed in the woman's uterus so that the development can happen there in the natural environment. But of course, if you're talking about an abnormal environment, then it certainly doesn't work because then you're putting it back in an abnormal environment. Um, then of course, people have successfully cultured embryos 14 days, you know, but clearly, this is early days for that, and of course, the impact of development of the embryo, if it was cultured even further, uh, is totally unknown. So a little bit way off. And then if you look from the other aspects and try to resolve the issue of prematurity, people, of course, also have uh, quite successfully, in terms of experimental model, uh, maintain um, a premature uh, animal uh, in an incubator, but of course there are inherent problems that they encounter uh, which uh, has not been resolved. So a little bit way off. And of course if you take temperature, uh, you can only have a look at the temperature from the outside and you, you, uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, se selecting the um, uh, all sides um, and external imaging. Now, this is a system that we've been working on for quite a number of years now, um, and it's a preconception, so you're using it before uh, the uh, tr uh, treatment um, or before you know, a, a conception cycle, um, batteryless, wireless system uh, that we can put inside the uterus that is inert and it's uh, miniaturized to uh, detect uh, the various different biophysical profiles that we 
uh, that I've described earlier. And the data can then be beamed to an electronic system. The early studies are shown here. Um, the top graph shows um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the temperature difference, uh, variation, the diurnal variation, and the bottom uh, figure was a human proof of concept study uh, a number of years back for three days. Um, subsequently, uh, we have also conducted um, study on all the sensors uh, on the rabbits. And again, you can see that our um, uh, variability within the uh, time frame that is being uh, uh, that, that, that the rabbit has a sensor in um, and uh, and this is in the three parameters temperature pH and uh, oxygen um, so uh, over the COVID period things have not obviously moved on as much as we want but uh, we have now completed the first uh, in woman uh, uh, study on the, our sensor device uh, that is then placed in the uterus for th uh, seven days, so it's a whole week. Um, the study, the first study is a safety and feasibility study uh, on a, a small number of uh, women uh, with a range of fertility, uh, in, uh, subfertility uh, diagnosis. And uh, again, we can see that uh, variation in temperature is expected, but it's interesting to observe, and certainly we cannot conclude much, but you can see that there's some women have temperatures way above what we uh, think they should be varying in. And they're not ill, they do not have, uh, they do not have um, uh, fever or anything like that, but uh, the temperature range is definitely um, out of the what is expected. Then, of course, our oxygen and uh, pH and temperature data uh, are also now available uh, and certainly also demonstrates peak and troughs outside this range for some women. And, of course, there is now an ongoing multicenter trials. Uh, uh, and if, if, if you are interested in, in knowing about this device, um, I have put an email there for uh, the, the company email for you to email if you like to know a little bit more. Um, but due to commercial sensitivity, unfortunately, I'm not able to produce the data in detail here. Um, but the aim at the end of the day is to look at uh, a personalized, precise approach to um, pre preconception in utero environment. Um, if we understand this better and we know what the range of normal and abnormal is, that's when we can then uh, use interventions to manipulate potentially this environment and to make, um, to improve the environment for women where uh, even if we are just looking at the uterus, it's apparently normal, but they do not implant repeatedly. The challenges uh, of in utero biosensing um, is, they are numerous. Um, we face big challenges in miniaturizing um, the device. Uh, we, we have uh, faced challenges in biofouling issues uh, because, of course, if you put some uh, inert material into the human body, there's always a, a, a risk of biofouling, uh, how, how compatible it is, uh, and then trying to build a multi-sensing platform on top of that with no battery power uh, is also a, a challenge. But of course, the biggest challenge is actually integrating the um, bio, biological data in with this, uh, what the sensor has read, and what then it means in terms of disease and health. So clearly, that's the direction we're moving into, where then we integrate the data together with uh, clinical characteristics to obviously understand um, uh, uh, better what is uh, disease and what is health. It's very similar to the, the issue with uh, the AI data as well. So in summary, I've, I hope I've shown, although quite swiftly um, in view of time, um, some uh, complex uh, you know, solutions that, um, that has, uh, people have come up with, but it's still, we are still faced with the challenge 
of um, trying to understand what the in, in utero environment means, but we, are, we have uh, made a good start, I hope. Thank you very much. I just say that the questions, please keep, please keep your questions at the end of the session. We are going to uh, answer the questions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Professor Ying. Now, we would like to introduce the next chairperson because I know he has something very special to say. So let me first introduce Dr. Mohammed Asan Akhtar. He is Division Chief for the Cornish Fertility Center. Dr. Akhtar is a consultant gynecologist, subspecialized in reproductive medicine, andrology, and surgery. He has worked as a consultant in gynecology and reproductive medicine at St. Mary's Hospital, Manchester University, NHS Foundation Trust for many years. Please welcome Dr. Akhtar to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you to all, first, uh, Professor Fatmi and the ART team for having me here. And I must admit, I wanted to say thanks to Professor Ying Chong. It's been nine years since I've seen her last when she was my external examiner for my MD Viva. And I do remember those hard two hours she put me through. So I'm really honored that you're here today uh, for this. So this is my special moment. I send you gratitude for passing that viva that day, so I can have my subspecial training and be here today. So thank you very much. And on, that's on a personal note, but on the, uh, regarding the conference, it's an absolutely amazing, the level of detail and thought for this conference and the academic high quality is unbelievable. And here that, I will want to introduce our next speaker, Professor uh, Dr. Baris Atta, who is renowned, exceptional, what he does, and my God, what he's gonna talk about, recurrent implantation failure without, without PGTA, and we look forward to having him on here. It's been an honor and privilege to have him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, thank you. Um, so I'll try to keep it uh, short and to the point. The recurrent implantation failure, with or without PGTA, so we could have just said recurrent implantation failure, but I hope, you know, throughout the presentation, I'll be able to, able to make the distinction what PGTA does for it. These are my disclosures, none of them are relevant. And let me start with infertility, because there is a likeness here. The first thing is, infertility is a, in general, is a probabilistic diagnosis, which means in the absence of an obvious risk factor, I mean, if a, if a woman has regular cycles, assuming she's ovulatory, the male does not have any risk factors for, you know, semen abnormalities, and she doesn't have a history of abdominal surgery or pelvic infections, you can assume mostly everything is normal. And then, even in that case, we don't expect every couple to achieve a pregnancy every single month they, they attempt, right? So then what do we do? Um, since this is, normal that happens, and mostly is due to you know, probably unemployed, then we give the medical time an opportunity for exposure. And then once they reach a point where we would expect them to, to have achieved a pregnancy like 85 to 90 percent of, with, with 85 to 90 percent probability, but it still not happened, then we call them infertile. So it's based on cumulative probability of pregnancy, and that time is usually 12 months for younger couples. Then how does it apply to the IVF setting? Again, yeah, it's, it's a relatively young field, and we never expect every embryo to implant. And the leading cause is because even in young women, most of these embryos 
almost half of them are unemployed. So, how do we apply the same probabilistic principle here? On the slide, you see two wonderful looking expanded blastocysts, you know, nice trophoic to them, nice inner cell mass, and they, they are identical. So, would you expect you know, the, the probability of implantation and reaching live birth to be the same with these two embryos? The answer would depend on whose embryos they are. So, if it belongs to a woman who is 29, it has a different chance of implantation and live birth as opposed to a similar looking, same looking, exactly the same appearance embryo that belongs to a 42 year old woman, just simply because the probability of being euploid is very different. And even if the data is, suggests that euploid embryos implant at similar rate, regardless of female age, you see the probability of implantation is almost threefold different between similar looking embryos. Then how do we use that information and where do I come up with these numbers? This has been published you know, over the last 10 years. Different studies, different centers. There are thousands of embryos here. In our initial publication, I think we, we, we included almost 30,000 embryos. And within every age bracket, you see more or less this constant unemployed or employed rate, however you say, phrase it. And um, as, as, as the technology improves, the resolution of the test increases. Now, employed rates are probably falling down, so we're even recognizing more abnormalities. So, how to make sense of that, that, that information? If we are already doing PGTA, for the blastocyst before we transfer, we already know, you know the, we, we already have an expectation of pregnancy rates and the cumulative pregnancy or live birth rate with successive transfers. If we don't though, using these figures that I've just shown, age, age specific or age adjusted anticipated employee rates, we can calculate a cumulative probability of live birth. That's a paper we published with Edgardo Somiliano and Erkan Kalafat, who is here today. So using this statistical formula, what it shows us, in the absence of PGTA, we can make you know, these curves based on every, for every age bracket and calculate the cumulative live birth rate or cumulative probability of implantation for every, every additional embryo. And then, it's, it's, a, it's more or less an arbitrary choice above which threshold we would call it recurrent implantation failure. If we think like in fertility, we can expect, we, we can increase the threshold to 85 to 90 percent. And then even a young woman under 35 would need, you know, six, un, six unscreened blastocysts being transferred to reach a cumulative probability of implantation of 90% if the only problem was unemployed. Okay. For an older woman, you see like um, at the age of 38 to 40, the number would be 10 blastocysts, 10 unscreened blastocysts, even if everything else is normal. And even like older women, say 41 to 42, the number to reach the same threshold would be 14 unscreened blastocysts, which is you know, practically impossible in clinical practice. No patient, no couple, or no physician would wait for 14 blastocysts to fail to do something different or to have you know, additional investigation. So, and the data shows that's, that's what we calculated with the published data, and the same was shown in a retrospective analysis by Paul Firtea, if you transfer three euploid blastocysts consecutively, the cumulative live birth rate is about 95%. So euploidy, I mean, knowledge of euploidy status gives you a lot of information that you can use to counsel the patient that may give you know, everyone some peace of mind and that may help to, be, help to, that may help to guide further investigation and treatment. So this is from a review like two years ago. This is a Canadian guideline. When they were preparing the guideline, they reviewed the definitions. You see, like even by 2020, 
euploidy studies was not there. There was you know, no specific mention of cumulative probability of implantation or cumulative probability of live birth. The idea was there, you can see, you know, like excluding women with poorer prognosis, like older women, dividing, you know, fresh and frozen, etc. But it, it, there was no uniform definition. So now, what is new in this presentation from the former version, which I gave a couple of months ago, there's this new guideline by Eshre. The um, stakeholder review has just finished. It should be, you know, revised and published soon. Now, even the new guidelines use this cumulative probability of implantation or cumulative probability of live birth concept. And in the new guideline, the draft, the recommended threshold for further investigation or you know, change in management is 60%. I mean, if a couple has reached to a point where you would expect them to have a sheer implantation or live birth by 60%, and if it didn't happen, then they suggest it's time for further investigation and management. And let's see what this further invest investigation and management could be. But the, the, the rationale for 60% comes from this table. This is the European IVF monitoring data. Again, similar concept, same thing. You know, um, age brackets, unspated euploidy status. And then what would be the cumulative live birth rate with you know, number of, I mean, with, with every additional embryo. And with 60%, you usually reach, depending on age, after two or three unscreened blastocyst transfers. And if you're transferring an euploid blastocyst, on the other hand, if the first one fails, you're already at 60%, then that would categorize as recurrent implantation failure, if that makes sense to you. Then, I've just introduced, you know, in a way, or explained the concept of cumulative probability and how you know, we can use a threshold, select a threshold, but why would we need this information or how would we use it or even more daringly, do we even ever need it? So any term, any concept, you know, should be functional in clinical medicine. So what it means is if you label someone with a diagnosis, then that should require, you should do something new, something different, either for investigation or management. And in the context, recurrent implantation failure, a proper definition, should provide you the, the possibility the, to define a proper study population for your studies, so you can work on a homogeneous group of people and you know, possibly find something relevant. So now let's take a look at the, the diagnostic relevance or irrelevance of the concept, recurrent implantation failure. Basically, this, say, this looks like a complicated table with a lot of small you know, letters, but the idea is simple. So what are the other factors that we know today that it may affect the probability of implantation except for embryo unemployed. Lifestyle factors, gamete quality, uterine factors, adnexal pathology. These are the ones that we know. Some of them are proven, some of them are, are highly likely, but not necessarily proven. And then you see the diagnostic methods are usually just taking a proper history, doing a proper you know, vaginal ultrasound exam, and the test of tubal patency. And then most of them, does not require you know, a, a separate diagnosis like recurrent implantation failure. You, know, we, you are able to assess these things you know, simply by asking the proper questions and doing a proper you know, focused, physical, focused history taking and physical examination with a proper ultrasound. Then what remains is there are a few controversial issues here. One is, let's say, if you see a uterine septum, the effect of it on implantation and live birth is controversial. I mean, you could diagnose it with ultrasound. Then, you know, the decision to do an operative hysteroscopy is you know, a bit shaky here. So the, the recurrent implantation failure may help you here for management. I'll dwell into it later. Intramural fibroids, you know, it is, again, a controversial area. You may use the concept in adenomyosis. The other things, 
let's say gamut quality or impaired receptivity at the molecular level, they may be relevant, they are relevant, but today we do not have a commercially available or a clinically applicable test that is proven useful for those. So practically at the moment outside of research context, they're not useful or relevant. So I would say for an evidence-based clinical practice, the recurrent implantation failure as a term is not really that relevant from a diagnostic standpoint. So what is left except for those things? There are only two things if you ask me. One is karyotyping the couple. Because I mean, even after multiple failed embryo transfers, still maybe like two to three percent of the couples may be carriers of a balanced translocation, which may affect the probability of having an employed embryo and you know, may, may change the way how you counsel the couple and may require actually change of management, I mean, doing a specific you know, pre-implantation genetic testing for this. And then this is, this is arguable, but if there has been a long time since the last assessment of tubal patency, and even if you don't see a you know, ultrasound visible hydrosalpings, maybe there may be, that's why I'm saying arguable, may, maybe there exists small hydrosalpinges that's not clearly visible by ultrasound and may be with a marginal effect on the probability of implantation. So then if you repeat the, the tubal patency test, you would diagnose this. That's the only two tests which would be indicated by the term recurrent implantation failure. And see what is coming in the new guideline. If you diagnose a couple with recurrent implantation failure based on the 60% 60 per, 60 probability of cumulative probability of implantation, what is recommended is you know, review, let me see, the I think lifestyle factors it should be, and then Oh, I mean, I should have got the other microphone. I'm getting old. The assessment of endometrial thickness, and I, I hope you see better than me. Now, SS vitamin D studies, um, karyotyping, 3D ultrasound, you know, uterine anatomy, chronic endometritis, and what? Assessment of thyroid functions and progesterone levels. And then the ones in red are, are the ones that are recommended against doing. So, here's my point. How, how relevant are those? For my practice, at least, most of them are not. I mean, it depends on where we are working. It depends on your know, accessibility. It depends on, you know, like maybe whatever coverage issues. But what we do is, I mean, I'm not that much interested in the endometrial thickness because we've just, um, mentioned in the morning, as long as we exclude premature progesterone exposure, texture is fine, and intracavitary pathology is um, ruled out, there's no solid proof, or to me even convincing proof, or there's even proof against effect of endometrial thickness on the probability of implantation. Secondly, the other ones, they are already part of preconceptional counseling and preconceptional assessment, thyroid studies, I mean, we, I mean, like supplement vitamin D here at a particular area. And these are the things that I've just um, ruled out are the things we are doing before the first cycle. So the only thing that left for, for me is karyotyping, as I said. Then moving to therapeutics, like the, if, the, if the term requires any change in management. Remember the table? Anything we diagnose before the first cycle with proper history, proper examination, proper ultrasound, if I know that it would affect implantation like a you know, clear ultrasound visible hydrosalpings, submucous fibroid, intracavitary pathology, we would have treated them before the first cycle anyways. I wouldn't expect a couple to you know, fail multiple times to correct these things. But the, I think that this is where the definition may be most relevant now. There are a few say conditions, I think exemplified by intramural fibroids that don't distort the endometrial cavity, uterine septum, and maybe focal adenomyosis. Good quality studies, like the better quality studies, prospective studies in the IVF setting, suggests intramural fibroids, even without cavity distortion, 
decrease the chance of implantation to some extent, increase the risk of miscarriage to some extent. What we don't know is if surgical removal improves these figures. So surgery is, forget about the cost even, but it is surgery, it has risk of complications. And then we don't know if it improves or if it's neutral or even if it is harmful. So to take that risk, it should be justified. So I should be able to tell the patient, listen, I mean, I would have expected you to become pregnant or have a live birth by now by 80%, 90%, 60%, whatever your threshold is, we'd explain to the patient. And I think now it's time you know, to try it in a different way. So maybe it's the time to remove that fibroid, reject that septum, or maybe if it's focal adenomyosis, I mean, if even failed with, say, prolonged suppression, et cetera, then maybe surgery may be attempted, things like those. That's, that's where such a term would be relevant. Now, what's coming up in the guideline? Actually, much simpler things are coming in the guideline. The fibroid issue is not covered. It's not a criticism because I guess I wasn't involved in the discussions. I was participating in, in another guideline group, so I didn't participate in this one. But probably, um, yeah, but we've, yeah, some of us has been in this guideline discussions. So when you, there's a difficult decision to make, you know, we take the a relatively easier path or as a fibroid, explain it anyway, so put it aside and let's focus on unexplained recurrent implantation failure. So that's probably why it's not here. But you see the things, you know, again, review the chart, review the case history. Yes, it always makes sense. I mean, even if just the first cycle fails and then similar stuff and look at the interventions suggested. So. For in at least our practice, you know, we already do blastocyst culture routinely. I mean, we already do PGTA, you know, almost routinely. And then the other things, let's see if I move to the next slide, it's easier. There's not much left for the term recurrent implantation failure to alter you know, our management in a meaningful way. The only thing, you know, may be relevant because, I mean, we're not routinely treating for an assumed endometritis. And if we go back to the diagnostic part, there is no agreement on what really constitutes chronic endometritis, how it is diagnosed, how it affects IVF outcomes, and how it is treated. So if that is the controversy, if you think someone has failed, where you would have expected them to become you know, pregnant or have a live birth 80% of the time now, and it didn't happen, if everything else is normal, if the only, only possibility in your mind is chronic endometritis, I would recommend you know, a simple course of antibiotics before the next transfer, but not at the beginning. Because I mean, um, Dr. Carroll gave a nice talk on microbiota yesterday. The antibiotics, when used routinely, may, you know, alters our microbial flora. And if we suggest, if we think that microbial flora may affect reproductive function, then you know, we shouldn't mess with you know, routine antibiotics in the first place. Anyways, so I really see um, small use of the term recurrent implantation failure when used judiciously to even guide further management. So how does it move? Yeah. Okay. So the term should be used really cautiously and in a conservative manner. Because when you tell a couple that they suffer from an you know, unknown, vague um, entity, which there's no proven treatment for, it is really disencouragement. And the current data suggests most of the time, most of the time, it's the embryo. So each new embryo is a new chance. So we should do everything to try to keep these people in the treatment loop. So dropout is actually a big reason for couples to not to have a child while they still have chance. So rather than terrorizing them with obscure terms and you know, unproven tests, I mean interventions, etc., we should we should save their moral motivation and funds for repeat treatments once we assess and treat them properly, starting from the first attempts. I'd just like to say this like second slide from the last. Research setting is a different, is, is slightly different than clinical practice. So whereas I may agree 
I mean, with extra recommendation of using 60% cutoff for further investigation, because it's just a karyotype. Right? So most people do it even after the first failed cycle. That's okay. For research, we should absolutely have a much, much higher threshold to call recurrent implantation failure, because lower thresholds cause a mix of may maybe some rare pathologies which may cause implantation failure to be mixed up with a lot of other couples who just failed because of aneuploidy, undetected aneuploidy. So very high, actually very low signal to noise ratio. I mean, the research projects would be doomed with you know, false negativity as well as false positivity. And that's the current studies of the literature on recurrent implantation failure with the previous definitions, if you ask me. So my, you know, as a, my, my, my take home message would be, you know, we should do it right at the beginning. I mean, there is small need for the term recurrent implantation failure, as I've just explained, and we should try to keep people in treatment loop because, I mean, I really like this quote when I was preparing this, this, this talk. You know, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. That brings to my mind several patients of mine. One of the most recent ones was in Istanbul, I mean, not a very well-looking couple, paying treatment out of pocket. The woman didn't even know exactly how old she was, around 40s. And they were coming, she was a poor responder, like sometimes yields one egg, sometimes yields two eggs. And they would come in, you know, like in an embarrassed way after every failed attempt, say, saying that, you know, like they want to try again. And I was so worried if I'm like being encouraging or I'm making them, you know, spend their money. I was making the same boring and disencouraging talk after every single failed cycle. Then one day I just thought, you know, what if this couple, you know, just looked very well off, I mean, very well educated, and, you know, I would still, you know, make the same warnings time and, time and again, and, you know, would be that worried. I think it was after the fourth or five, fifth failed attempt. I explained them, you know, this is our last um, discussion on the subject. There's no, you know, like other obvious reason. I will never offer you something, you know, really different. And I will stop, you know, like really um, nagging you. If you want, you can continue, but it's all up to you. They would come for treatment, you know, cycle after cycle, and she delivered after the 15th transfer. So basically, and now we're conducting a multicenter study um, to see what happens with the fourth euploid embryo transfer. transfer. So with the three, the data shows 95.2% of cumulative live birth rate. With the fourth, it's very rare to find someone who's undergone a fourth euploid embryo transfer, but the so far accumulating data um, suggests actually you know, it, 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 it fails almost the same as the third. So it is most of the time embryo. We can diagnose and treat most other things before, and we barely need something like recurrent implantation failure. Thank you. So thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. So now we come to the last lecture of today, and I'm really happy that uh, the scientific committee decided uh, to invite Professor Alexandro from Madrid. For me personally, immunological part of our job in reproductive medicine is really, really underestimated. And the reason is maybe we, are, we don't have that much publication in this field. So I'm very happy that you are going to talk about immunology and failed implantation in the next lecture. Please welcome. Thank you for the nice presentation and uh, to Professor Fatemi and the organizer for inviting me to be part of this very interesting meeting. Uh, it's a not very easy topic as we just saw in the previous uh, uh, presentation. There is no a clear definition for recurrent implantation failure. However, a quite recent study suggested that uh, recurrent implantation failure is a rare occurrence, less than 5%, with two conditions, euploid embryos 
and three or more embryos transfers, and the normal endometrium uh, and in a morphological way. The same study suggested that recurrent implantation um, is a, a rare occurrence, but at the same time, mainly results from chromosomic causes coming from the embryo. Starting at this point, uh, a recent study just presented last year at ESRE tried to answer this question. Is the embryo, is the endometrium, or are there some problems in the both sides? 7,491 frozen embryo transfers with all no sites were reviewed. And they looked for a biochemical miscarriage rate in those cycles using PGTA alone, PGTA plus endometrial transcriptomic photoreceptivity, transcriptomic photoreceptivity alone controls, neither transcriptomic nor PGTA. And the results showed the same 8% biochemical miscarriage rate in all all groups. So, neither transcriptomy for receptivity nor PGTA try it or um, apply to modify the biochemical miscarriage rate. So, there should be other mechanisms or other factors involved in this uh, embryo loss rate and not associated with chromosomal structure or transcriptomic of the endometrium. The success um, of our pregnancy depends on our many factors. And we would like to live in an ideal world and see only young patients with a high number of euploid embryos, a normal endometrium, and 95% of pregnancy rate after three euploid embryo transfers. But the reality in our society in 2023 is completely different. And in our clinics today, we face with a different scenario, an increased maternal age, another underlying infertility-related diagnosis such as PCOS, obesity, hypertension, autoimmune diseases, or local problems as adenomyosis, endometriosis, uterine anatomic anormalities, or poor endometrial response. And it's very easy to guess that their reproductive outcome differ pretty much from the ideal patient's result. The success of the pregnancy depends on a euploid and a competing blastocyst, a normal and functional endometrium, and the very good crosstalk between the embryo and the maternal tissue. When we transfer a blastocyst, the first step is opposition and adherence to the maternal tissue. And for this step, there is a need of a good receptivity. When we receive the information of the result coming from the transcriptomic, we have the information limited to the superficial layer of the endometrium, the epithelial layer. Just that information and focus only in that step, the adherence of the blastocyst to the maternal tissue. But for the embryo invasion, there is a need for a complex process, a complex transformation of the endometrium called decidualization. And we know that a beer and decidualization is a cause of implantation failure and the miscarriage. Um, the transformation of the stromal endometrial cells into a decidual cells is crucial for the blastocyst invasion and the maintenance of the pregnancy. And this process is made under the action of the progesterone. Once the decidualization begins, the stromal cells um, start to secrete a wide range of cytokines, uh, cyt um, growth factors, and angiogenic factors which will change the full environment, the full maternal endometrial environment in order to sustain and to support the embryo invasion and the placentation. After the stimulus of the progesterone, the stromal cells start to secrete IL-15, which will induce an increase of number because of the proliferation of the mother's immune cells, mostly the uterine NK cells, which are the most abundant immune cells into the decidua. 
And this is very important part for uh, the, that process called decidualization. But at the same time, the stromal endometrial cells start to express some immune molecules which will, which will boost the activation of the maternal cells, mostly the uterine NK cells, in order to keep helping that embryo to go ahead into maternal tissue and um, follow its implantation. We can see here um, the first moment of the embryo implantation. The brown cells are the extravilotrophoblast cells invading the maternal tissue, and the other cells are the mother immune cells into the decidua. Uh, the most abundant are uterine and case cells, and we can see here that the stromal cells after the action of the progesterone and starting to produce all these cytokines, growth factors, and angiogenic factors, which will promote changes in the mother immune cells with an increased population of uterine and case cells. The embryo to be allowed to go ahead into the maternal tissue, for that step, there is a need for a proper identification. And that identification is made through between the mother cells and the extravilotrophoblast cells through some molecules presented on their surface. The molecules in the surface of the um, uterine NK cells called key receptors and the HLAC on the surface of the extravilotrophoblast cells. If that identification occurs properly, in one hand, the mother's immune cells will be activated with the support of the stromal cells and will allow the embryo to go ahead and keep migrating into maternal tissue, transforming the spinal artery and form a good placenta. And on the other hand, signals will be sent to the other maternal immune cells as macrophages, T lymphocytes, or dendritic cells to stay calm and go to a tolerogenic state in order to tolerate those cells which are a stranger into the endometrium if we are taking into account the composition of the genes into the embryo. But uh, the immune system into the CIDUA, it uh, doesn't work alone. It, there are uh, many interactions with other maternal systems in order to promote and to ensure the nutrition for the embryo, the supply of the oxygen, the, the supply with, with the, the proper growth factor cytokines in order to uh, fulfill two main jobs of the mother immune cells. In one hand, to promote and to help the embryo to go and invade the maternal tissue, and on the other hand, to tolerate what is already into the maternal tissue. But those jobs and those axes could fail, and that this regulation in this maternal and fetal crosstalk could lead us to a failure or an interruption of the embryo migration or on maternal and fetal tolerance. In the way of um, allowing the embryo to go ahead into the maternal tissue, it could be a disbalance in the activation of the mother's uterine NK cells with a lack of immune system which are there to support the embryo implantation. On the other hand, we can find a hyperactivation of the other immune cells which are there to turn into a tolerogenic state and start tolerating the embryo and with an overreactivity and um, excess of inflammation. Probably the most known um, model of interaction between different system, maternal systems or the immune system and the embryo is that model we can see in PCOS, obesity, and insulin resistance. There is a vicious cycle between hyperandrogenism, hyperinsulinemia, and chronic inflammation. When we go into the endometrium of those women, we can see, first of all, that there is a change in uh, its transcriptomic with the dysregulated genes related with an immune system. And we have an excessive inflammation, a chronic inflammation with an excess production of the very powerful pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, presence of the macrophages, the profile of pro-inflammatory macrophages and dendritic cells. 
But at the same time, we have a low population of those cells, the uterine and case cells, which are there to support the embryo invasion. So we have, in one hand, the lack of the cells supporting the invasion and an excessive inflammation and difficulty to induce that tolerance or allowance of the stranger to stay there longer. Other model is the women with adenomyosis. In those endometrium, we can see, first of all, a dysregulation of endometrial expression of sex hormone receptors and co-receptors. And this is very important for a decidualization. Let's remember that the progesterone is the main actor which will um, give the signal to the stromal cells and to the stromal department of the endometrium to transform and to promote all those signals which are very needed for the embryo invasion. At the same time, those uterus show a low-grade inflammation with the immune dysfunction, with an increase in a population of very powerful pro-inflammatory cells at TH17, and a decrease in regulatory cells, which are there to tolerate. At the same time, we find an abnormal endometrial gene expression with changes in 25 proteins involved in immune responses, inflammation responses, and complement activation. A cellular abnormality are there too, and an altered uterine vascularity. And the recent study showed that the risk of adenomyosis patients having a non-receptive endometrium is 42.5% higher compared to a group control. And the very interesting fact is that no receptive endometrium doesn't respond to the timing of the progesterone. So giving more days or more hour progesterone, it doesn't have any impact on the adenomyotic endometrium, and probably because of that dysregulation and the progesterone resistance and impaired decidualization those uterus have. Other model is the endometriosis. In the uterus, uh, women with endometriosis, again, we find the, the both axes dysregulated with an increase of population of pro-inflammatory cells, macrophages, uh, T cells, dendritic cells, which are not able to induce that tolerance. But at the same time, we have a lack of activation of those cells which are there to promote the embryo invasion by a higher expression of inhibitory key receptors and the lower frequency of activated receptors on the mother's uterine and cell surface. The follow-up model is a chronic endometritis. In a chronic endometritis biopsy, we find an excessive inflammation at the same time, but we see a downregulation of markers for the decidualization, which shows us an impaired decidualization. And right now, the challenge is how to diagnose the immune profile of those patients and how to select and to know really which patients need some immune approach in their recurrent implantation failure treatment. And right now we have several tests looking for markers for immune imbalance and at the same time for markers for decidualization as endometrial decidualization score or BC um, L6 test. Of course, at the, uh, we are at the beginning in, in this way and there are many other tests under uh, work. Um, and probably in the future we will have more information or a full picture about the decidualization coming from a test. But probably from all those tests, the most famous test is the immune hemohistochemistry uh, for uterine NK cells. And meta-analysis, recent meta-analysis and studies show that the number of the percentage of uterine NK cells into the medium doesn't mean anything. Um, even despite the fact that the endometrium of women with recurrent implantation failure shows an increased percentage or number of uterine NK cells. But when they analyze the reproductive outcome of those women taking into account their percentage of uterine NK cells, there wasn't any differences in their reproductive outcomes. 
that's why we wanted to have uh, more um, clear information about the uterine NK cells because the good one are three different subsets there into the endometrium, but there are another cytotoxic pro-inflammatory uterine NK cells which could be found into the endometrium. So we analyze into the endometrium of um, women undergoing to egg donation the different subset of uterine NK cells, and we use three different techniques, immune histochemistry, uh, flow cytometry, and gene expression to make sure that we have very well designed and very well identified the cells. And yes, we uh, observe that women with reproductive failure, they have an increased percentage of cytotoxic uterine NK cells, so not that good NK cells. But when we split the analysis by the mother's cares, which are those receptors in charge or of or the embryo identification, we didn't find any differences among three genotypes. So all KIRA, AA, B, and BB have the same percentage of those cytotoxic uterine NK cells. But we wonder, okay, maybe there is a problem in the binding between the embryo and the mother cells. For that purpose, we use an artificial embryo. We select the peptides surrounded by four different molecules of HLAC, and we put that artificial embryo in a contact with the maternal cells to study and to um, diagnose the binding between that HLAC as an artificial embryo and the mother's uterine NK cells. And we observed that all three genotypes, AA, AB, and BB, bound in the same way that HLAC um, as an artificial embryo. So it's not a problem on the binding, it's not a problem in the number of the cells, it's a problem after that. Because we know that there is a need for an activation induces in the uterine NK cells, the uterine, the good one, the CD56 plus right into the endometrium. And the lack of activation of those cells lead us to a negative signals into the maternal and fetal tolerance and an impairment on the embryo invasion. We need to remember that there is a need for that identification between the mother cells and the embryo cells to have a good uh, embryo invasion and placentation. And that maternal and fetal crosstalk is very complex. We can see here the three subset of the good uterine and case cells interacting with one cell of coming from extra villotrophoblast cells. All those molecules are expressed in the surface of the extra villotrophoblast cells, and the others are expressed on um, uterine and case cells, the good one. And this um, crosstalk is very important for the identification and for the allowance of the embryo to go ahead and keep moving into the maternal tissue. And we have all those molecules in our surface because of our genes. We can see here the KIR genes, those receptors in the surface of the maternal uterine NK cells in charge of identification of the embryo and helping the embryo to go ahead. And the red square, there are inhibitor receptors so which, which will send the negative messages to the mother cells as don't help that embryo to implant. And the blue square are the activated receptors, which are good uh, signals for the activation of those cells. Taking into account which kind of receptors do we have, we will have a different expression of them in our uterine and case cell surface. And taking into account the sequence of those receptors, there are three genotypes. AA, which means those women have only inhibitory receptors. AB, a mixture between inhibitory and activating. And BB, mostly activated receptors. And the embryo, when shows up into the maternal tissue, it expresses two different tags, one coming from the mother and the other one from the father. That is an ID tag of the embryo cells called HLAC. 
it, uh, there is a very huge polymorphism into that. Uh, in October 2022, there were discovered 7,609 HLAC alleles in the world. That's why it's very important to study those, taking into account the population, the ethnicity, and um, uh, even the, the geographic region of some, uh, some country. Taking into account the biding, the position where they are biding with the mother's cares, there are two groups, C1 and C2. So we can find C1, C1 embryo, one coming from the mother and the other one from the father, C1, C2, or C2, C2. We know that there is a risk combination for a lack of activation in those maternal and fetal signals when the mother has only inhibitory receptors and the embryo carries from the father's side the HLA-C2. This risk combination leads to a negative signals and impairment on the embryo invasion and placentation. And when we transfer an embryo using own eggs, only the paternally inherited HLAC is a stranger, non-self from a point of view, from a genetic point of view, because there are different genes compared to the mother's tissue. And this paternally inherited HLAC needs to find the right activated receptors on the mother's uterine and case cell surface in order to induce those positive signals, activating signals, in order to promote the embryo invasion and placentation. On the contrary, if the paternally inherited HLAC finds the inhibitory receptors, those signals will be suppressed and we will have a compromised invasion and placentation. But when we change the egg, we will have two strangers, the father and the egg donor. And the egg donor behaves from a genetic point of view as paternally inherited HLAC. Then there will be two strangers into the maternal decidua presented to the maternal uterine NK cells. And even that egg donor HLAC needs to find the right receptor, not only the HLAC coming from the father, but also the HLAC coming from the egg donation. This is one of the mechanisms which could explain the high incidence of problems in egg donation, even in the young women. Of course, we know right now that the higher the HLAC2 amount into the embryo, the lower the live birth rate in those patients having key A receptors, only inhibitory receptors in their surface. We didn't see this trend in AB or BB patients. So the embryo implantation is a very complex process. There is a need for a new fluid embryo and competed blastocyst, but there is a need for a good synchronicity with the mother's systems, not only the immune system, but the other mother's systems as metabolic factors, epigenetic, microbioma, structure of the uterus, response of the stromal cell to the progesterone, the treatment, the endometrium is exposed to prior of the embryo transfer. And this implantation failure is a lack of that synchronicity. And the implantation failure could result from one or multiple factors and could may not result from the same factors each time. We could have an embryo transfer failed because of embryonic factors. The next one failed the endometrium thickness and the other one the progesterone responsive and the other one the immune factors. And that's why it's very important to take in account all this maternal environment, decidualization, and to offer individualized protocols because the individualized substitutive hormonal protocols for those women with adenomyosis and endometriosis, PCOS, show the benefit even in the distribution of that inflammation into the endometrium. At the same time, the metabolic disorder controls have a positive impact over those interaction between the maternal and system um, uh, collaboration, and even in decidualization, because there is a very 
the direct interaction between the receptor of the insulin and the progesterone receptor with an impact over the transformation, the sidualization of the endometrium. And we need to take in account that if there is an increased inflammatory environment into the endometrium, we need, first of all, to diagnose from where, where is the origin of that inflammation? Because it could be because of a local infection, it could be because of a local lesion, which it's easier to, to, to solve with maybe an individualized hormonal protocol. It could be from an excessive work of the immune system, and at that point, there is a reason for using some treatment to calm down a little bit the mother immune cells. But, if we have a lack of activation of the mother immune system cells, we need to boost that maternal cells to do its proper job in producing the proper signals and the proper factors in order to promote the embryo invasion. There is a need of suppression. And this is a very complex interaction which have a very good or bad impact over our uh, responses. Because one piece left or all these images have, has an impact over our reproductive outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very nice lecture. As a matter of fact, since we didn't go for the break, we have now to catch up. So before we hand over to Professor Fatemi for the closing remarks, we have, I think, two minutes for questions and answers, and all the speakers are still here. So Dr. Akhtar, my co-chair, and me, we want to challenge you for one or two questions. Yes, please. Professor Fatemi. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers really for great presentations. Um, I wanted to ask Dian a question which I'm faced and I'm always, we are contacting you when we face a patient with the HLA-C2 husband and the woman is AA. They have perfect embryos, genetically tested, perfect receptive endometrium, and they don't get pregnant. I know you make your cocktail and you tell us, do this, do that, do this, but what's the reality? What is the chance that these couples, because here egg donation is not allowed, so we have no options. What are the possibilities? What can we do with these patients? Um, having Kyrie this is, this is very important. Having QRA with the husband HLAC, it doesn't mean the pregnancy is not possible at all. It's not 100%. Because even among AA patients, there are different degrees of inhibitory signals. Uh, it depends on the mother HLAC too. If the mother has some HLAC2, is more tolerant to the stranger HLAC2. And if it's a normal pregnancy and the woman doesn't have any other reason of not getting pregnant, a first pregnancy it is possible. But maybe with a smaller placenta or a dysfunction in the functional of placenta and an increased risk for preeclampsia or a baby, a small baby for the gestational age. But when we face with a recurrent implantation failure and we have everything else perfect, just uh, we identify a key A and a father HLA-C2, C2, and let's say the mother is C1, C1, which means no tolerance for the stranger C2, we have a strong inhibition into the allowance of the embryo to go ahead into the maternal tissue. So there, is, there isn't a need for an immune suppression. But Sometimes the higher the number of the embryo we transfer with C2, we train our endometrium 
to identify properly the stranger and to be even more robust in inhibitory signals against even in promotion of T cells, which normally are not very welcome into the maternal and fetal interface. That's why sometimes there is a need for cleaning a little bit uh, those T cells and after that boosting the immune cells. And the only one uh, treatment um, uh, who has randomized clinical trial despite of, of, of the presentation of uh, Professor Atta is um, the filgastrin or um, the granulocyte macrophage CCGS. Um, it is a cytokines, the main cytokines produced by the mother's uterine NK cells I, to promote the embryo invasion. That's why if the mother's uterus doesn't produce that molecule because it is not able to activate its own um, uterine NK cells, if we add that molecule from outside, we balance that because the genes, we can change the genes of the embryo, we can change the genes of the mother, and the result will be the inhibition if we don't do anything from outside. And the results until now for uh, those couples having this situation with an inhibitory, the mother's uh, KIRAA and the embryo coming with C2 with the father has a very good responses because normalize their uh, reproductive outcome compared to a BB patients or, or normal patients with uh, the with normal. So at the moment is the only way to boost that, uh, that, uh, that immune activation. Thank you very much. Any other question? If, yes, Dr. Ring. Um, question for <laughs> Diana again. Um, I, I, the way I see the immune um, uh, modulation and, and uh, the, the critique of it is the lack of uh, measure of function. Because if you look, you said the cows, the this, but, but no one has actually, well, uh, there's a question whether there is, um, in, in my reading, come up with a, a test or some sort of investigation which measure function. So I just wonder whether you would like to comment on that. This is a very good question <clears throat> because, um, <clears throat> as we just saw, the number that's why I failed all the immune tests to prove any useful in, um, usefulness in, in, um, in our uh, reproductive field. Because the number doesn't mean anything. And the number change and after the action of the progesterone, but mostly their change after the action of the, 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 uh, the contact with the stranger or the antigens coming with the embryo. It could be the father or the, the most, uh, um, or the differences in expression of those molecules in the surface of the embryo, depending on this quality, euploidy, and um, the, the, the other maternal factors. So um, it's very difficult to test the functionality because there, the functionality starts in the moment of the contact with the embryo. That's why in vitro models are not very good. We can do that through the genes because the, uh, the, the um, um, transcriptor factors, but the, the transcriptomic for receptivity only give us the epithelium information and there isn't any uterine NK cells. There are not immune cells there. That's why it's a very, very limited um, test and it's not very useful for, for the implantation failure or for, for miscarriages. Um, but right now there are many tests looking into the transcriptomy for markers of the decidualization and most of them have um, the immune markers inside and that is better than functional test, okay? Because the functional test is, okay, looking how the cell works, but the transcriptomic for those function, it's even better. And the proteomic of that, it's even better. And right now, we have a large studies in that direction to, to go ahead and to have the proteomic, the transcriptomic, and the metabolomic of the mm -hmm. decidua in order to give all those information. And also taking in account the embryo HLAC and even what the stromal cell express, which is newest, it's HLAF, which is another very interesting topic. Uh, since, yes. since Dr. Ng gave you a hard time with the exam, I want to ask her a question now to yes, make yes. her life difficult. Yes, I know. <laughs> you remember, Ng, at some point, Nick 
he was publishing with uh, Jan Brosens about this uh, communication of embryo with the endometrium and calling uh, a noisy embryo with the factors that the embryo is producing to communicate with the endometrium. So a competent embryo or an incompetent embryo is giving a different signaling to the endometrium. Um, if you take a look to the genetics of an embryo, you see, we are going towards the cell-free DNA. So people are looking to the culture media in order to see if an embryo is normal or abnormal. And all the studies, they fail to capture any information if they don't refresh the media on day four. And the genetic testing seems only to work late day five or even day six embryo. Could it be that what you measure in the cell-free DNA to assess the genetic information of the embryo are those factors that the blastocyst is releasing to communicate with the endometrium? Could that be? Yeah, um, it, it certainly can. Um, and and I, I, I'm aware that there's only one or two studies that have looked at, um, if I'm not wrong, a couple of years back, um, Carlos uh, Simon's group did publish um, the incorporation of the uh, endometrial, uh, so maternal um, uh, DNA into the embryo is an experimental model. So uh, I think it's a very interesting area, and it's certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, at the moment we are looking at um, uh, things like extracellular vesicles, because I think that could be the vehicle for which how these uh, communication happens. Uh, and 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 I'm sure in future we'll understand it a bit more, um, but it's certainly a very biologically plausible hypothesis, yeah. Could you explain us about these extracellular vesicles? From when onwards does an embryo start developing these vesicles? Um, so our work is uh, primarily more on the endometrium. So we know that um, from the work that we've done, the endometrium, uh, so, so um, does secrete, so that you see these extracellular vesicles buds off. And in fact, if you look across medicine, this is a, this is a very common biological phenomenon. It happens in orthopedics, cardiovascular, um, and of course reproduction. So the, to turn that around to about the embryo, that, that I'm not uh, so certain, yeah? Um, but I do uh, uh, think that the bi it's a bi uh, direction of communication, um, um, but we are so so. Uh, in, 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 so uh, the research is at such infancy at the moment. Yeah. Because I think most probably this cell-free DNA is linked to that factor of communication. This is exactly why you re you can capture that only day five, late day five, beginning day six, because this is the time where the embryo starts communicating with the endometrium. So it would be interesting to look more into these factors because. People are looking to factors that the embryo is producing, but maybe these factors are linked to the genetic information of the embryo. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Just uh, something more. Uh, from an immunological point of view, for example, until day five, the embryo doesn't express HLAC. So at day five, start to express the HLAC to be identified into the mother's uterus. And the other molecules, which uh, their function is to be tolerated, start to secrete little by little later after implantation and placentation. Even HLAF, we will have a full um, expression in the third trimester of pregnancy, but at the first stages of the embryo implantation, there are intracellular, and little by little they start to, to express molecules as tolerate me. At the beginning, they express molecules that let me in, but they start to do that at day five. Prior, there isn't any molecule to be identified into the embryo. Thank you. thank you so much, and thank you everyone for wonderful being here and still here and all active. Thank you, and I'm going to have the closing remarks from Professor Fatmi. Thank you so much, to your chair as well. Thank you very much. Until the end, um, I would like to thank all the speakers, local, international, 
who made the effort to come all the way from different parts of the world. I would like to thank you all staying for so long. I hope it was an informative day for you. I started today telling you, you have to put a question mark behind everything you do. And I think at the end of the day, we should have more questions than answers. And that's exactly what science is. I always say science is dynamic. So thank you again. Big applause for the speakers, for yourself, that you stayed so long. And uh, I hope we can repeat these kind of meetings on a regular basis, because it's important to bring more and more evidence-based medicine into the region. I wish you all, I would also like to ask, to, to thank all our staff who did all the effort, especially Ala and her team, our IT, um, really all of you for assisting us, helping us to, to create this meeting, and I really hope we can repeat that in future. Last request, I would like to ask our staff who are present to stay here. I would like to take a group picture from our people from our clinic. The certificates can be collected outside. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.
चौबीस का रखी है तीस कर दी वही देख रहा था मैं जेरे हिसाब से तो ठीक है तो कर रखा हमने तो मैंने बताया नहीं आपको चौबीस करके छोटा था ना इसके लिए हाँ तब तो आ जाएगी सही Come out. 